Chapter 37 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Sienkiewicz, translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835-1906. Chapter 37 Zagwaba, when he stood before the hetman, did not answer his joyous greeting, but put his hands behind his back, pouted his lips, and looked on him like a just but stern judge. Sapieha was pleased when he saw that mien, for he expected some pleasantry, and said, How are you, old rogue? Why twist your nose as if you had found some unvirtuous odour? In the whole camp of Sapieha it smells of hashed meat and cabbage. Why, tell me. Because the Swedes have cut up a great many cabbage heads. There you are, you are already criticising us. It is a pity they did not cut you up too. I was with a leader under whom we are the cutters, not the cut. The hangman take you, if they had even clipped your tongue. Then I should have nothing to proclaim Sapir his victory with. Ah, Lord brother, spare me. The majority already forget my service to the country and belittle me altogether. I know, too, that there are many who make a great outcry against my person. Still, had it not been for that rabble of a general militia, affairs might have gone differently. They say that I have neglected the enemy for night feasting, but the whole commonwealth has not been able to resist that enemy. Zagwaba was somewhat moved at the words of the hetman, and answered, Such is the custom with us, always to put the blame on the leader. I am not the man to speak evil of feasting, for the longer the day, the more needful the feast. Pan Czarniecki is a great warrior. Still, according to my head, he has this defect that he gives his troops for breakfast, for dinner, and for supper nothing but Swede's flesh. He is a better leader than cook. But he acts ill, for from such food war may soon become disgusting to the best cavaliers. Was Czarnecki very much enraged at me? No, not very. In the beginning he showed a great change, but when he discovered that the army was unbroken, he said at once, the will of God, not the might of men. That is nothing. Any general may lose a battle. If we had Sapiehas only in the land, we should have a country in which every man would be an Aristides. For Pan Czarniecki, I would not spare my blood, answered Sapieha. Every other would have lowered me so as to exalt himself and his own glory, especially after a fresh victory. But he is not that kind of man. I will say nothing against him but this, that I am too old for such service as he expects of soldiers, and especially for those baths which he gives the army. Then are you glad to return to me? Glad and not glad, for I hear of feasting for an hour, but somehow I don't see it. We will sit down to the table this minute, but what is Czarniecki undertaking now? He is going to Great Poland to help those poor people. From there he will march against Steinbock and to Prussia, hoping to get cannon and infantry from Danzig. The citizens of Danzig are worthy people, and give a shining example to the whole Commonwealth. We shall meet Czarniecki at Warsaw, for I shall march there, but will stop a little first around Lublin. Then have the Swedes besieged Lublin again? Unhappy place! I know not how many times it has been in the hands of the enemy. There is a deputation here now from Lubelsk, and they will appear with a petition asking me to save them. But as I have letters to dispatch to the king and the hetmans, they must wait a while. I will go gladly to Lublin, for there the fair heads are comely beyond measure and sprightly. When a woman of that place is cutting bread and puts the loaf against herself, the crust on the lifeless bread blushes from delight. O oh, Turk! Your worthiness, as a man advanced in years, cannot understand this, but I, like May, must let my blood out yet. 
but you are older than I. Only in experience, not in years. I have been able, conservare juventutem meam, to preserve my youth, and more than one man has envied me that power. Permit me, your worthiness, to receive the Lubelsk deputation. I will promise to aid them at once. Let the poor men comfort themselves before we comfort the poor women. That is well, said the hetman. Then I will write the letters. And he went out. Immediately after were admitted the deputies from Lubelsk, whom Zagwaba received with uncommon dignity and seriousness. He promised assistance on condition that they would furnish the army with provisions, especially with every kind of drink. When the conditions were settled, he invited them in the name of the voyevoda to supper. They were glad, for the army marched that night toward Lublin. The hetman himself was active beyond measure, for it was a question with him of effacing the memory of the Sandomierge defeat by some military success. The siege began, but advanced rather slowly. During this time, Kmichitz was learning from Vovodyovsky to work with the sabre, and made uncommon progress. Pan Mihal, knowing that his art was to be used against Boguslav's neck, held back no secret. Often, too, they had better practice, for, approaching the castle, they challenged to single combat the Swedes, many of whom they slew. Soon, Kmichitz had made such advance that he could meet Pan Yan on equal terms. No one in the whole army of Sapieha could stand before him. Then such a desire to try Boguslav seized his soul that he was barely able to remain at Lublin, especially since the spring brought back to him strength and health. His wounds had healed, he ceased to spit blood, life played in him as of old, and fire gleamed in his eyes. At first, the louder men looked at him frowningly, but they dared in not attack, for Vorodyovsky held them with iron hand, and later, when they considered his acts and his deeds, they were reconciled completely, and his most inveterate enemy, Yuzva Butrim, said, Kmichitz is dead. Babinich is living. Let him live. The Lubelsk garrison surrendered at last, to the great delight of the army. Then Sapieha moved his squadrons toward Warsaw. On the road they received tidings that Jan Kazimir himself, with the hetmans and a fresh army, was advancing to aid them. News came too from Czarniecki, who was marching to the capital from Great Poland. The war, scattered through the whole country, was gathering at Warsaw, as a cloud scattered in the sky gathers and thickens to give birth to a storm with thunders and lightnings. Sapieha marched through Zelechów, Garvolin and Minsk to the Shedlets Highway to join the general militia of Podlaski. Panyan took command of this multitude, for though living in Lubelsk, he was near the boundary of Podlaski and was known to all the nobles, and greatly esteemed by them as one of the most famous knights in the Commonwealth. In fact, he soon changed that nobility, gallant by nature, into a squadron second in no way to regular troops. Meanwhile, they moved from Minsk forward to Warsaw very hastily, so as to stop at Praga one day. Fair weather favoured the march. From time to time, May showers sped past, cooling the ground and settling the dust. But on the whole, the weather was marvellously fair. Not too hot, not too cold. The eye saw far through the transparent air. From Minsk they went mounted. The wagons and cannon were to follow next day. An immense eagerness reigned in the regiments. The dense forests on both sides of the whole road were ringing with echoes of military songs. The horses nodded as a good omen. The squadrons regularly and in order flowed on one after the other, like a river shining and mighty. For Sapieha led 12,000 men besides the general militia. The captains leading the regiments were gleaming in their polished cuirasses, the red flags waved like gigantic flowers above the heads of the knights. The sun was well toward its setting when the first squadron, that of Lauda, marching in advance, beheld the towers of the capital. At sight of this, a joyful shout tore from the breasts of the soldiers. Warsaw! 
Warsaw! That shout flew like thunder through all the squadrons, and for some time was to be heard over two miles of road the word Warsaw! Warsaw! Many of Sapieha's knights had never been in the capital. Many of them had never seen it. Therefore, the sight made an uncommon impression on them. Involuntarily, all reined in their horses. Some removed their caps, others made the sign of the cross. Tears streamed from the eyes of others, and they stood in silent emotion. All at once, Sapieha came out from the rear ranks on a white horse and began to fly along the squadrons. Gentlemen, cried he in a piercing voice, we are here first. To us luck, to us honour, we will drive the Swedes out of the capital. We'll drive them, we'll drive them, we'll drive them. And there rose a sound and a thunder. Some shouted continually, we'll drive them. Others cried, strike whoso has manhood. Others, against them the dog brothers. The rattle of sabres was mingled with the shouts of the knights. Eyes flashed lightning, and from under fierce moustaches teeth were gleaming. Sapieha himself was sputtering like a pine torch. All at once he raised his baton and cried, follow me. Near Praga, the voivoda restrained the squadron and commanded a slow march. The capital rose more and more clearly out of the bluish distance. Towers were outlined in a long line on the azure of the sky. The red, many-storied roofs of the old city were gleaming in the evening light. The Lithuanians had never seen anything more imposing in their lives than those white, lofty walls, pierced with multitudes of narrow windows those walls standing like lofty swamp reeds over the water. The houses seemed to grow, some out of others, higher and still higher, but above that dense and close mass of walls with windows and roofs, pointed towers pierced the sky. Those of the soldiers who had been in the capital previously, either at an election or on private affairs, explained to the others what each pile meant and what name it bore. Zagwoba, especially as a person of experience, told all to the louder men, and they listened to him eagerly, wondering at his words and the city itself. Look at that tower in the very centre of Warsaw. That is the citadel of the king. Oh, that I could live as many years as I have eaten dinners at the king's table. I would twist Methuselah into a ram's horn. The king had no nearer confidence than me. I could choose among starosta ships as among nuts, and give them away as easily as hobnails. I have given promotion to multitudes of men, and when I came in, senators used to bow to me to the girdle in Cossack fashion. I fought duels also in presence of the king, for he loved to see me at work. The marshal of the palace had to close his eyes. That is a tremendous building, said Rochowalski, and to think that these dogs have it all in hand. And they plunder terribly, added Zagwaba. I hear that they even take columns out of the walls and send them to Sweden. These columns are of marble and other valuable stones. I shall not recognize the dear corners. Various writers justly describe this castle as the eighth wonder of the world. The King of France has a respectable palace, but it is a fool in comparison with this one. And that other tower over there near it, on the right? That is St. Jan. There is a gallery from the castle to it. I had a vision in that church, for I remained behind once after Vespers. I heard a voice from the arches crying, Zagwoba, there will be war with such a son, the Swedish king, and great calamities will follow. I was running with all my breath to the king to tell him what I had heard, when the primate caught me by the neck with his crozier. Don't tell follies, said he. You were drunk. That other church, just at the side, belongs to the Jesuit college. The third tower at a distance is the law courts, the fourth at the right is the marshals, and that green roof is the Dominicans. I could not name them all, even if I could wield my tongue as well as I do my sabre. 
It must be that there is not another such city in the world, said one of the soldiers. That is why all nations envy us, answered Zagwaba. And that wonderful pile on the left of the castle? Behind the Bernardines? Yes. That is the Rajayovsky Palace, formerly the Kazanovsky. It is considered the ninth wonder of the world, but there is a plague on it, for in those walls began the misfortune of the Commonwealth. How is that? asked a number of voices. When the Vice-Chancellor Rajayovsky began to dispute and quarrel with his wife, the King took her part. You know, gentlemen, what people said of this, and it is true that the Vice-Chancellor thought that his wife was in love with the King, and the King with her. Then afterward, through hatred, he fled to the Swedes, and war began. To tell the truth, I was in the country at the moment, and did not see the end of the affair. I got it from hearsay. But I know this, that she made sweet eyes, not at the King, but at someone else. At whom? Zagoba began to twirl his moustaches. At him to whom all are hurrying like ants to honey. But it does not beseem me to mention his name, for I have always hated boastfulness. Besides, the man has grown old, and from sweeping out the enemy of the country, I am worn as a broom. But once there was no greater beauty and love-maker than I. Let Roch Kowalski... Here Zagwaba saw that by no means could Roch remember those times, therefore he waved his hand and said, But what does he know of this affair? Then he pointed out the palaces of Ossolinsky and Konitzpolsky, palaces which were in size almost equal to the Rajayovsky, finally the splendid Villa Regia. And then the sun went down, and the darkness of night began to fill the air. The thunder of guns was heard on the walls of Warsaw, and trumpets were sounded a considerable time and prolonged, in sign that the enemy was approaching. Sapieha also announced his coming by firing from muskets to give courage to the inhabitants, and that night he began to transport his army across the Vistula. First the louder squadron passed, second the squadron of Pan Kotvich, then Kmichitz's Tartars, then Vankovich's squadron. After that, 8,000 men. In this way, the Swedes, with their accumulated plunder, were surrounded and deprived of communication. But nothing remained to Sapieha except to wait till Charnyetsky from one side and from the other Jan Kazimir with the hetmans of the kingdom marched up, and meanwhile to see that no reinforcements stole through to the city. The first news came from Charnyetsky, but not over favourable, for he reported that his troops and horses were so exhausted that at that moment he could not take part in the siege. From the time of the Battle of Varka they were under fire day after day, and from the first months of the year they had fought twenty-one great battles with the Swedes, not counting the engagements of scouting parties and the attacks on smaller detachments. He had not obtained infantry in Pomerania and had not been able to advance to Danzig. He promised at most to hold in check with the rest of his forces that Swedish army which under the brother of the king, Rajivil, and Douglas was stationed at Narev and apparently was preparing to come to the aid of the besieged. The Swedes prepared for defence with the bravery and skill peculiar to them. They burned Praga before the arrival of Sapieha. They had begun already to throw bombs into all the suburbs, such as the Krakow and the Novishat, and on the other side against the church of St. Yerzy and the Virgin Mary. Then houses, great buildings and churches flamed up. In the daytime, smoke rolled over the city like clouds, thick and dark. At night, those clouds became red, and bundles of sparks burst forth from them toward the sky. Outside the walls, crowds of people were wandering, without roofs over their heads, without bread. Women surrounded Sapieha's camp and cried for charity. People were seen as thin as pincers from hunger. Children were dying for want of food, in the arms of emaciated mothers. The suburbs were turned into a veil of tears and misery. Sapieha, having neither infantry nor cannon, 
waited and waited for the coming of the king. Meanwhile, he aided the poor, sending them in groups to the less injured neighbourhoods in which they might survive in some way. He was troubled not a little when he foresaw the difficulties of the siege, for the skilled engineers of Sweden had turned Warsaw into a strong fortress. Behind the walls were 3,000 trained soldiers, led by able and experienced generals. On the whole, the Swedes passed as masters in besieging and defending great fortresses. To solace this trouble, Sapeha arranged daily feasts during which the goblets circled freely. For that worthy citizen and uncommon warrior had this failing. He loved company and the clatter of glasses above all things, and therefore neglected frequently service for pleasure. His diligence in the daytime he balanced by negligence at night. Till sunset he worked faithfully, sent out scouts, dispatched letters, inspected pickets himself, examined the informants brought in. But with the first star even fiddles were heard in his quarters. And when once he felt joyous, he permitted everything, sent for officers even though on guard or appointed to scouting expeditions, and was angry if any one failed to appear, since for him there was no feast without a throng. In the morning, Zagwaba reproached him seriously, but in the night, the servants bore Zagwaba himself without consciousness to Vorodyovsky's quarters. Sapieha would make a saint fall, he explained next day to his friends. And what must happen to me, who have always been fond of sport? Besides, he has some kind of special passion to force goblets on me, and I, not wishing to seem rude, yield to his pressing. This I do to avoid offending the host, but I have made a vow that at the coming advent I shall have my back well covered with discipline, stripes, for I understand myself that this yielding cannot remain without penance. But now I have to keep on good terms with him, out of fear that I might fall into worse company and indulge myself altogether. There were officers who, without the eye of the hetman, accomplished their service. But some neglected it terribly in the evenings, as ordinary soldiers do when they feel no iron hand above them. The enemy was not slow to take advantage of this. Two days before the coming of the king and the hetmans, Sapieha arranged his most splendid feast, for he was rejoiced that all the troops were coming and that the siege would begin in earnest. All the best-known officers were invited. The hetman, ever in search of an opportunity, announced that the feast would be in honour of the king. To Kmichits, Zagwaba, Pan Yan, Pan Stanislav and Harwamp were sent special orders to come without fail for the hetman wished to honour them particularly for their great services. Pan Andrei had just mounted his horse to go with a party, so that the orderly found the Tartars outside the gate. You cannot show the hetman disrespect and return rudeness for kindness, said the officer. Kmichits dismounted and went to ask advice of his comrades. This is dreadfully awkward for me, said he. I have heard that a considerable body of cavalry has appeared near Babitsi. The hetman himself commanded me to learn absolutely who they are, and now he asks me to the feast. What must I do? The hetman has sent an order to let Akba Ulan go with the scouting party, answered the officer. An order is an order, said Zagwaba, and whoso is a soldier must obey. Be careful not to give an evil example, and besides, it would not be well for you to incur the ill will of the hetman. Say that and I will come, said Kmichits to the orderly. The officer went out. The Tartars rode off under Akbar Ulan, and Kmichits began to dress a little, and while dressing said to his comrades, Today there is a feast in honour of his royal grace. Tomorrow there will be one in honour of the hetmans of the kingdom, and so on to the end of the siege. Only let the king come, and this will be at an end, answered Vorodyovsky. For though our gracious lord is fond of amusing himself in every trouble, still service must go on more diligently, since every man, and among others Pan Sapieha, will endeavour to show his zeal. 
We have had too much of this, too much. There is no question on that point, said Pan Yan. Is it not a wonder to you that such a laborious leader, such a virtuous man, such a worthy citizen has this weakness? Just let night come and straightway he is another person and from a grand hetman turns into a reveller. But do you know why these banquets are not to my taste? asked Kmichits. It was the custom of Janusz Radzivil to have them almost every evening. Imagine that, as if by some wonder, whenever there was a banquet, either some misfortune happened, some evil tidings came, or some new treason of the hetman was published. I do not know whether it was blind chance or an ordinance of God, but it is enough that evil never came except in time of a banquet. I tell you that at last it went so far that whenever they were setting the table, the skin began to creep on us. True, as God is dear to me, added Harwamp, but it came from this, that the Prince Hetman chose that time to announce his intrigues with the enemy of the country. Well, said Zagwaba, at least we have nothing to fear from the honest Sapieha. If he will ever be a traitor, I am of as much value as my boot heel. There is nothing to be said on that point. He is as honest as bread without a raw spot, put in Pan Mihal. And what he neglects in the evening, he repairs in the daytime, added Harwamp. Then we will go, said Zagwaba, for to tell the truth I feel a void in my stomach. They went out, mounted their horses and rode off, for Sapieha was on the other side of the city and rather far away. When they arrived at the headman's quarters they found in the yard a multitude of horses and a crowd of grooms for whom a keg of beer had been set out and who, as is usual, drinking without measure, had begun to quarrel. They grew quiet, however, at sight of the approaching knights, especially when Zagwoba fell to striking with the side of his sabre those who were in his way, and to crying with a stentorian voice, To your horses, rascals, to your horses! You are not the persons invited to the banquet! Sapieha received the officers as usual with open arms, and since he had been drinking a little with his guests, he began at once to tease Zagwoba. With the forehead, Lord Commander, said he. With the forehead, Lord Keeper, answered Zagwaba. If you call me that, said Sapieha, I will give you wine which is working yet. Very good, if it will make a tippler of a hetman. Some of the guests, hearing this, were alarmed, but Zagwaba, when he saw the hetman in good humour, permitted himself everything, and Sapieha had such a weakness for Zagwaba that he not only was not angry, but he held his sides and called those present to witness what he endured from that noble. Then began a noisy and joyous banquet. Sapieha drank to each guest separately, raised toasts to the king, the hetmans, the armies of both peoples, Poland and Lithuania, Pan Czarniecki, the whole commonwealth. Pleasure increased, and with it noise and talk. From toasts it came to songs, the room was filled with steam from the heads of the guests and the odour of mead and wines. From outside the windows came in no less of an uproar and even the noise of steel. The servants had begun to fight with sabres. Some nobles rushed out to restore order, but they increased the confusion. Suddenly there rose a shout so great that the banqueters in the hall became silent. What is that? asked one of the colonels. The grooms cannot make such an uproar as that. Silence, gentlemen, said the hetman, disturbed. Those are not ordinary shouts. All at once the windows shook from the thunder of cannon and discharges of musketry. A sortie, cried Vodyovsky. The enemy is advancing. To horse, to sabres. All sprang to their feet. There was a throng at the door, then a crowd of officers rushed to the yard, calling to their grooms for horses. But in the disturbance it was not easy for each one to find his own. Meanwhile, from beyond the yard, alarmed voices began to shout in the darkness, The enemy is advancing! Pan Kotvich is under fire! All rushed with what breath was in their horses to their squadrons, jumping over fences and breaking their necks in the darkness, 
an alarm began in the whole camp. Not all the squadrons had horses at hand, and those who had not began the uproar first of all. Throngs of soldiers on foot and on horseback struck against one another, not being able to come to order, not knowing who was a friend and who an enemy, shouting and roaring in the middle of the dark night. Some cried that the King of Sweden was advancing with his whole army. The Swedish sortie had really struck with a mighty impetus on Kotvich's men. Fortunately, being sick, he was not at the banquet, and therefore could offer some kind of immediate resistance. Still, it was not a long one, for he was attacked by superior numbers and covered with musketry fire, hence was forced to retreat. Oskierko came first to his assistance with his dragoons. They answered musketry fire with musketry fire, but neither could Oskierko's dragoons withstand the pressure, and in a moment they began to withdraw more and more hastily, leaving the ground covered with corpses. Twice did Oskierko endeavour to bring them to order, and twice was he beaten back, so that the soldiers could only cover their retreat by firing in groups. At last they scattered completely, but the Swedes pressed on like an irrepressible torrent toward the hetman's quarters. More and more regiments issued from the city to the field. After the infantry came cavalry. They brought out even field guns. It looked like a general battle, and it seemed as though the enemy sought one. Vobodyovsky, rushing from the hetman's quarters, met his own squadron, which was always in readiness, halfway, going toward the sound of the alarm and the shots. It was led by Roch Kowalski, who, like Kotvich, was not at the banquet, but Roch was not there because he had not been invited. Vorodyovsky gave orders to set fire with all speed to a couple of sheds so as to light up the field, and he hurried to the battle. On the road he was joined by Kmichitz with his terrible volunteers, and that half of the Tartars which had not gone on the scouting expedition. Both came just in time to save Kotvich and Oskierko from utter disaster. The sheds had now blazed up so well that everything could be seen as at noontide. In this light the louder men, aided by Kmichids, struck the infantry regiments, and passing through their fire took them on sabres. The Swedish cavalry sprang to assist their own men, and closed mightily with the louder squadron. For a certain time they struggled exactly like two wrestlers who, seizing each other by the bodies, use their last strength. Now this one bends the other, and now the other bends this. But men fell so frequently in their ranks that at last the Swedes began to be confused. Kmichitz, with his fighters, rushed into the thick of the struggle. Vovodyovsky, as usual, cleared an opening. Near him the two gigantic Skshetuskis fought, and Harwamp with Roch Kowalski. The louder men emulated Kmichitz's fighters, some shouting terribly, others, as the Butrims, rolling on in a body and in silence. New regiments rushed forward to the aid of the broken Swedes, but Vankovich, whose quarters were near Vorodyovsky's and Kmichitz's, was a little later than they and supported them. At last the hetman led all the troops to the engagement and began to advance in order. A fierce battle sprang up along the whole line from Mokotov to the Vistula. Then Akbar Ulan, who had gone with the scouts, appeared on a foaming horse before the hetman. Effendi, cried he, a tramble of cavalry is marching from Babitsi to the city and convoying wagons. They wish to enter the gates. Sapleha understood in one moment what that sortie in the direction of Mokotov meant. The enemy wished to draw away troops on the meadow road so that that auxiliary cavalry and provision train might enter the gates. Run to Vorodyovsky, cried the hetman to Akbar Ulan. Let the louder squadron, Kmichitz and Vankovich, stop the road. I will send them reinforcements at once. Akbar Ulan put spurs to his horse. After him flew one and a second and a third orderly. All rushed to Vorodyovsky and repeated the order of the hetman. Vorodyovsky turned his squadron immediately. Kmichitz and the Tartars caught up with him. Going across the field, they shot on together and Vankovich after them. But they arrived too late. Nearly 200 wagons had entered the gate.
A splendid detachment of cavalry following them was almost within radius of the fortress. Only the rear guard, composed of about one hundred men, had not come yet under cover of the artillery, but these two were going with all speed. The officer, riding behind, urged them on. Kmichitz, seeing them by the light of the burning shed, gave forth such a piercing and terrible shout that the horses at his side were frightened. He recognized Boguslav's cavalry, that same which had ridden over him and his Tartars at Yanov. Mindful of nothing, he rushed like a madman toward them, passed his own men, and fell first blindly among their ranks. Fortunately, the two Kiemlichis, Kosma and Damien, sitting on the foremost horses, rode with him. At that moment, Vorodyovsky struck the flank like lightning, and with this one blow cut off the rear guard from the main body. Cannon began to thunder from the walls, but the main division, sacrificing their comrades, rushed in with all speed after the wagons. Then the louder men and Kmichitz's forces surrounded the rearguard as with a ring, and a merciless slaughter began. But it was of short duration. Boguslav's men, seeing that there was no rescue on any side, sprang from their horses in a moment, threw down their weapons, and shouted with sky-piercing voices, heard in the throng and the uproar, that they surrendered. Neither the volunteers nor the Tartars regarded their shouts, but hewed on. At this moment was heard the threatening and shrill voice of Vodyovsky, who wanted informants. Stop! Stop! Take them alive! Take them alive! cried Kmichitz. The biting of steel ceased. The Tartars were commanded to bind the enemy, and with the skill peculiar to them they did this in a twinkle. Then the squadrons pushed back hastily from the cannon fire. The colonels marched toward the sheds, the louder men in advance, Vankovich in the rear, and Kmichitz with the prisoners in the centre, all in perfect readiness to repulse attack should it come. Some of the Tartars led prisoners on leashes, others of them led captured horses. Kmichitz, when he came near the sheds, looked carefully into the faces of the prisoners to see if Boguslav was among them, for though one of them had sworn under a sword point that the prince was not in the detachment, still Kmichitz thought that perhaps they were hiding him purposely. Then some voice from under the stirrup of a Tartar cried to him, Pan Kmichitz, Colonel, rescue an acquaintance, give command to free me from the rope on parole. Hassling, cried Kmichitz. Hassling was a Scot, formerly an officer in the cavalry of the Voivoda of Vilno, whom Kmichitz knew in Kedane, and in his time loved much. Let the prisoner go free, cried he to the Tartar, and down from the horse yourself. The Tartar sprang from the saddle as if the wind had carried him off, for he knew the danger of loitering when the Bagadir commanded. Hassling, groaning, climbed into the Tartar's lofty saddle. Kmichitz then caught him above the palm, and pressing his hand as if he wished to crush it, began to ask insistently, Whence do you come? Tell me quickly, whence do you come? For God's sake, tell quickly. From Taurogi, answered the officer. Kmichitz pressed him still more. But, Panana Bilevich, is she there? She is. Pan Andrei spoke with still greater difficulty, for he pressed his teeth still more closely. And what has the prince done with her? He has not succeeded in doing anything. Silence followed. After a while, Kmichitz removed his lynxskin cap, drew his hand over his forehead and said, I was struck in the battle. Blood is leaving me and I have grown weak. End of chapter 37. Recording by David Granville Young. Chapter 38 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Sienkiewicz. 
translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835 to 1906. Chapter 38. The sortie had attained its object only in part. Though Boguslav's division had entered the city, the sortie itself had not done great things. It is true that Pan Kotvich's squadron and Oskierko's dragoons had suffered seriously, but the Swedes too had strewn the field with many corpses, and one regiment of infantry, which Vorodyovsky and Vankovich had struck, was almost destroyed. The Lithuanians boasted that they had inflicted greater loss on the enemy than they had endured themselves. Pan Sapieha alone suffered internally because a new confusion had met him from which his fame might be seriously affected. The colonels attached to the hetman comforted him as well as they could, and to tell the truth this lesson was useful, for henceforward he had no more such wild banquets, and if there was some pleasure the greatest watchfulness was observed during the time of its continuance. The Swedes were caught the day after. Supposing that the hetman would not expect a repetition of the sortie so soon, they came outside the walls again, but driven from their ground and leaving a number of dead, they returned. Meanwhile, they were examining hustling in the hetman's quarters. This made Pan Andrei so impatient that he almost sprang out of his skin, for he wished to have the Scot to himself at the earliest, and talk with him touching Taurogi. He prowled about the quarters all day, went in every little while, listened to the statements, and sprang up whenever Boguslav's name was mentioned in the question. But in the evening he received an order to go on a scouting expedition. He said nothing, only set his teeth, for he had changed greatly already, and had learned to defer private affairs for public service. But he pushed the Tartars terribly during the expedition, burst out in anger at the least cause, and struck with his baton till the bones cracked. They said one to another that the Bagadir was mad, and marched silently, as silently as cowards, looking only to the eyes of the leader and guessing his thoughts on the wing. On returning he found Hassling in his quarters, but so ill that he could not speak, for his capture had affected him so cruelly that after the additional torture of a whole day's inquisition he had a fever and did not understand what was said to him. Kmichitz therefore was forced to be satisfied with what Zagwoba told of Hassling's statements, but they touched only public, not private affairs. Of Boguslav the young officer said only this, that after his return from the expedition to Podlachie and the defeat at Yanov, he had become terribly ill from rage and melancholy. He fell into a fever, but as soon as he had recovered somewhat, he moved with his troops to Pomerania, where the Steinbock and the Elector invited him most earnestly. But where is he now? asked Kmichitz. According to what Hassling tells me, and he has no reason to lie, he is with the king's brother at the fortified camp on the Narev and the Bug, where Boguslav is commanding a whole cavalry division, answered Zagwoba. Ha! And they think to come here with succour to the besieged. We shall meet as God is in heaven, even if I had to go to him in disguise. Do not grow angry for nothing. To Warsaw they would be glad to come with succour, but they cannot, for Charnitsky has placed himself in their way. Having neither infantry nor cannon, he cannot attack their camp, and they are afraid to go out against him, for they know that their soldiers could not withstand his in the field. And they know, too, that if they went out, they could not shield themselves with the river. If the king himself were there, he would give battle, for under his command the soldiers fight better, being confident that he is a great warrior. But neither Douglas, nor the king's brother, nor Prince Boguslav, though all three are daring men, would venture against Charnetsky. But where is the king? He has gone to Prussia. The king does not believe that we are before Warsaw already, and that we shall capture Wittenberg. But whether he believes or not, he had to go for two reasons. First, because he must win over the elector, even at the price of all great Poland. Second, because the army, which he led out of the sack, is of no use until it has rested. 
toil, watching, and continual alarms have so gnawed it that the soldiers are not able to hold muskets in their hands, and still they are the choicest regiments in the whole army, which through all the German and Danish regions have won famous victories. Further conversation was interrupted by the coming of Wodiowski. How is Hassling? asked he on the threshold. He is sick and imagines every folly, answered Kmichitz. And you, my dear Mihal, what do you want of Hassling? asked Zagwaba. Just as if you do not know. I could not know that it is a question with you of that cherry tree which Prince Boguswav has planted in his garden. He is a diligent gardener. He does not need to wait a year for fruit. I wish you were killed for such jokes, cried the little knight. Look at him, tell him the most innocent thing, and immediately his moustaches are quivering like the horns of a mad grasshopper. In what am I to blame? Seek vengeance on Borguswald, not on me. God grant me to seek and to find. Just now Babinich has said the same. Before long I see that he will raise the whole army against the prince. But Boguswav is taking good care of himself and without my stratagems you will not be able to succeed. Here both young men sprang to their feet and asked, Have you any stratagems? But do you think it is as easy to take a stratagem out of the head as a sabre out of the sheath? If Boguswav were here, surely I should find more than one. But at that distance, not only a stratagem, but a cannon will not strike. Pan Andrei! Give orders to bring me a goblet of mead, for it is hot in here today. I'll give you a keg of it if you will invent something. First, why do you stand over this hassling like an executioner? He is not the only man captured, you can ask others. I have already tortured others, but they are common soldiers. They know nothing, but he, as an officer, was at the court, answered Kmichitz. That is the reason, answered Zagwaba. I must talk with him too. From what he tells me of the person and ways of Prince Boguswav, stratagems may be important. Now the main thing is to finish the siege soon, for afterward we shall move surely against that army on the Narev. But somehow our gracious lord and the hetmans are a long time invisible. How so? asked Vordiovsky. I have returned this minute from the hetman, who has just received news that the king will take up position here this evening with the auxiliary divisions, and the hetmans with cavalry will come tomorrow. They are advancing from Sokol itself, resting but little, making forced marches. Besides, it has been known for two days that they are almost in sight. Are they bringing many troops? Nearly five times as many as Sapeha has. Infantry Russian and Hungarian, very excellent. Six thousand Tartars under Subagazi, but probably it is impossible to let them out for even a day, for they are very self-willed and plunder all around. Better give them to Pan Andrei to lead, said Zagwaba. Yes, said Kmichitz, I should lead them straight away from Warsaw, for they are of no use in a siege. I should take them to the Bug and the Narev. They are of use, replied Vovodyovsky, for none can see better than they that provisions do not enter the fortress. Well, it will be warm for Wittenberg. Wait, old criminal, cried Zagwaba. You have warred well, I will not deny that, but you have robbed and plundered still better. You had two mouths, one for false oaths, the other for breaking promises, but this time you will not beg off with both of them. The Gallic disease will dry up your skin, and doctors will tear it from you, but we will flay you better. Zagwaba's head for that. Nonsense. He will surrender on conditions to the king, who will not do anything to him, answered Pan Mihal, and we shall have to give him military honours besides. He will yield on conditions, will he? Indeed, cried Zagwaba. We shall see. Here he began to pound the table with such force that Roch Kowalski, who was coming in at the moment, was frightened and stood as if fixed to the threshold. 
May I serve as a waiting lad to Jews, shouted the old man, if I let free out of Warsaw that blasphemer of the faith, that robber of churches, that oppressor of widows, that executioner of men and women, that hangman's assistant, that ruffian, that blood spiller and money grabber, that purse Nora, that flayer. All right, the king will let him out on conditions, but I, as I am a Catholic, as I am Zagwaba, as I wish for happiness during life and desire God at death, will make such a tumult against him as no man has ever heard of in this commonwealth before. Don't wave your hand, Pan Michal. I'll make a tumult. I repeat it, I'll make a tumult. Uncle will make a tumult, thundered Roch Kowalski. Just then, Akbar Ulan thrust in his beast-like face at the door. Effendi, said he to Kmichitz, the armies of the king are visible beyond the Vistula. All sprang to their feet and rushed forth. The king had come indeed. First arrived the Tartar squadrons under Subagazi, but not in such numbers as was expected. After them came the troops of the kingdom, many and well armed, and above all full of ardour. Before evening, the whole army had passed the bridge freshly built by Oskerko. Sapieha was waiting for the king with squadrons drawn out as if ready for battle, standing one by the side of the other like an immense wall, the end of which it was difficult to reach with the eye. The captains stood before the regiments, near them the standard bearers, each with lowered ensign. The trumpets, kettle drums, crooked trumpets and drums made a noise indescribable. The squadrons of the kingdom, in proportion as they passed, stood just opposite the Lithuanians in line. Between one and the other army was an interval of a hundred paces. Sapieha, with baton in hand, went on foot to that open space. After him, the chief civil and military dignitaries. On the other side, from the armies of the kingdom, approached the king on a splendid Frisian horse given him by Lubomirski. He was arrayed as if for battle, in light armour of blue and gold, from under which was to be seen a black velvet kaftan with a lace collar coming out on the breastplate. But instead of a helmet, he wore the ordinary Swedish hat with black feathers. But he wore military gloves and long yellow boots coming far above his knees. After him rode the papal nuncio, the archbishop of Lvov, the bishop of Kamienets, the priest, Chechishovsky, the voivode of Krakow, the voivode of Rus, Baron Lisola, Count Pottingen, Pan Kamienetsky, the ambassador of Moscow, Pan Grodzicki, general of artillery, Tizenhaus, and many others. Sapieha advanced as marshal of the kingdom to hold the king's stirrup, but the king sprang lightly from the saddle, hurried to Sapieha and, without saying a word, seized him in his embrace. And Jan Kazimir held him a long time in view of both armies. Silent all the while, but tears flowed down his cheeks in a stream, for he pressed to his bosom the truest servant of the king and the country, a man who, though he did not equal others in genius, though he even erred at times, still soared in honesty above all the lords of that commonwealth, never wavered in loyalty, sacrificed without a moment's thought his whole fortune, and from the beginning of the war exposed his breast for his king and the country. The Lithuanians, who had whispered previously among themselves that perhaps reprimands would meet Pan Sapieha because he had let Karl Gustav escape from near Saint-Domierge and for the recent carelessness at Warsaw, or at least a cool reception, seeing this heartiness of the king, raised in honour of the kindly monarch a tremendous heaven-echoing shout. The armies of the kingdom answered it immediately with one thunder roll, and for some time above the noise of the music, the rattle of drums, the roar of musketry, were heard only these shouts. Vivat Johannes Casimirus! Long life to the armies of the crown. Long life to the Lithuanians. So they greeted one another at Warsaw, 
the walls trembled and behind the walls the Swedes. I shall bellow as God is dear to me, cried Zagorba with emotion. I cannot restrain myself. See our king, our father. Gracious gentlemen, I am blubbering. Our father, our king. The other day a wanderer deserted by all. Now here, now here are a hundred thousand sabres at call. Merciful God, I cannot keep from tears. Yesterday a wanderer. Today the Emperor of Germany has not such good soldiers. Here the sluices were opened in the eyes of Zagwaba, and he began to sob time after time. Then he turned suddenly to Roch. Be silent. What are you whimpering about? And is uncle not whimpering? answered Roch. True, as God is dear to me, I was ashamed, gracious gentlemen, of this commonwealth, but now I would not change with any nation. A hundred thousand sabres, let others show the like. God has brought them to their minds. God has given this. God has given it. Zagwaba had not made a great mistake, for really there were nearly 70,000 men at Warsaw, not counting Charnyetsky's division, which had not arrived yet, and not counting the armed camp attendants who rendered service when necessary and who straggled after every camp in countless multitudes. After the greeting and a hurried review of the troops, the king thanked Sapieha's men amid universal enthusiasm for their faithful services and went to Uyazdov. The troops occupied the positions assigned them. Some squadrons remained in Praga, others disposed themselves around the city. A gigantic train of wagons continued to cross the Vistula till the following midday. Next morning, the suburbs of the city were as white with tents as if they had been covered with snow. Countless herds of horses were neighing on the adjoining meadows. After the army followed a crowd of Armenians, Jews, Tartars. Another city, more expensive and tumultuous than that which was besieged, grew up on the plain. The Swedes, amazed during the first days at the power of the King of Poland, made no sorties, so that Pan Grodzicki, general of artillery, could ride around the city quietly and form his plan of siege. On the following day, the camp attendants began to raise entrenchments here and there, according to Grodzicki's plan. They placed on them at once the smaller cannon, for the larger ones were to appear only a couple of weeks later. Jan Kazimir sent a message to old Wittenberg, summoning him to surrender the city and lay down his arms, giving favourable conditions which, when known, roused discontent in the army. That discontent was spread mainly by Zagwaba, who had a special hatred of the Swedish commander. Wittenberg, as was easy to foresee, rejected the conditions and resolved on a defence to continue till the last drop of blood was shed and to bury himself in the ruins of the city rather than yield it to the king. The size of the besieging army did not frighten him a whit, for he knew that an excessive number was rather a hindrance than help in a siege. He was informed also in good season that in the camp of Jan Kazimir there was not one siege gun, while the Swedes had more than enough of them, not taking into consideration their inexhaustible supply of ammunition. It was in fact to be foreseen that they would defend themselves with frenzy, for Warsaw had served them hitherto as a storehouse for booty. All the immense treasures looted in castles, in churches, in cities, in the whole commonwealth came to the capital, whence they were dispatched in parties to Prussia and farther to Sweden. But at the present time, when the whole country had risen, and castles defended by the smaller Swedish garrisons did not ensure safety, booty was brought to Warsaw all the more. The Swedish soldier was more ready to sacrifice his life than his booty. A poor people who had seized the treasures of a wealthy land had acquired the taste of them to such a degree that the world had never seen more grasping robbers. The king himself had grown famous for greed, the generals followed his example, and Wittenberg surpassed them all. When it was a question of gain, neither the honour of a knight nor consideration for the dignity of rank restrained officers, 
They seized, they extorted, they skinned everything that could be taken. In Warsaw itself, colonels of high office and noble birth were not ashamed to sell spirits and tobacco to their own soldiers so as to cram their purses with the pay of the army. This too might rouse the Swedes to fury in defence, that their foremost men were at that time in Warsaw. First was Wittenberg himself, next in command to Karl Gustav. He was the first who had entered the Commonwealth and brought it to decline at Ustje. In return for that service, a triumph was prepared for him in Sweden as for a conqueror. In the city was Oxenstiern, the Chancellor, a statesman renowned throughout the world, respected for honesty even by his enemies. He was called the Minerva of the King. To his council, Karl was indebted for all his victories in negotiation. In the capital was also Wrangel, the younger Horn, Ericsson, the second Lohenhaupt, and many Swedish ladies of high birth who had followed their husbands to the country as to a new Swedish colony. The Swedes had something to defend. Jan Kazimir understood, therefore, that the siege, especially through the lack of heavy guns on his side, would be long and bloody. The Hetmans understood this also, but the army would not think of it. Barely had Grodzicki raised the entrenchments in some fashion, barely had he pushed forward somewhat to the walls, when deputations went from all the squadrons to ask the king to permit volunteers to storm the walls. The king had to explain to them a long time that fortresses were not taken with sabres before he could restrain their ardour. Meanwhile, the works were pushed forward as rapidly as possible. The troops, not being able to storm, took eager part with the camp servants in raising these works. Men from the foremost regiments, nay even officers, brought earth in wheelbarrows, carried fascines, laboured. More than once the Swedes tried to hinder, and not a day passed without sorties. But barely were the Swedish musketeers outside the gate, when the Poles, working at the entrenchments, throwing aside wheelbarrows, bundles of twigs, spades and pickaxes, ran with sabres into the smoke so furiously that the Swedes had to hide in the fortress with all haste. In these engagements, bodies fell thickly. The fosses and the open space as far as the entrenchments were full of graves, in which were placed sometimes small bundles of the weapons of the dead. At last, even time failed for burial, so that bodies lay on the ground, spreading a terrible odour around the city and the besiegers. In spite of the greatest difficulty, citizens stole forth to the king's camp every day, reporting what happened in the city and imploring on their knees to hasten the storm. The Swedes, they said, had a plenty of provisions as yet, but the people were dying of hunger on the streets. They lived in want, in oppression under the terrible hand of the garrison. Every day echoes brought to the Polish camp sounds of musket shots in the city, and fugitives brought intelligence that the Swedes were shooting citizens suspected of goodwill to Jan Kazimir. The hair stood on end at the stories of the fugitives. They said that the whole population, sick women, newly born infants, old men, all lived at night on the streets, for the Swedes had driven them from their houses and made passages from wall to wall, so that the garrison, in case Jan Kazimir's troops should enter, might withdraw and defend themselves. Rains fell on the people in their camping places. On clear days the sun burned them. At night the cold pinched them. Citizens were not allowed to kindle fires. They had no means of preparing warm food. Various diseases spread more and more and carried away hundreds of victims. Jan Kazimir's heart was ready to burst when he heard these narratives. He sent therefore courier after courier to hasten the coming of the heavy guns. Days and weeks passed, but it was impossible to undertake anything more important than the repulse of sorties. Still, the besiegers were strengthened by the thought that the garrison must fail of provisions at last, since the roads were blocked in such fashion that a mouse could not reach the fortress. The besieged lost hope of assistance. The troops under Douglas, which were posted nearest, were not only unable to come to the rescue, but had to think of their own skin. For Jan Kazimir, 
having even too many men, was able to harass them. At last, the Poles, even before the coming of the heavy guns, opened on the fortress with the smaller ones. Pan Grodzicki, from the side of the Vistula, raised in front of himself, like a mole, earth defences, pushed to within six yards of the moat, and vomited a continual fire on the unfortunate city. The magnificent Kazanovsky Palace was ruined, and the Poles did not regret it, for the building belonged to the traitor Radzeyovsky. The shattered walls were barely standing, shining with their empty windows. Day and night, balls were dropping on the splendid terraces and in the gardens, smashing the beautiful fountains, bridges, arbors and marble statues, terrifying the peacocks, which with pitiful screams gave notice of their unhappy condition. Pan Grodzicki hurled fire on the Bernardine bell tower, for he had decided to begin the assault on that side. Meanwhile, the camp's servants begged permission to attack the city, for they wished greatly to reach the Swedish treasures earliest. The king refused at first, but finally consented. A number of prominent officers undertook to lead them, and among others, Kmichitz, who was embittered by delay, and not only that, but in general he knew not what to do with himself. For Hassling, having fallen into a grievous fever, lay without consciousness for some weeks and could speak of nothing. Men, therefore, were summoned to the storm. Grodzicki opposed this to the last moment, insisting that until a breach was made, the city could not be taken, even though the regular infantry were to go to the assault. But as the king had given permission, Grodzicki was forced to yield. June 15, about 6,000 camp servants assembled. Ladders, bundles of brush, and bags of sand were prepared. Toward evening, a throng, barefoot and armed for the greater part only with sabres, began to approach the city where the trenches and earth defences came nearest the moat. When it had become perfectly dark, the men rushed at a given signal toward the moat with a terrible uproar and began to fill it. The watchful Swedes received them with a murderous fire from muskets and cannons, and a furious battle sprang up along the whole eastern side of the city. Under cover of darkness, the Poles filled the moat in a twinkle and reached the walls in an orderless mass. Kmichitz, with 2,000 men, fell upon an earth fort, which the Poles called the Mole Hill and which stood near the Krakow Gate. In spite of a desperate defence, he captured this place at a blow. The garrison was cut to pieces with sabres, not a man was spared. Pan Andrei gave command to turn the guns on the gate, and some of them to the farther walls, so as to aid and cover somewhat those crowds who were striving to scale the walls. These men, however, were not so fortunate. They put the ladders in position, and ascended them so furiously that the best-trained infantry could not have done better. But the Swedes, safe behind battlements, fired into their very faces, and hurled stones and blocks prepared for the purpose. Under the weight of these, the ladders were broken into pieces, and at last the infantry pushed down the assaulters with long spears, against which sabres had no effect. More than 500 of the best camp servants were lying at the foot of the wall. The rest passed the moat under an incessant fire and took refuge again in the Polish entrenchments. The storm was repulsed, but the little fort remained in the hands of the Poles. In vain did the Swedes roll at it all night from their heaviest guns. Kmichitz answered them in like manner from those cannon which he had captured. Only in the morning, when light came, were his guns dismounted to the last one. Wittenberg, for whom that entrenchment was as his head, sent infantry at once with the order not to dare return without retaking what had been lost. But Grodzicki sent reinforcements to Kmichitz, by the aid of which he not only repulsed the infantry, but fell upon and drove them to the Krakow Gate. Grodzicki was so delighted that he ran in person to the king with the report. Gracious Lord, said he, I was opposed to yesterday's work, but now I see that it was not lost. While that entrenchment was in the enemy's hands, I could do nothing against the gate. 
But now only let the heavy guns come, and in one night I will make a breach. The king, who was grieved that so many good men had fallen, was rejoiced at Grodzitski's words, and asked at once, But who has command in that entrenchment? Pan Babinich, answered a number of voices. The king clapped his hands. He must be first everywhere. Worthy general, I know him. He is a terribly stubborn cavalier and will not let himself be smoked out. It would be a mistake beyond forgiveness, gracious lord, if we should permit that. I have already sent him infantry and small cannon. For that they will try to smoke him out is certain. It is a question of Warsaw. That cavalier is worth his weight in gold. He is worth more, for this is not his first, and not his tenth achievement, said the king. Then Jan Kazimir gave orders to bring quickly a horse and a field glass, and he rode out to look at the earthwork. But it was not to be seen from behind the smoke, for a number of forty-eight pounders were blowing on it with ceaseless fire. They hurled long balls, bombs, and grape shot. Still, the entrenchment was so near the gate that musket balls almost reached it. The bombshells could be seen perfectly when they flew up like cloudlets and, describing a closely bent bow, fell into that cloud of smoke bursting with terrible explosion. Many fell beyond the entrenchment and they prevented the approach of reinforcements. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost, said the King, Tizenhaus, look, a pile of torn earth is all that remains. Tizenhaus, do you know who is there? Gracious king, Babinich is there. If he comes out living, he will be able to say that he was in hell during life. We must send him fresh men. Worthy general, the orders are already given, but it is difficult for them to go since bombs pass over and fall very thickly on this side of the fort. Turn all the guns on the wall so as to make a diversion, said the king. Grodzitski put spurs to his horse and galloped to the trenches. After a while, cannonading was heard on the whole line, and somewhat later it was seen that a fresh division of Mazovian infantry went out of the nearest trenches and on a run to the molehill. The king stood there looking continually. At last he cried, Babin, it should be relieved in the command. And who, gentlemen, will volunteer to take his place? Neither Pan Jan, Pan Stanislav, nor Vordyovsky was near the king. Therefore, a moment of silence followed. I, said suddenly Pan Topor Grudevsky, an officer of the light squadron of the primate. I, said Tizenhaus. I, 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 called at once a number of voices. Let the man go who offered himself first, said the king. Pan Topor Grilevsky made the sign of the cross, raised the canteen to his mouth, then galloped away. The king remained looking at the cloud of smoke with which the molehill was covered, and the smoke rose above it like a bridge up to the very wall. Since the fort was near the Vistula, the walls of the city towered above it, and therefore the fire was terrible. Meanwhile, the thunder of cannon decreased somewhat, though the balls did not cease to describe arcs, and a rattle of musketry was given out as if thousands of men were beating threshing floors with flails. It is evident that they are going to the attack again, said Tizenhaus. If there were less smoke, we should see the infantry. Let us approach a little, said the king, urging his horse. After him, others moved on, and riding along the bank of the Vistula from Uyazdov, they approached almost to the Solitz itself. And since the gardens of the palaces and the cloisters coming down to the Vistula had been cleared by the Swedes in the winter for fuel, trees did not cover the view. They could see, even without field glasses, that the Swedes were really moving again to the storm. I would rather lose that position, said the king all at once, than that the Beanit should die. God will defend him, said the priest Chechishovsky. And Pan Grodzitski will not fail to send him reinforcements, added Tizenhaus. Further conversation was interrupted by some horseman who was approaching from the direction of the city at all speed. Tizenhaus, having such sight that he saw better with the naked eye than others through field glasses, caught his head at sight of him and said, 
Grilevsky is returning. It must be that Kmichitz has fallen and the fort is captured. The king shaded his eyes with his hands. Grilevsky rushed up, reined in his horse and, panting for breath, exclaimed, Gracious Lord! What has happened? Is he killed? asked the king. Pan Bebinich says that he is well and does not wish anyone to take his place. He begs only to send him food, for he has had nothing to eat since morning. Is he alive then? cried the king. He says that he is comfortable there, repeated Grilevsky. But others, catching breath from wonder, began to cry, That is courage! He is a soldier! But it was necessary to stay there and relieve him absolutely, said the king to Grilevsky. Is it not a shame to come back? Were you afraid or what? It would have been better not to go. Gracious Lord, answered Grilevsky, whoso calls me a coward, him I will correct on any field, but before majesty I must justify myself. I was in the anthill itself, but the beanich flew into my face because of my errand. Go, said he, to the hangman. I am at work here. I am almost creeping out of my skin and I have no time to talk, but I will not share either my glory or command with any man. I am well here and I will stay here, but I'll give orders to take you outside the trench. I wish you were killed, said he. We want to eat and they send us a commandant instead of food. What had I to do, gracious lord? I do not wonder at his temper, for their hands are dropping from toil. And how is it? asked the king. Is he holding the place? Desperately. What would he not hold? I forgot to tell besides that he shouted to me when I was going, I'll stay here a week and will not surrender if I have something to eat. Is it possible to hold out there? There, gracious lord, is the genuine day of judgment. Bomb is falling after bomb, pieces of shells are whistling like devils around the ear, the earth is dug out into ditches, it is impossible to speak from smoke, the balls hurl around sand and earth so that every moment a man must shake himself to avoid being buried. Many have fallen, but those who are living lie in furrows in the entrenchments and have made defences before their heads of stakes strengthened with earth. The Swedes constructed the place carefully, and now it serves against them. While I was there, infantry came from Grodzitski, and now there is fighting again. Since we cannot attack the walls until a breach is made, said the king, we will strike the palace on the crack of suburbs today. That will be the best diversion. The palace is wonderfully strengthened, almost changed into a fortress, remarked Tissenhaus. But they will not hurry from the city to give aid, for all their fury will be turned on Babinich, said the king. So will it be, as I am here alive, so will it be. I will order the storm at once, but first I will bless Babinich. Then the king took from the priest a golden crucifix in which were splinters of the true cross, and raising it on high, he began to bless the distant mound, covered with fire and smoke, saying, O God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, have mercy on thy people, and give salvation to the dying. Amen, amen, amen. End of chapter 38. Recording by David Granville Young. Chapter 39 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Sienkiewicz. Translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835-1906. to 1906. Chapter 39. A bloody storm followed from the side of the Novi Shvat against the Krakow suburbs, not over-successful, but in so far effective that it turned the attention of the Swedes from the entrenchment defended by Kmichitz and permitted the garrison enclosed in it to rest somewhat. The Poles pushed forward, however, to the Kazimirovsky palace, but they could not hold that point. 
On the other side, they stormed up to the Danilovich Palace and to Danzig House, equally without result. A number of hundreds of people fell again. The king, however, had this consolation. He saw that even the general militia rushed to the walls with the greatest daring and devotion, and that after those attempts, more or less unsuccessful, their courage not only had not fallen, but on the contrary, assurance of victory was growing strong in the army. The most fortunate event of the day was the arrival of Pan Jan Zamoyski and Pan Czarniecki. The first brought very excellent infantry and guns from Zamosch, so heavy that the Swedes had nothing like them in Warsaw. The second, in agreement with Sapieha, having besieged Douglas and with some Lithuanian troops and the general militia of Podlaski, under command of Pan Jan, had come to Warsaw to take part in the general storm. It was hoped by Czarniecki as well as others that this would be the last storm. Zamoyski's heavy guns were placed in the position taken by Kmicic. They began work immediately against the walls and the gate, and forced the Swedish howitzers to silence at once. General Grodzicki himself occupied the Mole Hill, and Kmicic returned to his Tartars. But he had not reached his quarters when he was summoned to Uyazdov. The king, in presence of the whole staff, applauded the young knight, Neither Czarniecki, Sapieha, Lubomirski, nor the hetman spared praises on him. He stood there in torn garments, covered with earth, his face entirely discoloured with powder smoke, without sleep, soiled but joyous because he had held the place, had won so much praise, and gained immeasurable glory in both armies. Among other cavaliers, Pan Mihal and Pan Yan congratulated him. You do not know indeed, Pan Andrei, said the little knight, what great weight you have with the king. I was at the council of war yesterday, for Pan Czarniecki took me with him. They talked of the storm, and then of the news which had just come in from Lithuania, the war there, and the cruelties which Pontus de Lagardi and the Swedes permit. They were considering at the council how to strengthen resistance. Sapieha said it was best to send thither a couple of squadrons, and a man who could be there what Czarniecki was at the beginning of the war in Poland, to which the king answered, There is only one such man, Babinich. The others confirmed this at once. I would go most willingly to Lithuania, and especially to Zhmuj, answered Kmicic. I resolved to ask of the king myself permission to go, but I am waiting till Warsaw is taken. There will be a general storm tomorrow, said Zagwaba. I know, but how is Ketling? Who is that? Hasling? All one, for he has two names, as is the custom among the English, the Scots, and many other nations. True, answered Zagwaba, and a Spaniard every day of the week has a new name for himself. Your servant told me that Hasling, or Ketling, is well. He has begun to talk, walks, the fever has left him, he calls for food every hour. Have you been with him? asked Kmicic of Pan Mihal. I have not, for I have had no time. Who has a head for anything but the storm? Then let us go now. Go to sleep first, said Zagwaba. True, true, I am barely standing on my feet. So, when he came to his own quarters, Pan Andrei followed Zagwaba's advice, especially as he found Hasling asleep. But Zagwaba and Vordiovsky came to see him in the evening. They sat down in the broad summer house which the Tartars had made for their Bagadir. The Kimliches poured out for them mead a hundred years old, which the king had sent to Kmicic, and they drank it willingly, for the air was hot outside. Hasling, pale and emaciated, seemed to draw life and strength from the precious liquid. Zagwaba clicked with his tongue and wiped perspiration from his forehead. Hey, how the great guns are thundering, said the young Scot, listening. Tomorrow you will go to the storm. It is well, for the healthy. God give you blessing. I am of foreign blood, and serve him whom it was my duty to serve, but you have my best wishes. Ah, what mead this is! 
life enters me. Thus speaking, he threw back his golden hair and raised his blue eyes toward heaven. He had a wonderful face, half childlike as yet. Zagwoba looked at him with a certain emotion. You speak Polish as well as any of us, said he. Become a Pole, love this, our country, and you will do an honourable deed, and mead will not be lacking to you. It is not difficult for a soldier to receive naturalization with us. All the more easy since I am a noble, answered Hassling. My name is Hassling Ketling of Elgin. My family come from England, though settled in Scotland. Those countries beyond the sea are far away, and somehow it is more decent for a man to live here, said Zagwaba. It is pleasant for me here. But unpleasant for us, said Kmichitz, who from the beginning was twisting impatiently on the bench, for we are anxious to hear what is going on in Taurogi, but you are talking genealogies. Ask me, I will answer. Have you seen Palina Belevich often? Over the pale face of Hassling blushes past. Every day, said he. Kmichitz looked at him quickly. Were you such a confident? Why do you blush? Every day. How every day? For she knew that I wished her well, and I rendered her some services. That will appear from the further narrative, but now it is necessary to commence at the beginning. You, gentlemen, know, perhaps, that I was not at Kiedani when Prince Boguslav came and took that lady to Tarogi. Therefore, I will not repeat why that happened, for different people gave different accounts. I will only say that they had scarcely arrived when all saw at once that the prince was terribly in love. God punish him, cried Kmichitz. Amusements followed, such as had not been before, tilting at the ring and tournaments, Anyone would have thought it a time of the greatest peace, but letters were coming in every day, as well as envoys from the Elector and from Prince Janusz. We knew that Prince Janusz was pushed by Sapieha and the Confederates. He implored for rescue by the mercy of God, for destruction was threatening him. We did nothing. On the Elector's boundary, troops were standing ready. Captains were coming with letters but we did not go with assistance, for the prince had no success with the lady. Is that why Boguslav did not give aid to his cousin? asked Zagwaba. It is. Patterson said the same, and all the persons nearest the prince. Some complained of this, others were glad that the Rajivils were falling. Sakovich conducted all public business for the prince, answered letters, and held counsel with the envoys. But the prince was labouring on one idea only, to contrive some kind of amusement, either a cavalcade or hunt. He, a miser, scattered money on every side. He gave orders to fell forests for whole miles, so that the lady might have a better view from her windows. In a word, he really scattered flowers under her feet, and received her in such fashion that had she been Queen of Sweden, he could have invented nothing better. Many pitied her and said, All this is for her ruin. As to marrying, the prince will not marry, and if he can only catch her heart, he will deceive her. But it appeared that she was not a lady to be conducted with a virtue does not go. Oh, well, what? cried Kmichitz, springing up. I know that better than others. How did Panina Bilevich receive these royal homages? asked Pan Mihal. At first with affable face, though it was evident that she was bearing some sorrow in her heart. She was present at the hunts, at the masquerades, cavalcades and tournaments, thinking indeed that these were usual court amusements with the prince. It happened on a time that the prince, straining his imagination over various spectacles, wished to show the lady the counterfeit of war. He had a settlement burned near Taurogi, Infantry defended it, the prince stormed the place. Evidently, he gained a great victory, after which, being sated with praise, he fell at the lady's feet and begged for a return of his love. It is not known what he proposed to her, but from that time their friendship was at an end. 
she began to hold night and day to the sleeve of her uncle, the sword-bearer of Rochenier. But the prince... Began to threaten her, did he? cried Kmichitz. What? Threaten? He dressed himself as a Greek shepherd, as Philemon. Special couriers were flying to Königsberg for patterns of shepherds' garments, for ribbons and wigs. He feigned despair. He walked under her windows and played on a lute. And here I tell you, gentlemen, what I really think. He was a savage executioner of the virtue of ladies, and it may be boldly said of him, as is said in our country of such people, his sighs filled out the sails of more than one lady, but this time he fell in love in earnest, which is no wonder, for the lady reminds one more of a goddess than a dweller in this earthly vale. Here Hassling blushed again, but Pan Andrei did not see it, for seizing his sides with satisfaction and pride, he looked with a triumphant glance at Zagwoba and Vodiovsky. We know her, a perfect Diana. She needs only the moon in her hair, said the little knight. What? Diana! Diana's dogs would howl at Diana if they could see Panana Bilevich. Therefore I said it is no wonder, answered Hassling. Well, but with that no wonder, I would burn him with a slow fire. For that no wonder, I would have him shod with hobnails. Give us peace, interrupted Zagwaba. Get him first, then play pranks. But now let this cavalier speak. More than once I was on watch before the room in which he slept, continued Hassling. I know how he turned on his bed, sighed, talked to himself, and hissed as if from pain. Evidently, desires were burning him. He changed terribly, dried up. It may be, too, that the illness under which he afterward fell was diving into him. Meanwhile, news flew through the whole court that the prince had become so distracted that he wanted to marry. This came to Janusz's princess, who, with her daughter, was living at Taurogi. Then began anger and disputes, for, as you know, Boguslav, according to agreement, is to marry Janusz's daughter when she comes of age. But he forgot everything, so pierced was his heart. Janusz's princess, falling into a rage, went with her daughter to Kurland. That same evening he made a proposal to Panana Bilevich. Did he make proposals? cried Zagwaba, Kmichitz, and Pan Michal with astonishment. He did. First to the sword-bearer of Rochenye, who was no less astonished than you, and would not believe his own ears. But, convinced at last, he was barely able to control himself from delight, for it was no small splendour for the house of Bilevich to be united with the Rajivils. It is true, as Patterson said, that there is some connection already, but it is old and forgotten. Tell on, said Kmichitz, trembling from impatience. Both went to the lady with all ostentation, as is the custom on such occasions. The whole court was trembling. Evil tidings came from Prince Janusz. Sakovich alone read them, but no one paid attention to them, nor even to Sakovich, for he had fallen out of favour because he had proposed the marriage. But among us, some said that it was no novelty for the Rajivils to marry ordinary noble women that in the Commonwealth all nobles were equal, and that the house of Bilevich went back to Roman times. And this was said by those who wished to gain for themselves the favour of the coming princess. Others asserted that this was a stratagem of the prince to come to great intimacy with the lady, which happens not infrequently between persons betrothed. That was it, nothing else, said Zagwaba. And so I think, said Hassling, but listen further. When we were deliberating in the court among ourselves in this fashion, the report went out like a thunderbolt that the lady had cut all doubt as with a sabre, for she refused him directly. God bless her, cried Kmichitz. She refused him directly, continued Hassling. It was enough to look at the prince to know that. He, to whom princesses yielded, could not endure resistance, and almost went mad. 
It was dangerous to appear before him. We all saw that it would not remain long thus, and that the prince would use force sooner or later. In fact, the sword-bearer of Rochenye was carried off the next day to Tilja, beyond the elector's boundary. That day the lady implored the officer keeping guard before her door to give her a loaded pistol. The officer did not refuse that, for being a noble and man of honour, he felt compassion for the lady and homage for her beauty and resolution. Who was that officer? asked Kmichitz. I, answered Hassling dryly. Pan Andrei seized him by the shoulders so that the young Scot, being weak, called out from pain. That is nothing, cried Kmichitz. You are not a prisoner. You are my brother, my friend. Tell me what you wish. In God's name, tell me what you wish. To rest a while, answered Hassling, breathing heavily, and he was silent. He merely pressed the hands which Pan Miha and Zagwaba gave him. At last, seeing that all were burning with curiosity, he continued, I forewarned her too of what all knew, that the prince's physician was preparing some intoxicating drug. Meanwhile, fears turned out to be groundless, for God interfered in the affair. He touched the prince with his finger, threw him on a bed of sickness, and kept him there a month. It is a marvel, gentlemen, but it happened as if he had been cut from his feet as with a scythe that same day, when he intended to attack the virtue of this lady. The hand of God, I say, nothing else. He thought that himself, and was afraid. May be, too, that during his sickness the desire left him, Maybe he was waiting to regain his strength. It is enough that when he came to himself, he left her in peace and even permitted the sword-bearer to come from Tilja. It is true also that the sickness which confined him to his bed left him, but not the fever which is, I believe, crushing him to this day. It is true also that soon after he left the bed, he had to go on the expedition to Tikotchin, where defeat met him. He returned with a still greater fever. Then the elector sent for him. But meanwhile, a change took place at Taurogi, of which it is wonderful and laughable to tell. It is enough that the prince cannot count on the loyalty of any officer or any attendant unless on very old ones, who neither hear nor see perfectly, and therefore guard nothing well. What happened? asked Zagwaba. During the Tikotchin campaign, before the defeat at Tanov, they captured a certain Panana Anusha Bohata and sent her to Taurogi. There, grandmother, you have cakes, exclaimed Zagwaba. Pan Mihao began to blink and move his moustaches. At last he said, Say nothing bad of her, or when you recover you will have to meet me. Even if I wished, I could say nothing bad of that lady, but if she is your betrothed, I say that you take poor care of her, and if she is a relative, you know her too well to deny what I say. It is enough that in one week she made all in the company, old and young, in love with her, and only by using her eyes with the addition of some tricks of witchcraft, of which I can give no account. She, I should know her in hell by this, muttered Zagwaba. It is a wonderful thing, said Hassling. Panana Bilevich is equal to her in beauty, but has such dignity and unapproachableness that a man, while admiring and doing homage to her, does not dare to raise his eyes, much less to conceive any hope. You know yourselves, gentlemen, that there are different kinds of ladies. Some are like ancient vestals. Others, you have barely seen them, and you wish... Worthy sir, said Pan Mihao threateningly. Don't make a fool of yourself, Mihao, for he tells the truth, said Zagwaba. You go around like a young cockerel and show the whites of your eyes. But that she is a coquette we all know, and you have said so more than a hundred times. Let us leave this matter, said Hassling. I wished simply to explain to you, gentlemen, why only a few were in love with Panana Bilevich. Those who could really appreciate her unrivalled perfection, here he blushed again, 
and with Pananer Borja Bohata nearly all. As God is dear to me, I had to laugh, for it was just as if some plague had come upon hearts. Disputes and duels increased in the twinkle of an eye. And about what? For what? You must know that there was no one who could boast of the love of the lady. Each one believed blindly in this alone, that earlier or later he would have some success. He has painted her, as it were, muttered Pan Mihal. But these two young ladies became wonderfully fond of each other, continued Hassling. One would not move a step without the other, and Panana Borja Bahata manages in Taurogi as it pleases her. How is that? asked the little knight. For she rules everybody. Sakovich did not go on a campaign this time, because he is in love, and Sakovich is absolute master in all the possessions of Prince Boguslav, and Panana Anusha governs through him. Is he so much in love with her? asked Pan Mihal. He is, and has the greatest confidence in himself, for he is a very rich man. And his name is Sakovich? You wish, I see, to remember him well. Certainly, answered Pan Mihal, as it were, carelessly, but at the same time he moved his moustaches so ominously that a shudder went through Zagwoba. I only wish to add, continued Hassling, that if Panana Borja Bohata should command Sakovich to betray the prince and lighten her escape and that of her friend, I think he would do it without hesitation. But so far as I know, she wishes to do that without his knowledge, maybe to spite him, who knows. It is enough that an officer, a relative of mine, but not a Catholic, assured me that the departure of the sword-bearer with the ladies is arranged. Officers are involved in the conspiracy, and it is to take place soon. Here, Hassling began to breathe heavily, for he was weary and was using the last of his strength. And this is the most important thing that I had to tell you, added he hurriedly. Vodiovsky and Kmichits seized their heads. Whither are they going to flee? To the forests and through the forests to Białowieża. Further conversation was interrupted by the entrance of Sapieha's orderly, who delivered to Pan Michał and Kmichits a quarter of a sheet of paper folded in four. Vodiovsky had barely unfolded his when he said, The order to occupy positions for tomorrow's work. Do you hear how the cannons are roaring? asked Zagwaba. Well, tomorrow, tomorrow. Oof, hot, said Zagwaba. A bad day for a storm. May the devil take such heat, mother of God. But more than one will grow cold in spite of the heat. But not those, not those who commend themselves to thee, our patroness. But the cannons are thundering. I am too old for storms. The open field is something else. Another officer appeared in the door. Is his grace Pan Zagwaba here? asked he. I am here. By the command of our gracious king, you are to be near his person tomorrow. Ha! He wishes to keep me from the storm, for he knows that the old man will move first. Only let the trumpet sound. He is a kind lord, mindful. I should not like to annoy him, but whether I shall restrain myself, I know not. For when the desire presses me, I think of nothing and roll straight into the smoke. Such is my nature, a kind lord. Do you hear how the trumpets are sounding for everyone to take his place? Well, tomorrow, tomorrow. St. Peter will have work. He must have his books ready. In hell, too, they have put fresh pitches in the kettles. A bath for the Swedes. Off, off, tomorrow. End of chapter 39. Recording by David Granville Young. Chapter 40 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Sienkiewicz. 
translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835 to 1906. Chapter 40. July 1st, between Povonsky and the settlement afterward called Marymount, was celebrated a great field mass, which 10,000 men of the quarter soldiers heard with attentive mind. The king made a vow that in case of victory, he would build a church to the Most Holy Lady. Dignitaries, the hetmans, the knights made vows, and even simple soldiers, following the example, each according to his means, for this was to be the day of the final storm. After the mass, each of the leaders moved to his own command. Sapieha took his position opposite the Church of the Holy Ghost, which at that time was outside the walls. But because it was the key to the walls, it was greatly strengthened by the Swedes and occupied in fitting manner by the troops. Charnyetsky was to capture Danzig House, for the rear wall of that building formed a part of the city wall, and by passing through the building it was possible to reach the city. Piotr Opalinski, the voyevoda of Podlaski, with men from Great Poland and Mazovia, was to attack from the Krakow suburbs and the Vistula. The quarter regiments were to attack the gates of New City. There were so many men that they almost exceeded the approaches to the walls. The entire plain, all the neighbouring suburban villages and the meadows were overflowed with a sea of soldiers. Beyond the men were white tents, after the tents wagons far away. The eye was lost in the blue distance before it could reach the end of that swarm. Those legions were standing in perfect readiness, with weapons point forward and one foot in advance for the run. They were ready at any moment to rush to the breaches made by the guns of heavy calibre, and especially by Zamoyski's great guns. The guns did not cease to play for a moment. The storm was deferred only because they were waiting for the final answer of Wittenberg to the letter which the Grand Chancellor Koreczynski had sent him. When, about midday, the officer returned with a refusal, the ominous trumpets rang out around the city, and the storm began. The armies of the kingdom under the Hetmans, Charnyetsky's men, the regiments of the king, the infantry regiments of Zamoyski, the Lithuanians of Sapieha, and the legions of the general militia rushed toward the walls like a swollen river but from behind the walls bloomed out against them rolls of white smoke and darts of flame. Heavy cannon, arquebuses, double-barrelled guns, muskets thundered simultaneously. The earth was shaken in its foundations. The balls broke into that throng of men, ploughed long furrows in it, but the men ran on and tore up to the fortress, regarding neither fire nor death. Clouds of powder smoke hid the sun. Each attacked furiously what was nearest him. The Hetmans, the gates of New City. Charnyetsky, Danzig House. Sapieha with the Lithuanians, the Church of the Holy Ghost. The Mazovians and men of Great Poland, the Krakow suburbs. The heaviest work fell to the last mentioned men, for the palaces and houses along the Krakow suburbs were turned into fortresses. But that day such fury of battle had seized the Mazovians that nothing could stand before their onset. They took by storm house after house, palace after palace. They fought in windows, in doors, in passages. After the capture of one house, before the blood was dry on their hands and faces, they rushed to another. Again a hand-to-hand -hand battle, and again they rushed farther. The private regiments vied with the general militia and the general militia with the infantry. They had been commanded before advancing to the storm to carry at their breasts bundles of unripe grain to ward off the bullets, but in the ardour and frenzy of battle they hurled aside every defence and ran forward with bare bosoms. In the midst of a bloody struggle, the chapel of the Tsar Shusky and the lordly palace of the Konietz Polskys were captured. The Swedes were destroyed to the last man in the smaller buildings, in the stables of the magnates, in the gardens descending to the Vistula. 
Near the Kazanovsky Palace, the Swedish infantry tried to make a stand in the street and reinforced from the walls of the palace, from the church and the bell tower of the Bernardines, which was turned into a strong fortress, they received the attack with a cutting fire. But the hail of bullets did not stop the attack for a moment, and the nobles, with the cry of Mazovians victorious, rushed with sabres into the centre of the quadrangle. After them came the land infantry, servants armed with poles, pickaxes and scythes. The quadrangle was broken in a twinkle and hewing began. Swedes and Poles were so mingled together that they formed one gigantic mass which squirmed, twisted and rolled in its own blood between the Kazanovsky Palace, the House of Radzeyovsky and the Krakow Gate. But new legions of warriors breathing blood came on continually, like a foaming river, from the direction of the Krakow Gate. The Swedish infantry was cut to pieces at last, and then began that famous storm of the Kazanovsky Palace and the Bernardines Church, which in great part decided the fate of the day. Zagwaba commanded, for he was mistaken the day before in thinking that the king called him to his person only to be present, for, on the contrary, he confided to him, as to a famous and experienced warrior, command over the camp servants who, with the quarter soldiers and the general militia, were to go as volunteers to storm from that side. Zagwaba was willing, it is true, to go with these men in the rear and content himself with occupying the palaces already captured. But when in the very beginning all vying with one another were mingled completely, the human current bore him on with the others. So he went, for although he had from nature great circumspection as a gift, and preferred, where it was possible, not to expose his life to danger, he had for so many years become accustomed to battles in spite of himself, had been present in so many dreadful slaughters, that when the inevitable came, he fought with others, and even better than others, for he fought with desperation and rage in a manful heart. So at this time, he found himself at the gate of the Kazanovsky Palace, or rather in the hell which was raging dreadfully in front of that gate, that is, amid a whirlpool, heat, crushing, a storm of bullets, fire, smoke, groans and shouts of men. Thousands of scythes, picks and axes were driven against the gate. A thousand arms pressed and pushed it furiously. Some men fell as if struck by lightning. Others pushed themselves into their places, trampled their bodies and forced themselves forward as if seeking death on purpose. No one had seen or remembered a more stubborn defence, but also not a more resolute attack. From the highest stories, bullets were rained and pitch poured down on the gate. But those who were under fire, even had they wished, could not withdraw. So powerfully were they pressed from behind. You saw single men, wet from perspiration, black from smoke, with set teeth, with wild eyes, hurling at the gate beams of such size that at an ordinary time three strong men would not have been able to lift them. So their strength was trebled by frenzy. All the windows were stormed simultaneously. Ladders were placed at the upper stories. Lattices were hewn from the walls. But still from those lattices and windows, from openings cut in the walls, were sticking out musket barrels, which did not cease to smoke for a moment. But at last such smoke ascended, such dust rose, that on that bright sunny day the assailants could scarcely recognise one another. In spite of that, they did not desist from the struggle, but climbed ladders the more fiercely, attacked the gate more wildly, because the sounds from the church of the Bernardines announced that there other parties were storming with similar energy. Now Zagwaba cried with a voice so piercing that it was heard amid the uproar and shots, A box with powder under the gate! It was brought to him in a twinkle. He gave command at once to cut just beneath the bolt an opening of such size that the box alone would find place in it. When the box was fitted in, 
Zagwaba himself set fire to the sulphur thread, then commanded, Aside, close to the wall. Those standing near rushed to both sides, toward those who had placed the ladders at the farther windows. A moment of expectation followed. A mighty report shook the air, and new bundles of smoke rose toward the sky. Zagwaba sprang forward with his men. They saw that the explosion had not rent the gate to small pieces, but had torn the hinges from the right side, wrested away a couple of strong beams, already partly cut, turned the handle, and pulled off one half of the lower part, so that a passage was open through which large men might enter easily. Sharpened stakes, axes, and scythes began to beat violently on the weakened door. A hundred arms pushed it with utmost effort. A sharp crash was heard, and all one half fell, uncovering the depth of the dark antechamber. In that darkness gleamed discharges of musketry, but the human river rushed forward with an irresistible torrent. The palace was captured. At the same time they broke in through the windows, and a terrible battle with cold weapons began in the interior of the palace. Chamber was taken after chamber, corridor after corridor, story after story. The walls had been so shattered and weakened beforehand that the ceiling in many rooms fell with a crash, covering with their ruins poles and swedes. But the Mazovians advanced like a conflagration. They penetrated every place, overturning with their long knives, cutting and thrusting. No man of the Swedes asked for quarter, but neither was it given. In some corridors and passages, the piles of bodies so blocked the way that the Swedes made barricades of them. The Poles pulled them out by the feet, by the hair, and hurled them through the windows. Blood flowed in streams through the passages. Groups of Swedes defended themselves yet here and there, and repelled with weakening hands the furious blows of the stormers. Blood had covered their faces, darkness was covering their eyes, more than one sank on his knees and still fought. Pressed on every side, suffocated by the throng of opponents, the Scandinavians died in silence, in accord with their fame as beseemed warriors. The statues of divinities and ancient heroes, bespattered with blood, looked with lifeless eyes on that death. Roch Kowalski raged specially in the upper stories, but Zagwaba rushed with his men to the terraces, and when he had cut to pieces the infantry defending themselves there, he hurried from the terraces to those wonderful gardens which were famed throughout Europe. The trees were already cut down, the rare plants destroyed by Polish balls, the fountains broken, the earth ploughed up by bombshells. In a word, everywhere a desert and destruction though the Swedes had not raised their robber hands against this place, out of regard for the person of Radzeyowski. A savage struggle set in there too, but it lasted only a short time, for the Swedes gave but feeble resistance, and were cut to pieces under the personal command of Zagwaba. The soldiers dispersed now through the garden, and the whole palace was plundered. Zagwaba betook himself to a corner of the garden, to a place where the walls formed a strong angle, and where the sun did not come, for the knight wished to rest somewhat, and he rubbed the sweat from his heated forehead. All at once he espied some strange monsters looking at him with hostility through an iron grating. The cage was fixed in a corner of the wall, so that balls falling from the outside could not reach it. The door of the cage was wide open, but those meagre and ugly creatures did not think of taking advantage of this. Evidently terrified by the uproar, the whistling of bullets, and the fierce slaughter at which they had looked a moment before, they crowded into a corner of the cage, and hidden in the straw gave note of their terror only by muttering. Are those monkeys or devils? said Zagwaba to himself. Suddenly anger seized him, Courage swelled in his breast, 
and raising his sabre, he fell upon the cage. A terrible panic was the answer to the first blow of his sabre. The monkeys, which the Swedish soldiers had treated kindly and fed from their own slender rations, fell into such a fright that madness simply seized them, and since Zagoba stopped their exit, they began to rush through the cage with unnatural springs, hanging to the sides, to the top, screaming and biting. At last, one in frenzy sprang on Zagwaba's shoulder, and seizing him by the head, fastened to it with all his power. Another hung to his right shoulder, a third caught him in front by the neck, the fourth hung to his long split sleeves which were tied together behind, and Zagwaba, stifled, sweating, struggled in vain, in vain struck blindly toward the rear. Breath soon failed him, his eyes were standing out of his head, and he began to cry with despairing voice, Gracious gentlemen, save me! The cry brought a number of men who, unable to understand what was happening, rushed to his aid with blood-streaming sabres, but they halted at once in astonishment. They looked at one another, and, as if under the influence of some spell, they burst out in one great laugh. More soldiers ran up, a crowd was formed, but laughter was communicated to all as an epidemic. They staggered as if drunk, they held their sides, their faces, besmeared with the gore of men, were twisting spasmodically, and the more Zagwaba struggled, the more did they laugh. Now Rokhkovalsky ran down from an upper story, scattered the crowd, and freed his uncle from the simian embraces. You rascals, cried the panting Zagoba. I would you were slain. You were laughing to see a Catholic in oppression from these African monsters. I would you were slain. Were it not for me, you would be butting your heads to this moment against the gate, for you deserve nothing better. I wish you were dead, because you are not worth these monkeys. I wish you were dead yourself, king of the monkeys, cried the man standing nearest. Simiarum destructor, destroyer of monkeys, cried another. Victor, cried the third. What victor? He is victus, conquered. Here Rokhkovalsky came again to the aid of his uncle and struck the nearest man in the breast with his fist. The man dropped to the earth that instant with blood coming from his mouth. Others retreated before the anger of Kowalski. Some drew their sabres, but further disputes were interrupted by the uproar and shots coming from the Bernardine's church. Evidently, the storm continued there yet in full force, and judging from the feverish musketry fire, the Swedes were not thinking of surrender. With succour! To the church! To the church! cried Zagwaba. He sprang himself to the top of the palace. There, from the right wing, was to be seen the church, which seemed to be in flames. Crowds of stormers were circling around it convulsively, not being able to enter and perishing for nothing in a crossfire, for bullets were rained on them from the crack of gate as thickly as sand. Cannon to the windows, shouted Zagwaba. There were guns enough, large and small, in the Kazanovsky palace. Therefore, they were drawn to the windows. From fragments of costly furniture and pedestals of statues, platforms were constructed, and in the course of half an hour, a number of guns were looking, out through the empty openings of the windows toward the church. Roch, said Zagoba, with uncommon irritation, I must do something considerable, or my glory is lost through those monkeys. Would that the plague had stifled them. The whole army will ridicule me, and though there is no lack of words in my mouth, still I cannot meet the whole world. I must wipe away this confusion, or wide as this commonwealth is, they will herald me through it as king of the monkeys. Uncle must wipe away this confusion, repeated Roch with a thundering voice. And the first means will be that, as I have captured the Kazanovsky palace, for let anyone say that it was not I who did it. Let anyone say that it was not uncle who did it, repeated Roch. I will capture that church, so help me the Lord God, amen, concluded Zagwaba. Then he turned to his attendants who were there at the guns. 
Fire! Fear seized the Swedes, who were defending themselves with despair in the church, when the whole side wall began on a sudden to tremble. Bricks, rubbish, lime fell on those who were sitting in the windows, at the portholes, on the fragments of the inside cornices, at the pigeonholes, through which they were firing at the besiegers. A terrible dust rose in the house of God, and mixed with the smoke began to stifle the wearied men. One man could not see another in the darkness. Cries of, I am suffocating, I am suffocating, still increased the terror. The noise of balls falling through the windows, of leaden lattice falling to the floor, the heat, the exhalations from bodies, turned the retreat of God into a hell upon earth. The frightened soldiers stood aside from entrances, windows and portholes. The panic is changed into frenzy. Again, terrified voices call, I am suffocating, air, water. Hundreds of voices begin to roar, A white flag, a white flag. Erskine, who is commanding, seizes the flag with his own hand to display it outside. At that moment the entrance bursts, a line of stormers rush in like an avalanche of Satan's, and a slaughter follows. There is sudden silence in the church. There is heard only the beast-like panting of the strugglers, the bite of steel on bones, and on the stone floor groans, the patter of blood. And at times some voice in which there is nothing human cries, Quarter! Quarter! After an hour's fighting, the bell on the tower begins to thunder, and thunders, thunders, to the victory of the Mazovians, to the funeral of the Swedes. The Kazanovsky Palace, the Cloister, and the Bell Tower are captured. Piotr Opalinsky himself, the voivode of Podlaski, appeared in the blood-stained throng before the palace on his horse. Who came to our aid from the palace? cried he, wishing to outcry the sound and the roar of the men. He who captured the palace, said a powerful man, appearing before the voivoda. I. What is your name? Zagwoba. Vivat Zagwoba, bellowed thousands of throats. But the terrible Zagwoba pointed with his stained sabre toward the gate. We have not done enough yet. Turn the cannon toward the wall and against the gate. Advance! Follow me! The mad throng rush in the direction of the gate. Meanwhile, oh wonder, the fire of the Swedes, instead of increasing, is growing weak. At the same moment, some voice unexpected and piercing cries from the top of the bell tower, Charnetsky is in the city! I see our squadrons! The Swedish fire was weakening more and more. Halt! Halt! commanded the voivoda. But the throng did not hear him and rushed at random. That moment a white flag appeared on the Krakow gate. In truth, Charnetsky, having forced his way through Danzig House, rushed like a hurricane into the precincts of the fortress. When the Danilovich Palace was taken, and when a moment later the Lithuanian colours glittered on the walls near the Church of the Holy Ghost, Wittenberg saw that further resistance was vain. The Swedes might defend themselves yet in the lofty houses of old and new city, but the inhabitants had already taken arms, and the defence would end in a terrible slaughter of the Swedes without hope of victory. The trumpeters began then to sound on the walls and to wave white flags. Seeing this, the Polish commanders withheld the storm. General Lohenhaupt, attended by a number of colonels, went out through the gate of New City and rushed with all breath to the king. Jan Kazimir had the city in his hands now. But the kind king wished to stop the flow of Christian blood, therefore he settled on the conditions offered to Wittenberg at first. The city was to be surrendered with all the booty collected in it. 
each Swede was permitted to take with him only what he had brought from Sweden. The garrison, with all the generals and with arms in hand, were to march out of the city, taking their sick and wounded, and the Swedish ladies, of whom a number of tens were in Warsaw. To the Poles who were serving with the Swedes, amnesty was given, with the idea that surely none were serving of their own will. Bogusov Radzivil alone was accepted. To this, Wittenberg agreed the more readily, since the prince was at that moment with Douglas on the book. The conditions were signed at once. All the bells in the churches announced to the city and the world that the capital had passed again into the hands of its rightful monarch. An hour later, a multitude of the poorest people came out from behind the walls, seeking charity and bread in the Polish camp, for all in the city except the Swedes were in want of food. The king commanded to give what was possible, and went himself to look at the departure of the Swedish garrison. He was surrounded by church and lay dignitaries, by a suite so splendid that it dazzled the people. Nearly all the troops, that is, the troops of the kingdom under the Hetmans, Charnetsky's division, the Lithuanians under Sapieha, and an immense crowd of general militia, together with the camp's servants, assembled around his majesty. For all were curious to see those Swedes with whom a few hours before they had fought so terribly and bloodily. Polish commissioners were posted at all the gates from the moment of signing the conditions. These commissioners were entrusted with the duty of seeing that the Swedes bore off no booty. A special commission was occupied with receiving the booty in the city itself. In the van came the cavalry, which was not numerous, especially since Boguswav's men were excluded from the right of departure. Next came the field artillery with light guns. The heavy pieces were given to the Poles. The men marched at the sides of the guns with lighted matches. Before them waved their unfurled flags, which, as a mark of honour, were lowered before the Polish king, recently a wanderer. The artillerists marched proudly, looking straight into the eyes of the Polish knights, as if they wished to say, we shall meet again. And the Poles wondered at their haughty bearing and courage unbent by misfortune. Then appeared the wagons with officers and wounded. In the first one lay Benedict Oxenstiern, the Chancellor, before whom Jan Kazimir had commanded the infantry to present arms, wishing to show that he knew how to respect virtue even in an enemy. Then, to the sound of drums and with waving flags, marched the quadrangle of unrivalled Swedish infantry, resembling, according to the expression of Subagazi, moving castles. After them advanced a brilliant party of cavalry, armoured from foot to head, and with a blue banner on which a golden lion was embroidered. These surrounded the chief of staff. At sight of them, a murmur passed through the crowd. Wittenberg is coming. Wittenberg is coming. In fact, the field marshal himself was approaching, and with him, the younger Wrangel, Horn, Erskine, Lohenhaupt, Forgel. The eyes of the Polish knights were turned with eagerness toward them, and especially toward the face of Wittenberg. But his face did not indicate such a terrible warrior as he was in reality. It was an aged face, pale, emaciated by disease. He had sharp features, and above his mouth a thin, small moustache turned up at the ends. The pressed lips and long, pointed nose gave him the appearance of an old and grasping miser. Dressed in black velvet and with a black hat on his head, he looked more like a learned astrologer or a physician, and only the gold chain on his neck, the diamond star on his breast, and a field marshal's baton in his hand showed his high office of leader. Advancing, he cast his eyes unquietly on the king, 
on the king's staff, on the squadron standing in rank, then his eyes took in the immense throngs of the general militia, and an ironical smile came out on his pale lips. But in those throngs a murmur was rising ever greater, and the word Wittenberg, Wittenberg, was in every mouth. After a while the murmur changed into deep grumbling, but threatening, like the grumbling of the sea before a storm. From instant to instant it was silent, and then, far away in the distance, in the last ranks, was heard some voice in peroration. This voice was answered by others, greater numbers answered them, they were heard ever louder and spread more widely, like ominous echoes. You would swear that a storm was coming from a distance, and that it would burst with all power. The officers were anxious and began to look at the king with disquiet. What is that? What does that mean? asked Jan Kazimir. Then the grumbling passed into a roar as terrible as if thunders had begun to wrestle with one another in the sky. The immense throng of general militia moved violently, precisely like standing grain when a hurricane is sweeping around it with giant wing. All at once, some tens of thousands of sabres were glittering in the sun. What is that? What does that mean? asked the king repeatedly. No one could answer him. Then Vovodyovsky, standing near Sapieha, exclaimed, That is Pan Zagwoba. Vovodyovsky had guessed aright. The moment the conditions of surrender were published and had come to the ears of Zagwoba, the old noble fell into such a terrible rage that speech was taken from him for a while. When he came to himself, his first act was to spring among the ranks of the general militia and fire up the minds of the nobles. They heard him willingly, for it seemed to all that for so much bravery, for such toil, for so much bloodshed under the walls of Warsaw, they ought to have a better vengeance against the enemy. Therefore great circles of chaotic and stormy men surrounded Zagwoba, who threw live coals by the handful on the powder, and with his speech fanned into greater proportions the fire which all the more easily seized their heads, that they were already smoking from the usual libations consequent on victory. Gracious gentlemen, said he, behold these old hands have toiled fifty years for the country. Fifty years have they been shedding the blood of the enemy at every wall of the commonwealth, and today I have witnesses. They captured the Kazanovsky Palace and the Bernardines Church. And when, gracious gentlemen, did the Swedes lose heart? When did they agree to capitulate? It was when we turned our guns from the Bernardines to the old city. We have not spared our blood, brothers. It has been shed bountifully, and no one has been spared but the enemy. But we, brothers, have left our lands without masters, our servants without lords, our wives without husbands, our children without fathers. Oh, my dear children, what is happening to you now? And we have come here with our naked breasts against cannon. And what is our reward for so doing? This is it. Wittenberg goes forth free, and besides, they give him honour for the road. The executioner of our country departs, the blasphemer of religion departs, the raging enemy of the Most Holy Lady, the burner of our houses, the thief of our last bit of clothing, the murderer of our wives and children. Oh, my children, where are you now? The disgracer of the clergy and virgins consecrated to God. Woe to thee, country! Shame to you, nobles! A new agony is awaiting you. O oh, our holy faith! Woe to you, suffering churches! Weeping to thee and complaint, O Chensterhover! For Wittenberg is departing in freedom, and will return soon to press out tears and blood, to finish killing those whom he has not yet killed, to burn that which he has not yet burned, to put shame on that which he has not yet put to shame. Weep, O Poland and Lithuania, weep, ranks of people as I weep, an old soldier who, descending to the grave, must look on your agony. 
Woe to thee, Ilion, the city of aged Priam! Woe, woe, woe! So spoke Zagwaba, and thousands listened to him, and wrath raised the hair on the heads of the nobles. But he moved on farther. Again he complained, tore his clothing, and laid bare his breast. He entered also into the army, which gave a willing ear to his complaints, for in truth there was a terrible animosity in all hearts against Wittenberg. The tumult would have burst out at once, but Zagwaba himself restrained it, lest, if it burst too early, Wittenberg might save himself somehow. But if it broke out when he was leaving the city, and would show himself to the general militia, they would bear him apart on their sabres before any one could see what was done. And his reckoning was justified. At sight of the tyrant, frenzy seized the brains of the chaotic and half-drunken nobles, and a terrible storm burst forth in the twinkle of an eye. Forty thousand sabres were flashing in the sun. Forty thousand throats began to bellow. Death to Wittenberg! Give him here! Make mincemeat of him! Make mincemeat of him! To the throngs of nobles were joined throngs more chaotic still, and made brutal by the recent shedding of blood, the camp servants. Even the more disciplined regular squadrons began to murmur fiercely against the oppressor, and the storm began to fly with rage against the Swedish staff. At the first moment, all lost their heads, though all understood what the matter was. What is to be done? cried voices near the king. O oh, merciful Jesus! Rescue! Defend! It is a shame not to observe the conditions. Enraged crowds rush in among the squadrons, press upon them. The squadrons are confused, cannot keep their places. Around them are sabres, sabres, and sabres. Under the sabres are inflamed faces, threatening eyes, howling mouths, uproar, noise, wild cries grow with amazing rapidity. In front are rushing camp servants, camp followers, and every kind of army rabble, more like beasts or devils than men. Wittenberg understood what was happening. His face grew pale as a sheet. Sweat, abundant and cold, covered his forehead in a moment, and, oh wonder, that field marshal who hitherto was ready to threaten the whole world, that conqueror of so many armies, that captor of so many cities, that old soldier was then so terribly frightened at the howling mass that presence of mind left him utterly. He trembled in his whole body, he dropped his hands and groaned, spittle began to flow from his mouth to the golden chain, and the field marshal's baton dropped from his hand. Meanwhile, the terrible throng was coming nearer and nearer. Ghastly forms were surrounding already the hapless generals. A moment more, they would bear them apart on sabres, so that not a fragment of them would remain. Other Swedish generals drew their sabres, wishing to die weapon in hand, as beseemed knights. But the aged oppressor grew weak altogether, and half closed his eyes. At this moment, Vorodyovsky, with his men, sprang to the rescue of the staff. Going wedge form on a gallop, he split the mob as a ship moving with all sails bears apart the towering waves of the sea. The cry of the trampled rabble was mingled with the shouts of the louder squadron, but the horsemen reached the staff first, and surrounded it in the twinkle of an eye with a wall of horses, a wall of their own breasts and sabres. To the king, cried the little knight. They moved on. The throng surrounded them from every side, ran along the flanks and the rear, brandished sabres and clubs, howled more and more terribly. But the louder men pushed forward, thrusting out their sabres from moment to moment at the sides, as a strong stag thrusts with his antlers when surrounded by wolves. Then Wojniewowicz sprang to the aid of Wolejowski. After him, Wilczkowski with a regiment of the king, then Prince Powobinski, and all together, defending themselves unceasingly, 
conducted the staff to the presence of Jan Kazimir. The tumult increased instead of diminishing. It seemed after a time that the excited rabble would try to seize the Swedish generals without regard to the king. Wittenberg recovered, but fear did not leave him in the least. He sprang from his horse then, and as a hare pressed by dogs or wolves takes refuge under a wagon in motion, so did he, in spite of his gout, throw himself at the feet of Jan Kazimir. Then he dropped on his knees, and seizing the king's stirrup, began to cry, Save me, gracious lord, save me! I have your royal word, the agreement is signed. Save me, save me! Have mercy on us, do not let them murder me! The king, at sight of such abasement and such shame, turned away his eyes with aversion and said, Field Marshal, pray be calm. But he had a troubled face himself, for he knew not what to do. Around them were gathering crowds ever greater, and approaching with more persistence. It is true that the squadron stood as if for battle, and Zamoyski's infantry had formed a terrible quadrangle round about, but what was to be the end of it all? The king looked at Charnetsky, but Charnetsky only twisted his beard with rage. His soul was storming with such anger against the disobedience of the general militia. Then the chancellor, Korachinsky, said, Gracious Lord, we must keep the agreement. We must, replied the king. Wittenberg, who was looking carefully into their eyes, breathed more freely. Gracious Lord, said he, I believe in your words as in God. To which Pototsky, the old hetman of the kingdom, cried, And why have you broken so many oaths, so many agreements, so many terms of surrender? With what any man wars, from that will he perish. Why did you seize, in spite of the terms of capitulation, the king's regiment commanded by Wolf? Miller did that, not I, answered Wittenberg. The hetman looked at him with disdain, then turned to the king. Gracious Lord, I do not say this to incite your royal grace to break agreements also, for let perfidy be on their side alone. What is to be done? asked the king. If we send them to Prussia, fifty thousand nobles will follow and cut them to pieces before they reach Pultusk, unless we give them the whole regular army as a guard, and we cannot do that. Hear, your royal grace, how the militia are howling. In truth, there is a well-founded animosity against Wittenberg. It is needful first to safeguard his person, and then to send all away when the fire has cooled down. There is no other way, said Korachinsky. But where are they to be kept? We cannot keep them here, for here, devil take it, civil war would break out, said the voivode of Rus. Now Sobiepan Zamoyski appeared, and, pouting his lips greatly, said with his customary spirit, Well, gracious lord, give them to me at Zamosht. Let them sit there till calm comes. I will defend Wittenberg there from the nobles. Let them try to get him from me. But on the road will your worthiness defend the field marshal? asked the chancellor. I can depend on my servants yet. Or have I not infantry and cannon? Let any one take him from Zamoyski. We shall see. Here he put his hands on his hips, struck his thighs, and bent from one side of the saddle to the other. There is no other way, said the Chancellor. I see no other, added Lance Koronsky. Then take them, said the King to Zamoyski. But Wittenberg, seeing that his life was threatened no longer, considered it proper to protest. We did not expect this, said he. Well, we do not detain you. The road is open, said Pototsky, pointing to the distance with his hand. Wittenberg was silent. Meanwhile, the Chancellor sent a number of officers to declare to the nobles that Wittenberg would not depart in freedom, but would be sent to Zamosht. The tumult, it is true, was not allayed at once. Still, the news had a soothing effect. Before night fell, attention was turned in another direction. 
the troops began to enter the city, and the sight of the recovered capital filled all minds with the delight of triumph. The king rejoiced. Still, the thought that he was unable to observe the conditions of the agreement troubled him not a little, as well as the endless disobedience of the general militia. Charnyetsky was chewing his anger. With such troops one can never be sure of tomorrow, said he to the king. Sometimes they fight badly, sometimes heroically, all from impulse, and at any outbreak rebellion is ready. God grant them not to disperse, said the king, for they are needed yet, and they think that they have finished everything. The man who caused that outbreak should be torn asunder with horses without regard to the services which he has rendered, continued Charnyetsky. The strictest orders were given to search for Zagwoba, for it was a secret to no man that he had raised the storm. But Zagwoba had, as it were, dropped into water. They searched for him in the tents, in the tabor, even among the Tartars, all in vain. Tizenhaus even said that the king, always kind and gracious, wished from his whole soul that they might not find him, and even undertook a nine days devotion to that effect. But a week later, after some dinner, when the heart of the monarch was big with joy, the following words were heard from the mouth of Jan Kazimir. Announce that Pan Zagwoba is not to hide himself longer, for we are longing for his jests. When Charnyetsky was horrified at this, the king said, Whoso in this commonwealth should have justice without mercy in his heart would be forced to carry an axe in his bosom and not a heart. Faults come easier here than anywhere, but in no land does repentance follow so quickly. Saying this, the king had Babinich more in mind than Zagwoba, and he was thinking of Babinich because the young man had bowed down to the king's feet the day before with a petition that he would not hinder him from going to Lithuania. He said that he wished to freshen the war there and attack the Swedes as he had once attacked Hovansky. And as the king intended to send there a soldier experienced in partisan warfare, he permitted Babinich to go gave him the means, blessed him, and whispered some wish in his ear, after which the young knight fell his whole length at his feet. Then, without loitering, Kmichits moved briskly toward the east. Subagazi, captured by a considerable present, permitted him to take 500 fresh Dobruja Tartars. 1,500 other good men marched with him a force with which it was possible to begin something. And the young man's head was fired with the desire for battle and warlike achievements. The hope of glory smiled on him. He heard already how all Lithuania was repeating his name with pride and wonder. He heard especially how one beloved mouth repeated it, and his soul gave him wings. And there was another reason why he rode forward so briskly. Wherever he appeared, he was the first to announce the glad tidings. The Swede is defeated and Warsaw is taken. Wherever his horse's hoofs sounded, the whole neighbourhood rang with these words. The people along the roads greeted him with weeping. They rang bells in the church towers and sang Te Deum Laudamus. When he rode through the forest, the dark pines, when through the fields, the golden grain, rocked by the wind, seemed to repeat and sound joyously. The Swede is defeated. Warsaw is taken. Warsaw is taken. End of chapter 40. Recording by David Granville Young. Chapter 41 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume 2 by Henrik Sienkiewicz. Translated by Jeremiah Kurtan, 1835 to 1906. Chapter 41. 
Though Ketling was near the person of Prince Boguslav, he did not know all, and could not tell of all that was done in Taurogi, for he was blinded himself by love for Panana Bilevich. Boguslav had also another confidant, Pan Sakovich, the starosta of Oshmiana, and he alone knew how deeply the prince was involved by love for his charming captive, and what means he was using to gain her heart and her person. That love was merely a fierce desire, for Boguslav's heart was not capable of other feelings. But the desire was so violent that that experienced cavalier lost his head, and often in the evening, when alone with the starosta, he seized his own hair and cried, I am burning, Sakovich, I am burning. Sakovich found means at once. Whoso wishes to take honey must drug the bees, said he, and has your physician few of such intoxicating herbs? Give him the word today, and tomorrow the affair will be over. But the prince did not like such a method, and that for various reasons. First, on a time, old Heraclius Bilevich, the grandfather of Elenka, appeared to him in a dream, and standing at his pillow, looked with threatening eyes till the first crowing of the cocks. Boguslav remembered the dream, for that night, without fear, was superstitious. Dreaded charms, dream warnings, and supernatural apparitions so much that a shiver passed through him at thought of the terror and the shape in which that phantom might come a second time should he follow Sakovich's counsel. The starosta of Oshmiana himself, who did not believe greatly in God, but who, like the prince, dreaded dreams and enchantments, staggered somewhat in giving advice. The second reason of Boguslav's delay was that the Valachian woman was living with her stepdaughter in Taurogi. They called Princess Rajivil, the wife of Janusz, the Valachian woman. That lady, coming from a country in which her sex have rather free manners, was not, in truth, over stern. Nay, maybe she understood too well the amusements of courtiers and ladies-in-waiting. Still, she could not endure that at her side a man, the coming husband of her stepdaughter, should do a deed calling to heaven for vengeance. But even later, when through the persuasions of Sakovich and with the consent of the Prince Voyevoda of Vilno, the Valachian woman went with Janusz's daughter to Kurland, Boguslav did not dare to do the deed. He feared the terrible outcry which would rise throughout all Lithuania. The Bileviches were wealthy people. They would not fail to crush him with a prosecution. The law punished such deeds with loss of property, honour and life. The Rajivils, it is true, were powerful and might trample on law. But when victory in war was inclining to the side of Jan Kazimir, the young prince might fall into serious difficulties in which he would lack power, friends and henchmen and just then it was hard to foresee how the war would end. Forces were coming every day to Jan Kazimir, the power of Karl Gustav was decreasing absolutely by the loss of men and the exhaustion of money. Prince Boguslav, an impulsive but calculating man, reckoned with the position. His desires tormented him with fire, his reason advised restraint, superstitious fear bridled the outbursts of his blood. At the same time, disease fell upon him. Great and urgent questions rose, involving frequently the fate of the whole war, and all these causes rent the soul of the prince till he was mortally wearied. Still, it is unknown how the struggle might have ended, had it not been for Boguslav's self-love. He was a man of immense self-esteem, he counted himself an unequalled statesman, a great leader, a great knight, and an invincible captor of the hearts of women. Was he to use force or intoxicating drugs? He who carried around with him a bound casket filled with love letters from various foreign ladies of celebrity? Were his wealth, his titles, his power almost royal, his great name, his beauty and courtliness not equal to the conquest of one timid noble woman? Besides, 
How much greater the triumph, how much greater the delight, when the resistance of the maiden drops, when she herself willingly, and with a heart beating like that of a seized bird, with burning face and eyes veiled with mist, falls into those arms which are stretched toward her. A quiver passed through Boguslav at thought of that moment, and he desired it as greatly as he did Olenka herself. He hoped always that that moment would come. He writhed, he was impatient, he deceived himself. At one time it seemed to him nearer, at another farther, and then he cried that he was burning, but he did not cease to work. To begin with, he surrounded the maiden with minute care, so that she must be thankful to him and think that he is kind. For he understood that the feeling of gratitude and friendship is that mild and warm flame, which only needs to be fanned and it will turn into a great fire. Their frequent intercourse was to bring this about the more surely. Hence, Boguslav showed no insistence, not wishing to chill confidence or frighten it away. At the same time, every look, every touch of the hand, every word was calculated. Nothing passed in vain. Everything was the drop wearing the stone. All that he did for Olenka might be interpreted as the hospitality of a host, that innocent, friendly attraction which one person feels for another. But still it was done to create love. The boundary was purposely blurred and indefinite, so that to pass it would become easy in time, and thus the maiden might the more lightly wander into those labyrinths where each form might mean something or nothing. That play did not agree, it is true, with the native impulsiveness of Boguslav. Still, he restrained himself, for he judged that that alone would lead to the object, and at the same time, he found in it such satisfaction as the spider finds when weaving his web, the traitorous bird catcher when spreading his net, or the hunter tracking patiently and with endurance the wild beast. His own penetration, subtlety, and quickness, developed by life at the French court, amused the prince. He entertained Palina Alexandra as if she were a sovereign princess, but in such a way that again it was not easy for her to divine whether this was done exclusively for her, or whether it flowed from his innate and acquired politeness toward the fair sex in general. It is true that he made her the chief person in all the entertainments, plays, cavalcades, and hunting expeditions, but this came somewhat from the nature of things. After the departure of Janusz's princess to Kurland, she was really first among the ladies at Taurogi. A multitude of noble ladies from all Zhmuzh had taken refuge in Taurogi, as in a place lying near the boundary, so as to be protected by the Swedes under the guardianship of the prince. But they recognized Panina Bilevich as first among all, since she was the daughter of the most noted family. And while the whole commonwealth was swimming in blood, there was no end to entertainments. You would have said that the king's court, with all the courtiers and ladies, had gone to the country for leisure and entertainment. Boguslav ruled as an absolute monarch in Taurogi and in all adjoining electoral Prussia, in which he was frequently a guest. Therefore, everything was at his orders. Towns furnished money and troops on his notes. The Prussian nobles came gladly, in carriages and on horseback, to his feasts, hunts, and tournaments. Boguslav even renewed, in honour of his lady, the conflicts of knights within barriers, which were already in disuse. On a certain occasion he took active part in them, dressed in silver armour and girded with a silver sash which Panina Bilevich had to bind on him, he hurled from their horses four of the first knights of Prussia, Ketling V and Sakovich VI, though the last had such gigantic strength that he stopped carriages in their course by seizing a hind wheel. And what enthusiasm rose in the crowd of spectators when afterward the silver-clad knight kneeling before his lady, 
took from her hand the crown of victory. Shouts rang like the thunder of cannon, handkerchiefs were waving, flags were lowered, but he raised his visor and looked into her blushing face with his beautiful eyes, pressing at the same time her hand to his lips. Another time, when in the enclosure, a raging bear was fighting with dogs and had torn them all one after another, the prince, dressed only in light Spanish costume, sprang in with his spear and pierced not only the savage beast, but also a soldier who, seeing the moment of danger, had sprung to his aid. Panana Alexandra, the granddaughter of an old soldier, reared in traditions of blood, war and reverence for knightly superiority, could not restrain at sight of these deeds her wonder and even homage, for she had been taught from childhood to esteem bravery as almost the highest quality of man. Meanwhile, the prince gave daily proofs of daring almost beyond human, and always in honour of her. The assembled guests, in their praises and enthusiasm for the prince, which were so great that even a deity might be satisfied with them, were forced involuntarily to connect in their conversations the name of Panana Bilevich with the name of Boguslav. He was silent, but with his eyes he told her what he did not dare to utter with his lips. The spell surrounded her perfectly. Everything was so combined as to bring them together, to connect them, and at the same time to separate them from the throng of other people. It was difficult for any one to mention him without mentioning her. Into the thoughts of Alenka herself, Boguslav was thrust with an irresistible force. Every moment of the day was so arranged as to lend power to the spell. In the evening, after amusements, the chambers were lighted by many coloured lamps casting mysterious rays, as if from the land of splendid dreams transferred to reality. Intoxicating eastern odours filled the air. The low sounds of invisible harps, lutes and other instruments fondled the hearing. And in the midst of these odours, lights, sounds, he moved in the glory of universal homage, like an enchanted king's son in a myth-tale, beautiful, knightly, sun-bright from jewels, and as deeply in love as a shepherd. What maiden could resist these spells? What virtue would not grow faint amid such allurements? But to avoid the prince there was no possibility for one living with him under the same roof, and enjoying his hospitality, which, though given perforce, was still dispensed with sincerity and in real lordly fashion. Besides, Olenka had gone without unwillingness to Taurogi, for she wished to be far from hideous Kiedani, as she preferred to Janusz, an open traitor, the knightly Boguslav, who feigned love for the deserted king and the country. Hence, in the beginning of her visit at Taurogi, she was full of friendly feeling for the young prince, and seeing soon how far he was striving for her friendship, she used her influence more than once to do good to people. During the third month of her stay, a certain artillery officer, a friend of Ketling, was condemned by the prince to be shot. Panana Bilevich, hearing of this from the young Scot, interceded for him. A divinity may command, not implore, said Boguslav to her, and tearing the sentence of death, he threw it at her feet. Ordain, command, I will burn Taurogi if at that price I can call forth on your face even a smile. I ask no other reward save this, that you be joyous and forget that which once pained you. She could not be joyous, having pain in her heart, pity and an unutterable contempt for the man whom she had loved with first love and who at that time was in her eyes a worse criminal than a parricide. That Kmichitz, promising to sell the king for gold as Judas sold Christ, became fouler and more repulsive in her eyes, till in the course of time he was turned into a human monster, a grief and reproach to her. She could not forgive herself for having loved him, and at the same time she could not forget him while she hated. 
In view of these feelings, it was indeed difficult for her even to feign gladness. But still she had to be thankful to the priest even for this, that he would not put his hand to Kmichitz's crime and for all that he had done for her. It was a wonder to her that the prince, such a knight and so full of noble feeling, did not hasten to the rescue of the country, since he had not consented to the intrigues of Janusz. But she judged that such a statesman knew what he was doing, and was forced by a policy which she, with her simple maiden's mind, could not sound. Boguslav told her also, explaining his frequent journeys to Prussian Tilsa, which was nearby, that his strength was failing him from overwork, that he was conducting negotiations between Jan Kazimir, Karl Gustav and the Elector, and that he hoped to bring the country out of difficulty. Not for rewards, not for offices do I do this, said he to her. I will sacrifice my cousin Janusz, who was to me a father, for I know not whether I shall be able to implore his life for him from the animosity of Queen Ludwika, but I will do what my conscience and love for the dear mother, my country, demands. When he spoke thus, with sadness on his delicate face, with eyes turned to the ceiling, he seemed to her as lofty as those heroes of antiquity of which Heraclius Bilevich had told her, and of whom he himself had read in Cornelius Nepos. And the heart swelled within her with admiration and homage. By degrees it went so far that when thoughts of the hated Andrei Kmichitz had tortured her too much, she thought of Boguslav to cure and strengthen herself. Kmichitz became for her a terrible and gloomy darkness. Boguslav, light in which every troubled soul would gladly bathe itself. The sword-bearer and Panana Kulvietz, whom they had brought also from Vodokti, pushed Olenka still more along that incline by singing hymns of praise from morning till night in honour of Boguslav. The sword-bearer and the aunt wearied the prince, it is true, so that he had been thinking how to get rid of them politely. But he won them to himself, especially the sword-bearer, who, though at first displeased and even enraged, still could not fight against the friendship and favours of Boguslav. If Boguslav had been merely a noble of noted stock, but not Rajivil, nor a prince, not a magnate invested with almost the majesty of a monarch. Perhaps Panana Bilevich might have loved him for life and death, in spite of the will of the old colonel, which left her a choice only between the cloister and Kmichitz. But she was a stern lady for her own self, and a very just soul. Therefore she did not even admit to her head a dream of anything save gratitude and admiration so far as the prince was concerned. Her family was not so great that she could become the wife of Rajivil, and was too great for her to become his mistress. She looked on him, therefore, as she would on the king, were she at the king's court. In vain did Boguslav endeavour to give her other thoughts. In vain did he, forgetting himself in love, partly from calculation, partly from enthusiasm, repeat what he had said the first evening in Kiedani, that the Rajivils had married ordinary noble women more than once. These thoughts did not cling to her, as water does not cling to the breast of a swan, and she remained as she had been, thankful, friendly, homage-giving, seeking consolation in the thought of a hero, but undisturbed in heart. He could not catch her through her feelings, though often it seemed to him that he was near his object. But he saw himself with shame and internal anger that he was not so daring with her as he had been with the first ladies in Paris, Brussels and Amsterdam. Perhaps this was because he was really in love, and perhaps because in that lady, in her face, in her dark brows and stern eyes, there was that which enforced respect. Kmichitz was the one and only man who in his time did not submit to that influence and paid no regard, prepared boldly to kiss those proud eyes and stern lips. 
but Kmichitz was her betrothed. All other cavaliers, beginning with Pan Vodiovsky and ending with the very vulgar Prussian nobles in Taurogi and the prince himself, were less confident with her than with other ladies in the same condition. Impulsiveness carried away the prince, but when, once in a carriage, he pressed against her feet, whispering at the same time, Fear not. She answered that she did fear to regret the confidence reposed in him. Boguslav was confused and returned to his former method of conquering her heart by degrees. But his patience was becoming exhausted. Gradually he began to forget the terrible dream. He began to think more frequently of what Sakovich had counselled and that the Bileviches would all perish in the war. His desires tormented him more powerfully when a certain event changed completely the course of affairs in Taurogi. One day, news came like a thunderbolt that Tikotsin was taken by Pan Sapeha and that Prince Janusz had lost his life in the ruins of the castle. Everything began to seethe in Taurogi. Boguslav himself sprang up and went off that same day to Königsberg, where he was to see the ministers of the King of Sweden and the Elector. His stay there exceeded his original plan. Meanwhile, bodies of Prussian and even of Swedish troops were assembling at Taurogi. Men began to speak of an expedition against Sapieha. The naked truth was coming to the surface more and more clearly, that Boguslav was a partisan of the Swedes as well as his cousin Janusz. It happened that at the same time the sword-bearer of Rosseni received news of the burning of his native Bilevice by the troops of Lohenhaupt, who, after defeating the insurgents in Zhmuj at Shavli, ravaged the whole country with fire and sword. The old noble sprang up and set out, wishing to see the damage with his own eyes, and Prince Boguslav did not detain him, but sent him off willingly, adding at parting, Now you will understand why I brought you to Taurogi, for, speaking plainly, you owe your life to me. Olyenka remained alone with Panina Kulvietz. They shut themselves up in their own chambers at once, and received no one but a few women. When these women brought tidings that the prince was preparing an expedition against the Poles, Olenka would not believe them at first, but wishing to be certain, she gave orders to summon Ketling, for she knew that from her the young Scot would hide nothing. He appeared before her at once, happy that he was called, that for a time he could speak with her who had taken possession of his soul. Cavalier, said Panana Bilevich, so many reports are circulating about Chaurogi that we are wandering as in a forest. Some say that the Prince Voyevoda died a natural death, others that he was born apart on sabres. What was the cause of his death? Ketling hesitated for a while. It was evident that he was struggling with innate indecision. At last he blushed greatly and said, You are the cause of the fall and the death of Prince Janusz. I? asked Panana Bilevich with amazement. You, for our prince chose to remain in Taurogi rather than go to relieve his cousin. He forgot everything near you, my lady. Now she blushed in her turn like a purple rose, and a moment of silence followed. The Scot stood, hat in hand, with downcast eyes, his head bent in a posture full of homage and respect. At last he raised his head, shook his bright curls, and said, My lady, if these words have offended you, let me kneel down and beg forgiveness. Do not, said she quickly, seeing that the young knight was bending his knees already. I know that what you have said was said with a clean heart, for I have long noticed that you wish me well. The officer raised his blue eyes, and putting his hand on his heart with a voice as low as the whisper of a breeze, 
and as sad as a sigh replied, Oh, my lady, my lady. At this moment he was frightened lest he had said too much, and again he bent his head toward his bosom and took the posture of a courtier who is listening to the commands of a queen. I am here among strangers without a guardian, said Olenka, and though I shall be able to watch over myself alone, and God will preserve me from harm, still I need the aid of men also. Do you wish to be my brother? Do you wish to warn me in need, so that I may know what to do and avoid every snare? As she said this, she extended her hand, but he kneeled in spite of her prohibition and kissed the tips of her fingers. Tell me, said she, what is happening around me? The prince loves you, said Ketling. Have you not seen that? She covered her face with her hands. I saw and I did not see. At times it seemed to me that he was only very kind. Kind, repeated Ketling, like an echo. But when it came into my head that I, unfortunate woman, might rouse in him unhappy wishes, I quieted myself with this, that no danger threatened me from him. I was thankful to him for what he had done, though God sees that I did not look for new kindnesses, since I feared those he had already shown me. Ketling breathed more freely. May I speak boldly? asked he. Speak. The prince has only two confidants, Pan Sarkovich and Patterson, but Patterson is very friendly to me, for we come from the same country, and he carried me in his arms. What I know, I know from him. The prince loves you. Desires are burning in him as pitch in a pine torch. All things done here, all these feasts, hunts, tournaments, through which, thanks to the princess hand, blood is flowing from my mouth yet, were arranged for you. The prince loves you, my lady, to distraction, but with an impure fire, for he wishes to disgrace, not to marry you. For though he could not find a worthier, even if he were king of the whole world, not merely a prince, still he thinks of another. The princess, Janusz's daughter, and her fortune are predestined to him. I learned this from Patterson, and the great God, whose gospel I take here to witness, knows that I speak the pure truth. Do not believe the prince, do not trust his kindness, do not feel safe in his moderation. Watch, guard yourself, for they are plotting treason against you here at every step. The breath is stopping in my breast from what Patterson has told me. There is not a criminal in the world equal to Sakovich. I cannot speak of him, I cannot. Were it not for the oath which I have taken to guard the prince, this hand and this sword would free you from continual danger. But I would slay Sakovich first. This is true. Him first before all men, even before those who in my own country shed my father's blood took my fortune, made me a wanderer and a hireling. Here, Ketling trembled from emotion. For a while, he merely pressed the hilt of his sword with his hand, not being able to utter a word. Then he recovered, and in one breath told what methods Sakovich had suggested to the prince. Panana Alexandra, to his great surprise, bore herself calmly enough while looking at the threatening precipice before her. Only her face grew pale and became still more serious. Unbending resolution was reflected in her stern look. I shall be able to save myself, said she, so help me God and the Holy Cross. The prince has not consented hitherto to follow Sarkovich's counsel, added Ketling, but when he sees that the road he has chosen leads to nothing, and he began to tell the reasons which restrained Boguslav, the lady listened with frowning brow, but not with superfluous attention, for she had already begun to ponder on means to wrest herself free of this terrible guardianship. But there was not a place in the whole country unsprinkled with blood, 
and plans of flight did not seem to her clear. Hence she preferred not to speak of them. Cavalier, said she at last, answer me one question. Is Prince Boguslav on the side of the King of Sweden or the King of Poland? It is a secret to none of us, answered the young officer, that the prince wishes the division of this commonwealth so as to make of Lithuania an independent principality for himself. Here Ketling was silent, and you would have thought that his mind was following involuntarily the thoughts of Olenka, for after a while he added, The elector and the Swedes are at the service of the prince, and since they will occupy the commonwealth, there is no place in which to hide from him. Olenka made no answer. The young man waited a while longer to learn if she would ask him other questions. But when she was silent, occupied with her own thoughts, he felt that it was not proper for him to interrupt her. Therefore, he bent double in a parting bow, sweeping the floor with the feathers in his cap. I thank you, cavalier, said Olenka, extending her hand to him. The officer, without turning, withdrew toward the door. All at once there appeared on her face a slight flush. She hesitated a moment and then said, One word, cavalier. Every word is for me a favour. Did you know Pan Andrei Kmichits? I made his acquaintance, my lady, in Kedane. I saw him the last time in Pilvishki, when we were marching hither from Potlashie. Is what the prince says true, that Pan Kmichits offered to do violence to the person of the King of Poland? I know not, my lady. It is known to me that they took counsel together in Pilvishki. Then the prince went with Pan Kmichits to the forest, and it was so long before he returned that Patterson was alarmed and sent troops to meet him. I led those troops. We met the prince. I saw that he was greatly changed as if strong emotion had passed through his soul. He was talking to himself, which never happens to him. I heard how he said, The devil would have undertaken that. I know nothing more. But later, when the prince mentioned what Kmichits offered, I thought, If this was it, it must be true. Panana Bilevich pressed her lips together. I thank you, said she and after a while she was alone. The thought of flight mastered her thoroughly. She determined at any price to tear herself from those infamous places and from the power of that treacherous prince. But where was she to find refuge? The villages and towns were in Swedish hands. The cloisters were ruined. The castles leveled with the earth. The whole country was swarming with soldiers and with worse than soldiers, with fugitives from the army, robbers, all kinds of ruffians. What fate could be waiting for a maiden cast as a prey to that storm? Who would go with her? Her aunt Kulvietz, her uncle, and a few of his servants. Whose power would protect her? Ketling would go, perhaps. Maybe a handful of faithful soldiers and friends might even be found who would accompany him. But as Ketling had fallen in love with her beyond question, then how was she to incur a debt of gratitude to him, which she would have to pay afterward with a great price? Finally, what right had she to choose the career of that young man, scarcely more than a youth, and expose it to pursuit, to persecution, to ruin, if she could not offer him anything in return save friendship? Therefore, she asked herself, what was she to do, whither was she to flee, since here and there destruction threatened her, here and there disgrace. In such a struggle of soul, she began to pray ardently, and more especially did she repeat one prayer with earnestness, to which the old colonel had constant recourse in evil times, beginning with the words, God saved thee with thy infant from the malice of Herod. In Egypt he straightened the road for thy safe passage. At this moment a great whirlwind rose, and the trees in the garden began to make a tremendous noise. All at once 
the praying lady remembered the wilderness on the borders of which she had grown up from infancy, and the thought that in the wilderness she would find the only safe refuge flew through her head like lightning. Then Olenka breathed deeply, for she had found at last what she had been seeking. To Zielonka, to Rogovska, there the enemy would not go, the ruffian would not seek booty. There a man of the place, if he forgot himself, might go astray and wander till death. What must it be to a stranger not knowing the road? There the Domasheviches, the smoky Stikans, and if they are gone, if they have followed Pan Vorovsky, it is possible to go by those forests far beyond and seek quiet in other wildernesses. The remembrance of Pan Vorovsky rejoiced Olenka. Oh, if she had such a protector! He was a genuine soldier. His was a sabre under which she might take refuge from Kmichits and the Rajivils themselves. Now it occurred to her that he was the man who had advised when he caught Kmichits in Bielevice to seek safety in the Białowieża wilderness. And he spoke wisely. Rogowska and Zielonka are too near the Rajivils, and near Białowieża stands that Sapieha who rubbed from the face of the earth the most terrible Rajivil. To Białowieża then, to Białowieża, even today, tomorrow, only let her uncle come, she would not delay. The dark depths of Białowieża will protect her, and afterward, when the storm passes, the cloister. There only can be real peace and forgetfulness of all men, of all pain, sorrow and contempt. End of chapter 41 Recording by David Granville Young Chapter 42 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Calkins, Monument, Colorado. The Deluge, Volume 2 by Henry Sinkovitz. Translated by Jeremiah Curtin. Chapter 42. The sword bearer of Rossieni returned a few days later. In spite of the safe conduct of Boguslav, he went only to Rossieni. To Bilvich itself he had no reason to go, for it was no longer in the world. The house, the buildings, the village, everything was burned to the ground in the last battle, which Father Strashevich, a Jesuit, had fought at the head of his own detachment against the Swedish captain Rosa. The inhabitants were in the forests or in armed parties. Instead of rich villages, there remained only land and water. The roads were filled with ravagers, that is, fugitives from various armies, who, going in considerable groups, were busied with robbery, so that even small parties of soldiers were not safe from them. The sword-bearer then had not even been able to convince himself whether the barrels filled with plate and money and buried in the garden were safe, and he returned to Torogi very angry and peevish, with a terrible animosity in his heart against the destroyers. He had barely put foot out of his carriage when Olinka hurried him to her own room and recounted all that Hassling Ketling had told her. The old soldier shivered at the recital, since, not having children of his own, he loved the maiden as his daughter. For a while he did nothing but grasp his sword-hilt, repeating, "'Strike, who has courage!' At last he caught himself by the head and began to say, Mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. It is my fault, my greatest fault. For at times it came into my head, and this and that man whispered that that hell-dweller was melting from love of you, and I said nothing, was even proud, thinking, Well, he will marry. We are relatives of the Gosievskys, of the Tizinghouses. Why should we not be relatives of the Radzivils? For pride, God is punishing me. The traitor prepared a respectable relationship. That's the kind of relative he wanted to be. I would he were killed. But wait, this hand and this saber will molder first. We must think of escape, said Olinka. Well, give your plans of escape. 
The sword-bearer, having finished panting, listened carefully. At last he said, "'Better collect my subjects and form a party. I will attack the Swedes as Kmitka did Hovonsky. You will be safer in the forest and in the field than in the court of a traitor and a heretic.' "'That is well,' answered the lady. "'Not only will I not oppose,' said the sword-bearer, "'but I will say the sooner the better, and I lack neither subjects nor scythes. They burned my residence. Never mind that. I will assemble peasants from other villages. All the Bilovitches in the field will join us. We will show your relationship, young man. We will show what it is to attack the Bilovich honor. You are a Radzivill. What of that? There are no hetmans in the Bilovich family, but there are also no traitors. We shall see whom all Jimid will follow. We will put you in Bialovij and return ourselves said he, turning to Olinka. It cannot be otherwise. He must give satisfaction for that affair, for it is an injustice to the whole estate of nobles. Infamous is he who does not declare for us. God will help us, our brethren will help us, citizens will help us, and then fire and sword. The Bilviches will meet the Radzivils. Infamous he who is not with us. Infamous he who will not flash his sword in the eyes of the traitor. The king is with us. So is the diet. So is the whole commonwealth. Here the sword-bearer, red as blood and with bristling forelock, fell to pounding the table with his fist. This war is more urgent than the Swedish, for in us the whole order of knighthood, all laws, the whole commonwealth is injured and shaken in its deepest foundations, Infamous is he who does not understand this. The land will perish unless we measure out vengeance and punishment on the traitor. And the old blood played more and more violently till Olinka was forced to pacify her uncle. He sat calmly then, though he thought that not only the country but the whole world was perishing when the Biloviches were touched. In this he saw the most terrible precipice for the commonwealth and began to roar like a lion. But the lady, who had great influence over him, was able at last to pacify her uncle, explaining that for their safety and for the success of their flight, it was specially needful to preserve the profoundest secrecy, and not to show the prince that they were thinking of anything. He promised sacredly to act according to her directions. Then they took counsel about the flight itself. The affair was not over difficult, for it seemed that they were not watched at all the sword-bearer decided to send in advance a youth with letters to his overseers to assemble peasants at once from all the villages belonging to him and the other Biloviches, and to arm them. Six confidential servants were to go to Bilovich, as it were, for the barrels of money and silver, but really to halt in the Gerlikol forests and wait there with horses, bags, and provisions. They decided to depart from Torogi in sleighs, and accompanied by two servants, as if going merely to the neighboring Gavna. Afterward, they would mount horses and hurry on with all speed. To Gavna they used to go often to visit the Kuchuk Obutrovskis, where sometimes they passed the night. They hoped, therefore, that their journey would not attract the attention of any one, and that no pursuit would follow, unless two or three days later, at which time they would be in the midst of armed bands and in the depth of impenetrable forests. The absence of Prince Boguslav strengthened them in this hope. Meanwhile, the sword-bearer was greatly busied with preparations. A messenger with letters went out on the following morning. The day after that, Pan Tomasz talked in detail with Patterson of his buried money, which, as he said, exceeded a hundred thousand, and of the need of bringing it to safe Torgi. Patterson believed easily for Bilovich was a noble, and passed as a very rich man, which he was in reality. "'Let them bring it as soon as possible,' said the Scot. "'If you need them, I will give you soldiers.' "'The fewer people who see what I am bringing, the better. My servants are faithful, and I will order them to cover the barrels with hemp, which is brought often from our villages to Prussia, or with staves which no one will covet.' "'Better with staves,' said Patterson." for people could feel with a saber or a spear through the hemp that there was nothing else in the wagon, but you would better give the coin to the prince on his recognition. I know, too, that he needs money, for his revenues do not come regularly. 
I should like so to serve the prince that he would never need anything, answered the old man. The conversation ended there, and all seemed to combine most favorably, for the servants started at once, while the sword-bearer and Olinka were to go next morning. But in the evening Boguslav returned most unexpectedly at the head of two regiments of Prussian cavalry. His affairs seemed to advance not too favorably, for he was angry and fretful. That evening he summoned a council of war, which was composed of the representatives of the elector, Count Sedevitz, Patterson, Sakovich, and Kiritz, a colonel of cavalry. They sat till three in the morning, and the object of their deliberation was the campaign to Poliasie against Safia. The elector and the king of Sweden have reinforced me in proportion to their strength, said the prince. One of two things will happen. Either I shall find Sabieha in Poliasi, and in that event I must rub him out, or I shall not find him, and I shall occupy Poliasi without resistance. For all this, however, money is needed, and money neither the elector nor the king of Sweden has given me, for they haven't it themselves. Where is money to be found if not with your highness? asked Sedivitz. Through the whole world men speak of the inexhaustible wealth of the Radzivils. Pan Sedivitz, answered Boguslav, if I received all the income from my inherited estates, I should surely have more money than five of your German princes taken together. But there is war in the country. Revenues do not come in or are intercepted by rebels. Ready money might be obtained for notes from the Prussian towns, but you know best what is happening in them, and that purses are opened only for Jan Casimir. But Konigsberg, I took what I could get, but that was little. I should think myself fortunate to be able to serve you with good counsel, said Patterson. I would rather you served me with ready money. My counsel means ready money. Not longer ago than yesterday, Pan Bilovich told me that he had a good sum hidden in the garden of Bilovich, and that he wishes to bring it here for safety, and give it to your highness for a note. Well, you have really fallen from heaven to me, and this noble as well, cried Boguslav. But he has much money? More than a hundred thousand, besides silver and valuables, which are worth perhaps an equal amount. The silver and valuables he will not wish to turn into money, but they can be pawned. I am thankful to you, Patterson, for this comes to me in time. I must talk to Bilovich in the morning. Then I will forewarn him, for he is preparing to go tomorrow with the lady to Gavna, to the Kuchuk Obotovskis. Tell him not to go till he sees me. He has sent the servants already. I am only alarmed for their safety. A whole regiment can be sent after them, but we will talk later. This is timely for me. Timely? and it will be amusing if I rend Poliasi from the Commonwealth with the money of this royalist and patriot. Then the prince dismissed the council, for he had to put himself yet in the hands of his chamber attendants, whose task it was every night before he went to rest to preserve his uncommon beauty with baths, ointments, and various inventions known only in foreign lands. This lasted usually an hour, and sometimes two. Besides, the prince was road-weary and the hour late. Early in the morning, Patterson detained Bilovich and Olinka with the announcement that the prince wished to see them. It was necessary to defer their journey, but this did not disturb them overmuch, for Patterson told what the question was. An hour later, the prince appeared. In spite of the fact that Pan Tomash and Olinka had promised each other most faithfully to receive him in former fashion, they could not do so, though they tried with every effort. Olinka's countenance changed, and blood came to the face of the sword-bearer at sight of Prince Boguslav. For a time both stood confused, excited, striving in vain to regain their usual calmness. The prince, on the contrary, was perfectly at ease. He had grown a little meager about the eyes, and his face was less colored than common, but that paleness of his was set off wonderfully by the pearl-colored morning dress interwoven with silver. He saw in a moment that they received him somewhat differently, and were less glad than usual to see him. But he thought at once that those two royalists had learned of his relations with the Swedes, hence the coolness of the reception. 
Therefore he began at once to throw sand in their eyes, and after the compliments of greeting, said, "'Lord Swordbearer, my benefactor, you have heard without doubt what misfortunes have met me.' "'Does your highness wish to speak of the death of Prince Yanush?' asked the sword-bearer. "'Not of his death alone. That was a cruel blow.' Still, I yielded to the will of God, who, as I hope, has rewarded my cousin for all the wrongs done him. But he has sent a new burden to me, for I must be leader in a civil war, and that for every citizen who loves his country is a bitter portion. The sword-bearer said nothing. He merely looked a little askance at Olinka. But the prince continued. By my labor and toil, and God alone knows at what outlay, I had brought peace to the verge of realization. It was almost a question of merely signing the treaties. The Swedes were to leave Poland, asking no remuneration, save the consent of the king and the estates that after the death of Jan Kazimir, Karl Gustav would be chosen to the throne of Poland. A warrior so great and mighty would be the salvation of the commonwealth. And what is more important, he was to furnish at once reinforcements for the war in the Ukraine and against Moscow. We should have extended our boundaries, but this was not convenient for Pan Sapieha, for then he could not crush the Radzivils. All agreed to this treaty. He alone opposes it with armed hand. The country is nothing to him if he can only carry out his personal designs. It has come to this, that arms must be used against him. This function has been confided to me according to the secret treaty between Jan Kazimir and Karl Gustav. This is the whole affair." I have never shunned any service, therefore I must accept this, though many will judge me unjustly and think that I begin a brother-killing war from pure revenge only. Whoso knows your highness, said the sword-bearer, as well as we do, will not be deceived by appearances, and will always be able to understand the real intentions of your highness. Here the sword-bearer was so delighted with his own cunning and courtesy, and he muttered so expressively at Olenka, that she was alarmed lest the prince should notice these signs. And he did notice them. They do not believe me, thought he. And though he showed no wrath on his face, Bilovich had pricked him to the soul. He was convinced with perfect sincerity that it was an offense not to believe a Radzivill, even when he saw fit to lie. Patterson has told me, continued he after a while, that you wish to give me ready money for my paper. I agree to this willingly, for I acknowledge that ready money is useful to me at the moment. When peace comes, you can do as you like, either take a certain sum, or I will give you a couple of villages as security, so that the transaction will be profitable for you. Pardon, said the prince, turning to Olenka, that in view of such material questions we are not speaking of size or ideals. This conversation is out of place but the times are such that it is impossible to give their proper course to homage and admiration. Olinka dropped her eyes, and seizing her robe with the tips of her fingers made a proper curtsy, not wishing to give an answer. Meanwhile, the sword-bearer formed in his mind a project of unheard-of unfitness, but which he considered uncommonly clever. I will flee with Olinka and will not give the money, thought he. It will be agreeable to me to accommodate your highness. Patterson has not told of all, for there is about half a pot of gold ducats buried apart, so as not to lose all the money in case of accident. Besides, there are barrels belonging to other Bilovitches, but these during my absence were buried under the direction of this young lady, and she alone is able to calculate the place, for the man who buried them is dead. Bogoslav looked at him quickly. How is that? Patterson said that you have already sent men, and since they have gone, they must know where the money is. But of the other money, no one knows except her. Still, it must be buried in some definite place, which can be described easily in words or indicated on paper. Words are wind, and as to pictures, the servants know nothing of them. We will both go, that is the thing. For God's sake, you must know your own gardens, therefore go alone. Why should Panna Alexandra go? I will not go alone, said Bilovich with decision. Bogoslav looked at him inquiringly a second time. Then he seated himself more comfortably and began to strike his boots with a cane which he held in his hand. Is that final? asked he. Well, 
In such an event, I will give a couple of regiments of cavalry to take you there and bring you back. We need no regiments. We will go and return ourselves. This is our country. Nothing threatens us here. As a host, sensitive to the good of his guests, I cannot permit that Panna Alexandra should go without armed force. Choose, then. Either go alone or let both go with an escort. Bilovich saw that he had fallen into his own trap, and that brought him to such anger that, forgetting all precautions, he cried, Then let your highness choose. Either we shall both go unattended, or I will not give the money. Panna Alexandra looked on him imploringly, but he had already grown red and begun to pant. Still, he was a man cautious by nature, even timid, loving to settle every affair in good feeling. But when once the measure was exceeded in dealing with him, when he was too much excited against any one, or when it was a question of the Bilovich honor, he hurled himself with a species of desperate daring at the eyes of even the most powerful enemy, so that now he put his hand to his left side, and shaking his saber, began to cry with all of his might, "'Is this captivity?' Do they wish to oppose a free citizen and trample on cardinal rights? Boguslav, with shoulders leaning against the arms of the chair, looked at him attentively. But his look became colder each moment, and he struck the cane against his boots more and more quickly. Had the sword-bearer known the prince better, he would have known that he was bringing down terrible danger on his own head. Relations with Boguslav were simply dreadful. It was never known when the courteous cavalier, the diplomat accustomed to self-control, would be overborne by the wild and unrestrained magnate who trampled every resistance with the cruelty of an eastern despot. A brilliant education and refinement acquired at the first courts of Europe, reflection and studied elegance which he had gained in intercourse with men, were like wonderful and strong flowers under which was secreted a tiger." But the sword-bearer did not know this, and in his angry blindness shouted on, "'Your Highness, dissemble no further, for you are known, and have a care, for neither the King of Sweden nor the Elector, both of whom you are serving against your own country, nor your princely position will save you before the law, and the sabers of nobles will teach you manners, young man.' Boguslav rose. In one instant he crushed the cane in his iron hands, and throwing the pieces at the feet of the sword-bearer, said with a terrible, suppressed voice, "'That is what your rights are for me. That your tribunals. That your privileges.' "'Outrageous violence!' cried Bilovich. "'Silence, paltry noble!' cried the prince. "'I will crush you into dust.' and he advanced to seize the astonished man and hurl him against the wall. Now Panna Alexandra stood between them. "'What do you think to do?' inquired she. The prince restrained himself, but she stood with nostrils distended, with flaming face, with fire in her eyes like an angry Minerva. Her breast heaved under her bodice like a wave of the sea, and she was marvelous in that anger, so that Boguslav was lost in gazing at her." All his desires crept into his face like serpents from the dens of his soul. After a time his anger passed, presence of mind returned. He looked a while yet at Olinka. At last his face grew mild. He bent his head toward his breast and said, Pardon, angelic lady. I have a soul full of gnawing and pain. Therefore I do not command myself. Then he left the room. Olinka began to wring her hands, and Bilovich, coming to himself, seized his forelock and cried, "'I have spoilt everything. I am the cause of your ruin.' The prince did not show himself the whole day. He even dined in his own room with Sakovich. Stirred to the bottom of his soul, he could not think so clearly as usual. Some kind of egg was wasting him. It was the herald of a grievous fever which was to seize him soon with such force that during its attacks he was benumbed altogether, so that his attendants had to rub him most actively. But at this time he ascribed his strange state to the power of love, and thought that he must either satisfy it or die. When he had told Sakovich the whole conversation with the sword-bearer, he said, "'My hands and feet are burning. Ants are walking along my back. In my mouth are bitterness and fire.' But by all the horned devils, what is this? Never has this attacked me before. 
Your highness is as full of scruples as a baked capon of buckwheat grits. The prince is a capon. The prince is a capon. Ha <laughs> ha. You are a fool. Very well. I don't need your ideas. Worthy prince, take a lute and go under the windows of the maiden. Bilovich may show you his fist. Toof! To the deuce. Is that the kind of bold man that Boguslav Radzivil is? You are an idiot. Very well. I see that your highness is beginning to speak with yourself and tell the truth to your own face. Boldly. Boldly. Pay no heed to rank. You see, Sakovich, that my castor is growing familiar with me. As it is, I kick him often in the ribs, but a greater accident may meet you. Sakovich sprang up as if red with anger, like Bilovich a little while before. And since he had an uncommon gift of mimicry, he began to cry in a voice so much like that of Bilovich that anyone not seeing who was talking might have been deceived. What? Is this captivity? Do they wish to oppress a free citizen? To trample on cardinal rights? Give us peace, give us peace, said the prince fretfully. She defended that old fool with her person, but here there is no one to defend you. If she defended him, she should have been taken in pawn. There must be some witchcraft in this place. Either she must have given me something, or the constellations are such that I am simply leaving my mind. If you could have seen her when she was defending that mangy old uncle of hers. But you are a fool. It is growing cloudy in my head. See how my hands are burning. To love such a woman, to gain her, with such a woman to... To have posterity, added Sakovich. That's so, that's so, as if you knew that must be. Otherwise I shall burst as a bomb. For God's sake, what is happening to me? Must I marry, or what, by all the devils of earth and hell? Sakovich grew serious. Your princely highness, you must not think of that. I am thinking of just that, precisely because I wish it. I will do that, though a regiment of Sakovich's repeated a whole day to me. Your princely highness must not think of that. Oh, I see this is no joke. I am sick, enchanted. Why do you not follow my advice at last? I must follow it. May the plague take all the dreams, all the Bilovich's, all Lithuania with the tribunals, and Jan Kazimir to boot. I shall not succeed otherwise. I see that I shall not. I have had enough of this, have I not? A great question. And I, the fool, was considering both sides hitherto, was afraid of dreams, of Bilovich's, of lawsuits, of the rabble of nobles, the fortune of Jan Kazimir. Tell me that I am a fool. Do you hear? I command you to tell me that I am a fool. But I will not obey, for now you are really Radzivill, and not a Calvinist minister. But in truth you must be ill, for I have never seen you so changed. True. In the most difficult positions I merely waved my hand and whistled. But now I feel as if someone were thrusting spurs into my sides. This is strange, for if that maiden has given you something designedly— she has not done so to run away afterward, but still, from what you say, it seems that they wish to flee in secret. Riff told me that this is the influence of Saturn, on which burning exultations rise during this particular month. Worthy prince, rather take Jove as a model, for he was happy without marriage. All will be well, only do not think of marriage unless of a counterfeit one. All at once the starosta of Oshmiana struck his forehead. But wait! Your Highness, I have heard of such a case in Prussia. Is the devil whispering something into your ear? Tell me. But Sakovich was silent for a long time, and at last his face brightened, and he said, Thank the fortune that gave you Sakovich as a friend. What news, what news? Nothing. I will be your Highness's best man. Here Sakovich bowed. No small honor for such a poor fellow. Don't play the jester. Speak quickly. There is in Tiltza one Plaska, or something like that, who in his time was a priest in Yevorani, but who, falling away from the faith, became a Lutheran, got married, took refuge under the elector, and now is dealing in dried fish with people of this region. Bishop Parchevsky tried to lure him back to Jumud, where in good certainty there was a fire waiting for him, but the elector would not yield up a fellow believer. How does that concern me? Do not loiter. 
How does that concern your highness? In this way it must concern you, for he will sew you and her together with stitches on the outside, you understand. And because he is a fool of a workman, and does not belong to the guild, it will be easy to rip the work after him. Do you see? The guild does not recognize this sewing as valid, but still there will be no violence, no outcry. You can twist the neck of the workman afterward, and you will complain that you were deceived. Do you understand? But before that time, crescite et multiplicamini. I'll be the first to give you my blessing. I understand, and I don't understand, said the prince. The devil I understand there perfectly. Sakovich, you must have been born, like a witch, with teeth in your mouth. The hangman is waiting for you. It cannot be otherwise, O oh Starusta. But while I live, a hair will not fall from your head. A fitting reward will not miss you. I then, your highness, will make a formal proposal to Panna Vilevich, to her and to her uncle. If they refuse, if they do not consent, then give command to tear the skin from me, make sandal strings out of it, and go on a pilgrimage of penance to... to Rome. It is possible to resist Radzivill if he wishes simply to be a lover, but if he wishes to marry, he need not try to please any noble... You must only tell Bilovich and the lady that out of regard for the elector and the king of Sweden, who want you to marry the princess of Bipont, your marriage must remain secret till peace is declared. Besides, you will write the marriage contract as you like. Both churches will be forced to declare it invalid. Well, what do you think? Boguslav was silent for a while, but on his face red fever spots appeared under the paint. Then he cried, there is no time in three days. I must move against Sapieha. That is just the position. Were there more time, it would be impossible to justify the pretext. Is this not true? Only through lack of time can you explain that the first priest at hand officiates, as happens in sudden emergencies, and marries on a bolting cloth. They will think, too, it is sudden, for it must be sudden. She is a knightly maiden. You can take her with you to the field. Dear bridegroom, if Sapieha conquers, even then you will have half the victories of the campaign. That is well. That is well, said the prince. But at that moment the first paroxysm seized him so that his jaws closed and he could not say another word. He grew rigid and then began to quiver and flounder like a fish out of water. But before the terrified Sakovich could bring the physician, the paroxysm had passed. End of chapter 42。Chapter 43 of The Deluge, Volume 2。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Calkins, Monument, Colorado. The Deluge, Volume 2 by Henrik Sienkiewicz. Translated by Jeremiah Curtin. Chapter 43 After his conversation with Sakovich, Prince Bogoslav betook himself on the afternoon of the morrow directly to Bilovich. My benefactor, said he to begin with, I was grievously to blame the last time we met, for I fell into anger in my own house. It is my fault, and all the more so that I gave this affront to a man of a family friendly to the Radzivils, but I come to implore forgiveness. Let a sincere confession be satisfaction to you and my atonement. You know the Radzivils of old. You know that we are not in haste to beg pardon. Still, since I was to blame before age and dignity, I come, without considering who I am, with a penitent head. And you, old friend of our house, will not refuse me your hand, I am certain. Then he extended his hand, and Bilovich, in whose soul the first outburst had passed, did not dare to refuse his own, though he gave it with hesitation. Your Highness, return to us our freedom. That will be the best satisfaction. You are free, and may go even today. I thank your Highness, said the astonished Bilovich. I interpose only one condition, which you, God grant, will not reject. What is that? asked Bilovich with fear that you listen patiently to what I am going to say. 
If that is all, I will listen even till evening. Do not give me your answer at once, but think an hour or two. God sees that if I receive my freedom, I wish peace. You will receive your freedom, but I do not know whether you will use it or whether you will be urgent to leave my threshold. I should be glad were you to consider my house and all Tarogi as your own. But listen to me now. Do you know, my benefactor, why I was opposed to the departure of Panna Bilevich? This is why, because I divined that you wished to flee simply, and I have fallen in love with your niece, so that to see her I should be ready to swim a hellspont each day, like Leander. Bilevich grew red again in a moment. Does your highness dare to say that to me? To you especially, my benefactor. Worthy prince, seek your fortune with court ladies, but touch not noble maidens. You may imprison her, you may confine her in a vault, but you may not disgrace her. I may not disgrace her, said the prince, but I bow down to the old man Bilevich and say to him, Listen, father, give me your niece as wife, for I cannot live without her. The sword-bearer was so amazed that he could not utter a word. For a time he merely moved his mustaches, and his eyes were staring. Then he began to rub his hands and look, now on the prince, now around the room. At last he said, Is this in a dream, or is it real? Do not hasten. To convince you still further, I will repeat with all the titles. I, Bogoslav, Prince Radzivil, Marshal of the Grand Principality of Lithuania, ask you, Tomasz Bilevich, sword-bearer of Rostieny, for the hand of your niece, Panna Alexandra, chief hunter's daughter. Is this true? In God's name, have you considered the matter? I have considered. Now do you consider, my benefactor, whether the cavalier is worthy of the lady? My breath is stopped from wonder. Now see if I have any evil intentions. And would your highness not consider our small station? Are the Bilevichs so cheap? Do you value your shield of nobility and the antiquity of your family thus? Does a Bilevich say this? I know, gracious prince, that the origin of our family is to be sought in ancient Rome, but... But, interrupted the prince, you have neither hetmans nor chancellors, that is nothing. You are soldiers, like my uncle in Brandenburg. Since a noble in our commonwealth may be elected king, there are no thresholds too lofty for his feet. My sword-bearer, and God grant my uncle, I was born of a Brandenburg princess. My father's mother was an Ostrogsky, but my grandfather of mighty memory, Christoph I, he whom they call Thunder, Grand Hetman, Chancellor, and Voivoda of Vilna, was married the first time to Panna Sobek. But for this reason the coronet did not fall from his head, for Panna Sobek was a noble woman, as honorably born as others. When my late father married the daughter of the elector, they wondered why he did not remember his own dignity, though he allied himself with a reigning house. Such is the devilish pride of you nobles. But acknowledge, my benefactor, you do not think a Sobek better than a Bilovich, do you? Speaking thus, the prince began to tap the old man on the shoulder with great familiarity. The noble melted like wax and answered, God reward your highness for honorable intentions. A weight has fallen from my heart. But now, if it were not for difference of faith, a Catholic priest will perform the ceremony. I do not want another myself. I shall be thankful for this all my life, since here it is a question of the blessing of God, which certainly the Lord Jesus would withdraw if some vile. Here the old man bit his tongue, for he saw that he was saying something disagreeable to the prince. But Boguslav did not notice it. He smiled graciously and said, And as to posterity, I shall not be stubborn, for there is nothing that I would not do for that beauty of yours." Bilevich's face grew bright as if a ray of the sun had fallen on it. Indeed, God has not been sparing of beauty to her, it is true. Oh, there will be a shout all over Jumid. And what will the Sitsinskis say when the Bilevichs increase so? They would not leave the old colonel at rest, though he was a man of Roman mold, respected by the whole commonwealth. We will drive them out of Jmud, worthy sword-bearer. Oh, great God, merciful God! 
undiscoverable are thy judgments, but if in them it lies that the Sitsinskis are to burst from envy, then let thy will be done. Amen, added Boguslav. Your Highness, do not take it ill that I do not clothe myself in dignity, as befits a person of whom a man asks a maiden, and that I show too evident rejoicing. But we have been here in vexation, not knowing what was awaiting us, and interpreting everything for the worst. It came to this that we thought evil of your highness, until it turns out that our fears and judgments were not just, and that we may return to our previous homage. I say this as if someone had taken a burden from my shoulders. And did Panna Alexandra judge me thus? She. Even Cicero could not have described properly her previous admiration for your highness. I think that only virtue and a certain inborn timidity stood in the way of love. But when she hears of the sincere intentions of your highness, then I am sure she will at once give the reins to her heart. Cicero could not have said that better, said Boguslav. With happiness comes eloquence, but since your highness has been pleased to listen to everything I have said, then I will be sincere to the last. Be sincere, Pan Bilevich. Though this maiden is young, she is a woman with a man's cast of mind altogether. It is wonderful what a character she has. Where more than one man of experience would hesitate, she hesitates not a moment. What is evil she puts on the left, what is good on the right, and goes herself to the right as if it were sweet. When she has once chosen the road, even though there were cannon before her, that is nothing to her. She would not go aside for the cannon. She is like her grandfather and me. Her father was a born soldier, but mild. Her mother, from the house of Voynilovich, was also strong-willed. I am glad to hear this, Pan Bilovich. Your Highness will not believe how incensed she is against the Swedes and all enemies of the Commonwealth. If she held any one guilty of treason, she would feel an utter detestation of him, though he were an angel and not a human being. Your Highness, forgive an old man who might be your father in years, if not in dignity. Leave the Swedes. They are worse for the country than Tartars. Move your troops against such sons, and not only I, but she, will follow you to the field. M pardon me, Your Highness. Pardon me. Now I have said what I had on my mind. Boguslav mastered himself after a moment's silence, and said, My benefactor, you might have supposed yesterday, but you may not suppose today that I wish merely to throw sand in your eyes when I say that I am on the side of the king and the country. Here, under oath to you as a relative, I repeat that what I stated touching peace and its conditions was the pure truth. I, too, should prefer to march to the field, for my nature draws me thither. But because I saw that salvation was not in the field, I was forced through simple devotion to seize another method. And I can say that I have accomplished an unheard-of thing, for after a last war to conclude a peace of such kind that the conquering power serves the conquered, of this Mazarin, the most cunning of men, need not be ashamed. Not Panna Alexandra alone, but I equally with her bear hatred to the enemy. But what is to be done? How save this country? Not even Hercules against many can conquer. Therefore I thought thus. Instead of destroying, which would be easier and more amusing, it is needful to save. And since I have practiced in affairs of this kind with great statesmen— since I am a relative of the elector, and since, by reason of my cousin Yanush, I am well considered by the Swedes, I began negotiations. And what their course was, and what the benefit to the commonwealth was, that you know, an end of the war, freedom from oppression for your Catholic faith, for churches, for clergy, for the estate of nobles, and for the common people, the assistance of the Swedes in the war against Moscow and the Cossacks, and, God grant, an extension of boundary, and this all on one condition, that Karl Gustav be king after Jan Kazimir. Whoso has done more for his country in these times, let him stand before my eyes. True, a blind man could see that, but it would be very sad for the nobles that a free election will cease. And which is more important, an election or the country? They are the same, your highness for an election is the main basis of the commonwealth. And what is the country, if not a collection of laws, 
privileges, and liberties serving the nobles. A king can be found even in a foreign land. Anger and disgust flew like lightning over Bogoslav's face. Karl Gustav, said he, will sign the Pacta Conventa as his predecessors have signed it, and after his death we will elect whom we choose, even that Radzivill who will be born of your niece. The sword-bearer stood for a while as if dazzled by the thought. At last he raised his hand and cried with great enthusiasm, Consent, your, I agree. I think, too, that you would agree, even if the throne should become hereditary in our family. Such are you all. But that is a later question. Now it is necessary that the stipulations come to reality. You understand, my uncle. As true as life, it is necessary, repeated Bilovich with deep conviction. They must, for this reason, that I am a mediator agreeable to his Swedish majesty. And do you know for what reasons? Carl Gustav has one sister married to de la Gardie, and another, Princess Bipon, still unmarried, and he wishes to give her to me, so as to be allied to our house and have a party in Lithuania. Hence his favor toward me, to which my uncle, the elector, inclines him. How is that? asked the disquieted sword-bearer. I would give all the princesses of Bipon for your dove, together with the principalities, not only of the two, but of all the bridges in the world. But I may not anger the Swedish beast, therefore I give willing ear to their discussions, but only let them sign the treaty, then we shall see. Would they be ready, then, not to sign, if they should discover that you were married? Worthy sword-bearer, said the prince with seriousness, you have condemned me of crookedness toward the country, but I, as a true citizen, ask you, have I a right to sacrifice public affairs to my private interests? Pan Tomash listened. What will happen, then? Think to yourself what must happen. As God is true, I see already that the marriage must be deferred, and the proverb says, what is deferred escapes. I will not change my heart, for I have fallen in love for life. You must know that, for faithfulness, I could put to shame the most enduring Penelope. Bilovich was alarmed still more, for he had an entirely opposite opinion touching the prince's constancy, confirmed as it was by Bogoslav's general reputation. But the prince added, as if for a finishing stroke, You are right, that no one is sure of his tomorrow. I may fall ill. Nay, some kind of sickness is coming on me even now, for yesterday I grew so rigid that Sakovich barely saved me. I may fall in a campaign against Sapia, and what delays, what troubles and vexations there will be, could not be written on an oxhide. By the wounds of God, give advice, your highness. What advice can I give? asked the prince. Though I should be glad myself to have the latch fall as soon as possible. Well, let it fall. Marry, and then what will be, will be. Boguslav sprang to his feet. By the holy gospel, with your wit you should be the chancellor of Lithuania. Another man would not have thought out in three days what has come to your mind in a twinkle. That is it. Marry, and remain quiet. There is sense in that. As it is, I shall march in two days against Sapia, for I must. During that time secret passages to the lady's chamber can be made, and then to the road. That is the head of a statesman. We will let two or three confidants into the secret and take them as witnesses, so that the marriage may be formal. I will write a contract, secure the jointure, to which I will add a bequest, and let there be silence for the time. My benefactor, I thank you. From my heart, I thank you. Come to my arms, and then go to my beauty. I will wait for her answer as if on coals. Meanwhile, I will send Sakovich for the priest." Be well, father, and God grant soon the grandfather of Aradzivill. When he had said this, he let the astonished noble go from his embrace and rushed out of the room. For God's sake, said the sword-bearer, recovering himself, I gave such wise advice that Solomon himself would not be ashamed of it, and I should prefer to do without it. A secret is a secret, but break your head, crush your forehead against a wall, it cannot be otherwise. A blind man can see that. Would that the frost might oppress and kill those Swedes to the last. If it were not for those negotiations, the marriage would take place with ceremony, and all Jimid would come to the wedding. But here a husband must walk to his wife on felt, 
so as not to make noise. Pfft, to the deuce. The Satsinskis will not burst so soon. Yet, praise be to God, that bursting will not miss them. When he had said this, he went to Olinka. Meanwhile, the prince was taking further counsel with Sakovich. The old man danced on two paws like a bear, said the prince, but he tormented the life out of me. Oof! But I squeezed him so that I thought that the boots and straw would fly off his feet, and when I called him uncle, his eyes stuck out as if a keg of cabbage hash were choking him. Wait, I will make you uncle, but I have scores upon scores of such uncles throughout the whole world. Sakovich, I see how she is waiting for me in her room, and she will receive me with her eyes closed and her hands crossed. Wait, I will kiss those eyes for you. Sakovich, you will receive for life the estate of Prudy beyond Oshmiana. When can Plaska be here? Before evening. I thank your highness for Prudy. That is nothing. Before evening. That means any moment. If the ceremony could be performed today, even before midnight, have you the contract ready? I have. I was liberal in the name of your highness. I assigned Birji as the jointure of the lady. The sword-bearer will howl like a dog when it is taken from him afterward. He will sit in a dungeon, then he will be quiet. Even that will not be needed. As soon as the marriage is invalid, all will be invalid. But did I not tell you that they would agree? He did not make the least difficulty. I am curious to know what she will say. I care nothing about him. Oh, they have fallen each into the arms of the other, are weeping from emotion, are blessing your highness, and are carried away by your kindness and beauty. I don't know that they are by my beauty, for in some way I look wretched. I am all the time out of health, and I am afraid that yesterday's numbness will come again. No, you will take something warm. The prince was already before the mirror. It is blue under my eyes, and that fool foray darkened my eyebrows crooked. See if they are not crooked. I'll give orders to thumbscrew him and make a monkey my body servant. Why does the old man not come? I should like to go to the lady now, for she will permit me to kiss her before the marriage. How quickly it grows dark today. If Plaska flinches, we must put pinchers into the fire. Plaska will not flinch. He is a scoundrel from under a dark star. And will he perform the marriage in scoundrel fashion? A scoundrel will perform the marriage for a scoundrel in scoundrel fashion. The prince fell into a good humor and said, When there is a pander for best man, there cannot be another kind of marriage. For a while they were silent. Then both began to laugh. But their laughter sounded with marvelous ill omen through the dark room. Night fell deeper and deeper. The prince began to walk through the room, striking audibly with his hammerstaff, on which he leaned heavily, for his feet did not serve him well after the last numbness. Now the servants brought in candelabra with candles, and went out. But the rush of air bent the flames of the candles, so that for a long time they did not burn straight upward, melting, meanwhile, much wax. "'See how the candles are burning,' said the prince." What do you prophesy from that? That one virtue will melt today like wax. It is wonderful how long that talk lasts. Maybe the spirit of old Bilovich is flying over the flames. You are a fool, answered Bogoslav abruptly. You have chosen a time to talk of spirits. Silence followed. They say in England, said the prince, that when there is a spirit in the room, every light burns blue. But see, now they are burning yellow, as usual. Trash, answered Sakovich. There are people in Moscow. But be still, interrupted Bogoslav. The sword-bearer is coming. No, that is the wind moving the shutters. The devils have brought that old maid of an aunt, Kulvietz Hippocentaris. Has anyone ever heard of the like? And she looks like a chimera. If you wish, your highness, I'll marry her, then she will not be in the way. Plaska will solder us while you are waiting. Well, I will give her a maple spade as a marriage present, and you a lantern, so as to have something to light her way. I will not be your uncle, bogus. Remember Castor, answered the prince. Do not strike Castor, my pollux, against the grain, for he can bite. Further conversation was interrupted by the sword-bearer and Panna Kulvietz. The prince stepped up to him quickly, leaning on his hammer. 
Sakovitch rose. "'Well, what? May I go to Olinka?' asked the prince. The sword-bearer spread out his arms and dropped his head on his breast. "'Your Highness, my niece says that Colonel Bilovich's will forbids her to decide her own fate, and even if it did not forbid, she would not marry your Highness, not having the heart to do so.' Sekovich, do you hear?' said Boguslav with a terrible voice. "'I, too, knew of that will,' continued the sword-bearer. "'But at the first moment I did not think it an invincible impediment.' "'I jeer at the wills of you nobles,' said the prince. "'I spit on your wills. Do you understand?' "'But we do not jeer at them,' said the aroused Pantomosh. "'And according to the will, the maiden is free to enter the cloister or marry Kmita.' "'Whom, you sorry fellow? Kmita? I'll show you, Kmita. I'll teach you. Whom do you call sorry fellow? A Bilovich? And the sword-bearer caught at his side in the greatest fury, but Boguslav in one moment struck him on the breast with his hammer, so that Bilovich groaned and fell to the floor. The prince then kicked him aside to open a way to the door, and rushed from the room without a hat. "'Jesus, Mary Joseph!' cried Panna Kuvietz. But Sakovich, seizing her by the shoulder, put a dagger to her breast and said, Quiet, my little jewel, quiet, dearest dove, or I will cut thy sweet throat like that of a lame hen. Sit here quietly and go not upstairs to thy niece's wedding. But in Panna Kulvietz, there was knightly blood too, therefore she had barely heard the words of Sakovich when straightway her terror passed into despair and frenzy. Ruffian! Bandit! Pagan, cried she, slay me, for I will shout to the whole commonwealth. The brother killed, the niece disgraced. I do not wish to live. Strike, slay, robber. People, come see. Sakovich stifled further words by putting his powerful hand over her mouth. Quiet, crooked distaff, dried rue, said he. I will not cut thy throat, for why should I give the devil that which is his anyhow? But lest thou scream like a peacock before roosting, I will tie up thy pretty mouth with thy kerchief, and take a lute and play to thee of sighs. It cannot be, but thou wilt love me. So saying, the Sarosa of Osmiana, with the dexterity of a genuine pickpocket, encircled the head of Panna Kulvietz with her handkerchief, tied her hands in the twinkle of an eye, and threw her on the sofa. Then he sat by her, and stretching himself out comfortably, asked her as calmly as though he had begun an ordinary conversation. Well, what do you think? I suppose Bogus will get on as easily as I have. With that, he sprang to his feet, for the door opened, and in it appeared Panna Alexandra. Her face was as white as chalk. Her hair was somewhat disheveled. Her brows were frowning, and threat was in her eyes. Seeing her uncle on the floor, she knelt near him and passed her hand over his head and breast. The sword-bearer drew a deep breath, opened his eyes, half raised himself, and began to look around in the room, as if roused from sleep. Then, resting his hand on the floor, he tried to rise, which he did after a while with the help of the lady. Then he came with tottering step to a chair, into which he threw himself. Only now did Alinka see Panna Kulvietz lying on the sofa. "'Have you murdered her?' asked she of Sekovich. "'God preserve me,' answered the starosta of Ashmiana. I command you to unbind her. There was such power in that voice that Sakovich said not a word as if the command had come from Princess Radzivill herself and began to unbind the unconscious Panna Kuvietz. And now, said the lady, go to your master who is lying up there. What has happened? cried Sakovich, coming to himself. You will answer for him. Not to thee, serving man. Be off. Sakovich sprang out of the chamber as if possessed. End of chapter 43「Chapter 44 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Calkins. Monument, Colorado. The Deluge, Volume 2, by Henrik Sienkiewicz, translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835-1906. Chapter 44 
Sakovich did not leave Bogoslav's bedside for two days, the second paroxysm being worse than the first. The prince's jaws closed so firmly that attendants had to open them with a knife to pour medicine into his mouth. He regained consciousness immediately after, but he trembled, quivered, floundered in the bed, and stretched himself like a wild beast mortally wounded. When that had passed, a wonderful weakness came. He gazed all night at the ceiling without saying a word. Next day, after he had taken drugs, he fell into a sound sleep, and about midday woke covered with abundant perspiration. "'How does your highness feel?' asked Sakovich. "'I am better. Have any letters come? Letters from the elector and Steinbach are lying on the table, but the reading must be put off till later, for you have not strength enough yet. Give them at once, do you hear?' Sakovich brought the letters, and Bogoslav read them twice. Then he thought a while and said, "'We will move for Poldiasi tomorrow.' "'You will be in bed tomorrow as you are today.' I will be on horseback as well as you. Be silent. No interference. The starosta ceased, and for a while silence continued, broken only by the tick-tock of the Danzig clock. The advice was stupid, the idea was stupid, and I, too, was stupid to listen. I knew that if it did not succeed, the blame would fall on me, answered Sakovich, for you blundered. The council was clever. But if there is some devil at their service who gives warning of everything, I am not to blame. The prince rose in the bed. Do you think that they employ a devil? asked he, looking quickly at Sakovich. But does not your highness know the papists? I know, I know, and it has often come into my head that there might be enchantment. Since yesterday, I am certain. You have struck my idea, therefore I asked if you really think so. But which of them could enter into company with unclean power? Not she, for she is too virtuous. Not the sword-bearer, for he is too stupid. But suppose the aunt. That may be. To make certain, I bound her yesterday, and put a dagger to her throat, and imagine, I look today, the dagger is as if melted in fire. Show it. I threw it into the river, though there was a good turquoise in the hilt. I preferred not to touch it again. Then I'll tell you what happened to me yesterday. I ran into her room as if mad. What I said I do not remember, but I know this, that she cried, I'll throw myself into the fire first. You know what an enormous chimney there is there. She sprang right into it, I after her. I dragged her out on the floor. Her clothes were already on fire. I had to quench the fire and hold her at the same time. Meanwhile, dizziness seized me. My jaws became fixed. You would have said that someone had torn the veins in my neck. Then it seemed to me that the sparks flying near us were turned into bees, were buzzing like bees. And this is as true as that you see me here. And what came later? I remember nothing but such terror as if I were flying into an immense well— into some depth without bottom. What terror! I tell you what terror! Even now the hair is standing on my head, and not terror alone, but... How can I explain it? An emptiness, a measureless weariness and torment beyond understanding. Luckily the powers of heaven were with me, or I should not be speaking with you this day. Your Highness had a paroxysm... Sickness itself often brings visions before the eye, but for safety's sake we may have a hole cut in the river ice and let the old maid float down. Oh, devil take her! We will march tomorrow in any event, and afterwards spring will come. There will soon be other stars, and the nights will be short, weakening every unclean power. If we must march tomorrow, then you would better let the girl go. Even if I wished not, I must. All desire has fallen away from me. Never mind them. Let them go to the devil. Impossible. Why? The old man has confessed that he has a tremendous lot of money buried in Bilovich. If I let them alone, they will dig up the money and go to the forests. I prefer to keep them here and take the money in requisition. 
There is war now, and this is permissible. Besides, he offered it himself. We shall give orders to dig up the whole garden, foot by foot. We must find the money. While Bilovich is sitting here, at least, he will not make a noise and shout all over Lithuania that he has plundered. Rage seizes me when I think how much I have spent on those amusements and tournaments, and all for nothing, for nothing. Rage against that maiden seized me long ago, and I tell your highness that when she came yesterday and said to me, as to the last camp follower, be off, serving man, go up, for thy master is lying there. I came near twisting her head like a starling, for I thought that she had stabbed you with a knife or shot you from a pistol. You know that I do not like to have any one manage in my house like a gray goose. It is well that you did not do as you say, for I should have given orders to nip you with those pinchers which were heated for Plaska. Keep away from her. I sent Plaska back. He was terribly astonished, not knowing why he was brought, nor why he was sent home. He wanted something for his fatigue, because this, said he, is loss in my trade. But I told him... You bear home a sound skin as reward. Do we really march tomorrow for Podlasi? As God is in heaven, are the troops sent off according to my orders? The cavalry has gone already to Kidani, whence it is to march to Kovno and wait there. Our Polish squadrons are here yet. I did not like to send them in advance. The men seem reliable. Still, they might meet the Confederates. Glovbitch will go with us, also the Cossacks under Wotinsky. Karlstrom marches with the Swedes in the vanguard. He has orders to exterminate rebels and especially peasants on the way. That is well. Kiritz with infantry is to march slowly, so that we may have someone to fall back upon in difficulty. If we are to advance like a thunderbolt, and our entire calculation lies in swiftness, I do not know whether the Prussian and Swedish cavalry will be useful. It is a pity that the Polish squadrons are not reliable, for between us there is nothing superior to Polish cavalry. Has the artillery gone? It has. And Patterson, too? No, Patterson is here. He is nursing Kettling, of whom he is very fond, and who wounded himself rather badly with his own sword. If I did not know Kettling to be a daring officer, I should think that he had cut himself of purpose to avoid the campaign. It will be needful to leave about a hundred men here, also in Rostieni and in Kidani. The Swedish garrisons are small, and De La Gardi, as it is, is asking men every day from Lovenhaupt. Besides, when we march out, the rebels, forgetting the defeat of Chavli, will raise their heads. They are growing strong as it is. I have heard again that the Swedes are cut down in Telshi. By nobles or peasants? By peasants under the leadership of a priest, but there are parties of nobles, particularly near Lauda. The Lauda men have gone out under Volodyovsky. There is a multitude of youths and old men at home. These have taken arms, for they are warriors by blood. The rebellion can do nothing without money. But we shall get a supply of that in Bilovich. A man must be a genius like your highness to find means in everything. There is more esteem in this country, said Boguslav with a bitter smile, for the man who can please the queen and the nobles. Neither genius nor virtue has value. It is lucky that I am also a prince of the empire, and therefore they will not tie me by the legs to a pine tree. If I could only have the revenues regularly from my estates, I should not care for the commonwealth. But will they not confiscate these estates? We will first confiscate Poliasi, if not all Lithuania. Now summon Patterson. Sakovich went out and returned soon with Patterson. At Boguslav's bedside a council was held, at which it was determined to move before daylight next morning and go to Poliasi by forced marches. The prince felt so much better in the evening that he feasted with the officers and amused himself with jests till late, listening with pleasure to the neighing of horses and the clatter of arms in the squadrons preparing to march. At times he breathed deeply and stretched himself in the chair. "'I see that this campaign will bring back my health,' said he to the officers. For amid all these negotiations and amusements, I have neglected the field notably. But I hope in God that the Confederates and our ex-cardinal, the king, in Poland will feel my hand. To this Patterson made bold to answer, 
It is lucky that Delilah did not clip Samson's hair. Bugislav looked at him for a while with a strange expression, from which the Scot was growing confused, but after a time the countenance of the prince grew bright with a threatening smile, and he said, If Sapia is my pillar, I will shake him so that the whole commonwealth will fall on his head. The conversation was carried on in German, therefore all the foreign officers understood it perfectly and answered in chorus, Amen! The column, with Bugislav at the head of it, marched before daybreak next morning. The Prussian nobles whom the brilliant court attracted began at the same time to return to their homes. After them marched to Tilsta those who in Toragi had sought refuge from the terrors of war, and to whom now Tilsta seemed safer. Only Bilovich, Olenka, and Panna Kulvietz remained, not counting Ketling and the old officer Brown, who held command over the slender garrison. Bilovich, after that blow of the hammer, lay for some days bleeding from the mouth at intervals, but since no bone was broken, he recovered by degrees and began to think of flight. Meanwhile, an official came from Bilovich with a letter from Bugislav himself. The sword-bearer did not wish at first to read the letter, but soon changed his mind, following in this the advice of Olenka, who thought it better to know all the plans of the enemy. Very gracious Pan Bilovich, Concordia res parve crescant discordia maxime de la buntar. By concord small things grow great, by discord the greatest are ruined. The fates brought it about that we did not part in such harmony as my love for you and your charming niece demands, in which God knows I am not to blame, for you know yourself that you fed me with ingratitude in return for my sincere intentions. But for friendship's sake, what done in anger should not be remembered. I think, therefore, that you will excuse my deeds of impulse because of the injustice which I experienced at your hands. I, too, forgive you from my heart, as Christian charity enjoins, and I wish to return to a good understanding. To give you a proof that no offense has remained in my heart, I have not thought it proper to refuse the service which you have asked of me, and I accept your money. Here Bilovich stopped reading, struck the table with his fist, and cried, He will see me in dreams rather than receive one coin from my caskets. Read on, said Alinka. Bilovich raised the letter again to his eyes. Not wishing to trouble you and expose your health to hazard in the present stormy times while getting this money, we have ordered ourselves to get it and count it. At this point Bilovich's voice failed, and the letter fell from his hands to the floor. For a while it seemed that speech was taken from the noble, for he only caught after his hair and pulled it with all his power. "'Strike! Whoso believes in God!' cried he at last. "'One injustice the more, the punishment of God nearer, for the measure will soon be filled,' said Olenka. End of chapter 44《Chapter 45 of The Deluge, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Calkins, Monument, Colorado. The Deluge, Volume 2 by Henrik Sinkiewicz. Translated by Jeremiah Curtin, 1835 to 1906. Chapter 45 The despair of the sword-bearer was so great that Olenka had to comfort him, and give assurance that the money was not to be looked on as lost, for the letter itself would serve as a note, and Radzivill, the master of so many estates in Lithuania and Russia, had something from which to recover. But, since it was difficult to foresee what might still meet them, especially if Bogoslav returned to Tarogi victorious, they began to think of flight the more eagerly. Olenka advised to defer everything till Ketling's recovery, for Brown was a gloomy and surly old soldier, carrying out commands blindly, and it was impossible to influence him. As to Ketling, the lady knew well that he had wounded himself to remain in Tarogi, hence her deep faith that he would do everything to aid her. It is true that conscience disturbed her incessantly with the question, 
whether for self-safety she had the right to sacrifice the career and perhaps the life of another but the terrors hanging over her in tarogi were so dreadful that they surpassed a hundredfold the dangers to which ketling could be exposed ketling as an excellent officer might find service and a more noble service elsewhere and with it powerful protectors such as the king pan Sapieha, or pan charnyetsky and he would besides serve a just cause and would find a career grateful to that country which had received him as an exile death threatened him only in case he fell into boguslav's hands but boguslav did not command yet the whole commonwealth olenka ceased to hesitate and when the health of the young officer had improved she sent for him ketling stood before her pale emaciated without a drop of blood in his face but always full of respect homage and submission at sight of him tears came to olenka's eyes for he was the only friendly soul in tarogi and at the same time so thin and suffering that when olenka asked how his health was he answered alas my lady health is returning and it would be so pleasant to die you should leave this service said she looking at him with sympathy for such an honorable man needs assurance that he is serving a just cause and a worthy master alas repeated the officer when will your service end in half a year olenka was silent a while then she raised her wonderful eyes which at that moment had ceased to be stern and said listen to me i will speak to you as to a brother as to a sincere confidant you can and you should resign when she had said this she confessed to him everything both their plans of escape and that she relied on his assistance she represented to him that he could find service everywhere and a service as good as was his spirit and honourable as knightly honour could obtain at last she finished with the following words i shall be grateful to you till death i wish to take refuge under the guardianship of god and to make a vow to the lord in a cloister but wherever you may be far or near in war or in peace i shall pray for you i will implore god to give peace and happiness to my brother and benefactor for i can give him nothing save gratitude and prayer here her voice trembled and the officer listened to her words growing pale as a kerchief at last he knelt put both hands to his forehead and said in a voice like a groan i cannot my lady i cannot do you refuse me asked olenka with amazement oh great merciful god said he from childhood no lie has risen on my lips no unjust deed has ever stained me while still a youth i defended with this weak hand my king and country why lord dost thou punish me so grievously and send on me suffering for which as thou seest strength fails me here he turned to olenka my lady you do not know what an order is for a soldier in obedience is not only his duty but his honour and reputation an oath binds me my lady and more than an oath the word of a knight that i shall not throw up my service before the time and that i will fulfil what belongs to it blindly i am a soldier and a noble and so help me god never in my life will i follow the example of those who betray honour and service and i will not break my word even at your command at your prayer though i say this in suffering and pain if having an order not to let any one out of tarogi i were on guard at the gate and if you yourself wished to pass against the order you would pass only over my corpse you did not know me my lady and you were mistaken in me but have pity on me understand that i cannot aid you to escape i ought not to hear of such a thing the order is express for brown and the five remaining officers of us here have received it my god my god if i had foreseen such an order i should have preferred to go on the campaign i shall not convince you you will not believe me and still god sees let god judge me after death whether it is true that i would give my life without hesitation but my honour i cannot i cannot 
Then Ketling wrung his hands, was silent from exhaustion, and began to breathe quickly. Olenka had not recovered yet from her amazement. She had not time to pause or estimate properly that spirit, exceptional in its nobleness. She felt only that the last plank of salvation was slipping from her hands. The only means of escape from hated captivity was failing her, but still she tried to resist. "'I am,' said she after a while, "'the granddaughter and the daughter of a soldier. My grandfather and father also valued honor above life, but precisely for that reason they would not let themselves be used blindly for every service.' Ketling drew with trembling hand from his coat a letter, gave it to Olenka, and said, "'Judge, my lady, if this command does not concern service.' Olenka cast her eyes over the letter and read as follows. "'Since it has come to our knowledge that Bilovich, the sword-bearer of Rossieni, intends to leave our residence in secret with plans hostile to us, namely to excite his acquaintances, connections, relatives, and clients to rebellion against his Swedish majesty and us, we recommend to the officers remaining in garrison at Tarogi to guard Bilovich and his niece as hostages and prisoners of war, and not to permit their flight under pain of loss of honor and court-martial, etc. The order came from the first stopping place after the departure of the prince, said Ketling. Therefore, it is in writing. The will of God be done, said Olenka after a while. It is accomplished. Ketling felt that he ought to go. Still, he did not stir. His pale lips moved from moment to moment, as if he wished to say something and could not get the voice. He was oppressed by the desire to fall at her feet and implore forgiveness, but on the other hand he felt that she had enough of her own misfortune, and he found a certain wild delight in this, that he was suffering and would suffer without complaint. At last he bowed and went out in silence, but in the corridor he tore the bandages from his fresh wound and fell fainting to the floor. When an hour later the palace guard found him lying near the staircase and took him to the barracks, he became seriously ill and did not leave his bed for a fortnight. Olenka, after the departure of Ketling, remained some time as if dazed. Death had seemed to her more likely to come than that refusal, and therefore, at first, in spite of all, her firm temper of spirit, strength, energy, failed her. She felt weak, like an ordinary woman, and though she repeated unconsciously, Let the will of God be done, sorrow for the disappointment rose above her resignation, copious and bitter tears flowed from her eyes. At that moment her uncle entered, and looking at his niece divined at once that she had evil news to impart. Hence he asked quickly, for God's sake, what is it? Ketling refuses. All here are ruffians, scoundrels, arch curs. How is this? And he will not help? Not only will he not help, answered she, complaining like a little child, but he says that he will prevent, even should it come to him to die. Why? By the Lord's wounds, why? For such is our fate. Ketling is not a traitor, but such is our fate— for we are the most unhappy of all people. May the thunderbolts crush all those heretics, cried Bilovich. They attack virtue, plunder, steal, imprison. Would that all might perish. It is not for honest people to live in such times. Here he began to walk with hurried step through the chamber, threatening with his fists. At last, he said, gritting his teeth, the Vovoda of Vilna was better. I prefer a thousand times even Kmita to these perfumed ruffians without honor and conscience. When Alinka said nothing, but began to cry still more, Bilovich grew mild, and after a while said, Do not weep. Kmita came to my mind only because that he at least would have been able to wrest us out of this Babylonian captivity. He would have given it to all the Browns, Ketlings, Pattersons, to Boguslav himself. But they are all the same type of traitors. Weep not. You can do nothing with weeping. Here, it is necessary to counsel. Ketling will not help. May he be twisted. We will do without him. You have, as it were, a man's courage in you. But in difficulty, you are only able to sob. 
What does Ketling say? He says that the prince has given orders to guard us as prisoners of war, fearing, uncle, that you would collect a party and go to the Confederates. Bilovich put his hands on his hips. Ha ha ha! He is afraid, the scoundrel. And he is right, for I will do so as God is in heaven. Having a command relating to service, Ketling must carry it out on his honor. Well, we shall get on without the assistance of heretics. Olenka wiped her eyes. And does my uncle think it is possible? I think it is necessary. And if it is necessary, it is possible, though we had to let ourselves down by ropes from these windows. It was wrong for me to shed tears. Let us make plans as quickly as we can. Her tears were dry, her brows contracted again from thought and her former endurance and energy. It appeared, in fact, that Bilovich could find no help, and that the imagination of the lady was much richer in means. But it was difficult for her, since it was clear that they were guarded carefully. They determined, therefore, not to try before the first news came from Bogoslav. In this they placed all their hope, trusting that the punishment of God would come on the traitor and the dishonorable man. Besides, he might fall. He might be confined to his bed. He might be killed by Sapia, and then, without fail, there would rise in all Tarogi a panic, and the gate would not be guarded so carefully. I know Sapia, said Bilovich, comforting himself and Olinka. He is a slow warrior, but accurate and wonderfully stubborn. An example of this, his loyalty to the king and country. He pledged and sold everything, and thus has gained a power before which Bogoslav is as nothing. One is a dignified senator, the other a fop. One a true Catholic, the other a heretic. One is cleverness itself, the other a water-burner. With whom may victory and the blessing of God be? This Radzivill might well yield to Sapia's day, just as if there are not punishment and justice in this world. We will wait for news and pray for Sapia's success. Then they began to wait, but a month passed, long, wearisome for afflicted hearts, before the first courier came, and he was sent not to Tarogi, but to Steinbach in royal Prussia. Ketling, who from the time of the last conversation dared not appear before Olenka's eyes, sent her at once a card with the following announcement. Prince Bogoslav has defeated Pan Krzysztof Sapia near Bransk. Some squadrons of cavalry and infantry are cut to pieces. He is marching on Takotsin, where Horokievich is stationed. For Olinka, this was simply a thunderbolt. The greatness of a leader and the bravery of a knight meant for her the same thing, since she had seen Bogoslav at Torogi overcoming the most valiant knights with ease. She imagined him to herself, especially after that news, as an evil but invincible power against which no one could stand. The hope that Bogoslav might be defeated died in her completely. In vain did her uncle quiet her and comfort her with this, that the prince had not yet met Sabier. In vain did he guarantee to her that the very dignity of Hetman, with which the king had invested him recently, must give positive preponderance over Bogoslav. She did not believe this. She dared not. "'Who can conquer Bogoslav? Who can meet him?' asked she continually." Further news seemed to confirm her fears. A few days later, Ketling sent another card with information touching the defeat of Horokievich and the capture of Tykotsin. All Poryasi, writes he, is in the hands of the prince, who, without waiting for Sapieha, is moving against him with forced marches. And Sapieha will be routed, thought the maiden. Meanwhile, news from other directions flew to them, like a swallow heralding springtime. To that seashore of the Commonwealth this news came late, but because of its lateness it was decked in all the rainbow gleams of wonderful legend from the first ages of Christianity, when saints proclaiming truth and justice still traveled over the earth. Chenstahova! Chenstahova! was repeated by every mouth. Ice thawed from hearts which bloomed like flowers in the earth warmed by the sun of spring. Chenstahova has defended itself. Men had seen the Queen of Poland herself, the Virgin Mary, shielding the walls with her heavenly mantle, 
the bombs of the robbers at her holy feet, crouching like house dogs. The hands of the Swedes were withered, their muskets grew fast to their faces, till they retreated in terror and shame. Men, strangers to one another, when they heard these tidings, fell the one into the embraces of the other, weeping from delight. Others complained that the tidings came too late. "'But we were here in weeping,' said they. "'We were in pain. We lived in torment so long, when we should have been rejoicing.' Then it began to roar through the whole commonwealth, and terrible thunders were heard from the Euxine to the Baltic, so that the waves of both seas were trembling. Then faithful people, pious people, rose up like a storm in defense of their queen. Consolation entered all hearts. All eyes were flashing with fire. What hitherto had seemed terrible and invincible grew small in their eyes. "'Who will finish him?' said Bilovich. "'Who will be his equal? Now do you know who? The Most Holy Lady.' The old man and his niece lay for whole days in the form of a cross, thanking God for his mercy on the commonwealth, and doubting their own rescue no longer. But for a long period there was silence concerning Bogoslav, as if he with all his forces had fallen into water. The officers remaining in Tarogi began to be disquieted, and to think of their uncertain future. They would have preferred defeat to that deep silence, but no news could come, for just then the terrible Babinich was rushing with his Tartars in front of the prince and stopping all couriers. End of chapter 45、chapter、46 Chapter the Deluge, Volume of Deluge, Volume This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deluge, Volume Two, by Henrik Sienkiewicz, translated by Jeremiah Curtan, Chapter Forty Six. But a certain day, Panana Anusha Borjopahata arrived at Taurogi with a convoy of some tens of soldiers. Brond received her very politely, for he had to do so, since he was thus commanded by a letter from Sakovich, signed by Boguslav himself, enjoining him to have every regard for this lady in waiting of Princess Griselda Vishnyovetsky. The young lady herself was full of vivacity. From the first moment, she began to pierce Brond with her eyes. So that the sullen German moved about as if some one were touching him with fire, she began also to command other officers, in a word, to manage in Tarogi as in her own house. In the evening of the same day, she made the acquaintance of Olenka, who received her with distrust, it is true, but politely, in the hope that she would get news from her. In fact. Anusha had news in plenty. Her conversation began with Chenstohova, since the prisoners in Tarogi were most eager for that news. The sword bearer listened with special diligence. He held his hands behind his ears so as to lose no word, merely interrupting Anusha's narrative from time to time with the exclamation, "Praise be to God on high!" It is a wonder to me," said Anusha at last, "that news of these miracles of the Most Holy Lady have only just reached you, for that is an old story. I was still in Zamosch, and Pan Babinich had not come for me. I, how many weeks was it before that? Then they began to beat the Swedes everywhere, in Great Poland and with us, but most of all Pan Charnetsky." Before whose very name they fly, O、oh, Charnetsky! cried the sword bearer, rubbing his hands. He will give them pepper. I heard of him even from the Ukraine, as of a great warrior. Anusha merely shook her dress and exclaimed to herself with aversion, as if it were a question of the smallest matter. Oh, it is all over with the Swedes. Old Pan Tomash, 
could not restrain himself. Seizing her small hand, he buried the little thing entirely in his enormous moustaches and kissed it eagerly. At last he cried, Oh, my beauty, honey flows from your mouth as God is dear to me. It cannot be but an angel has come to Taurogi. Anusha began at once to twist the ends of her tresses, tied with rosy ribbons, and cutting with her eyes from under her brows, said, Oh, it is far from me to the angels. But the hetmans of the kingdom have begun to beat the Swedes, and all the quarter soldiers with them, and the knights, and they have formed a confederation in Tishovtsi. The king has joined it, and they have given out manifestos. Even the peasants are beating the Swedes, and the Most Holy Lady gives her blessing. She spoke as if a bird were warbling, but from that warbling, Bilevich's heart grew soft, though some of the news was already known to him. He bellowed at last like an aurochs from delight. Tears, too, began to flow over the face of Olenka, silent and many. Seeing this, Anusha, having a good heart from nature, sprang to her at once, and putting her arms around her neck, began to say quickly, Do not cry. I am sorry for you, and cannot see you shed tears. Why do you weep? There was so much sincerity in her voice that Olenka's distrust vanished at once, but the poor girl wept still more. You are so beautiful, said Anusha, comforting her. Why do you cry? From joy, answered Olenka, but also from suffering, for we are here in grievous captivity, knowing neither the day nor the hour. How is that? Are you not with Prince Boguslav? That traitor, that heretic, roared Bilevich. The same has happened to me, said Anusha. But I do not cry for that reason. I do not deny that the prince is a traitor and a heretic. But he is a courteous cavalier and respects our sex. God grant that in hell they will respect him in the same fashion. Young lady, you know him not, for he has not attacked you as he has this maiden. He is an arch-ruffian, and that Sakovich is another. God gives Sapieha to defeat them both. As to defeating, he will defeat them. Prince Boguslav is terribly sick, and he has not a great force. It is true that he advanced quickly, scattered some squadrons, and took Tikotsin and me. But it is not for him to measure with the forces of Pan Sapieha. You may trust me, for I saw both armies. With Pan Sapieha are the greatest cavaliers who will be able to manage Prince Boguslav. Well, do you see? Have I not told you? asked the old man, turning to Olenka. I know Prince Boguslav from of old, continued Anusha, for he is a relative of the Vishnevetskys and Zamoyski. He came once to us at Lubny, when Prince Yeremi himself was campaigning against the Tartars in the wilderness. He remembered that I was at home there, and nearest the princess. I was such a little thing then, not as I am today. My God, who could think at that time that he would be a traitor? But grieve not, for either he will fail to return, or we shall escape from this place in some way. We have tried that already, said Olenka. And you did not succeed? How could we? asked Bilevich. We told the secret to an officer whom we thought ready to aid us, but it turned out that he was ready to hinder, not to help. Seniority over all here is with Braun. The devil himself could not win that man. Anusha dropped her eyes. Maybe I can. If Pan Sapieha would only come, so that we might have someone with whom to take refuge. God give him at the earliest, answered Pan Tomash. For among his men we have many relatives, acquaintances and friends. Among them, too, are former officers of the great Yeremi. Thobodyovsky, Skshetuski, Zagwoba, I know them. But they are not with Sapieha. Oh, if they were, especially Vovodyovsky, for Skshetuski is married, I should not be here, for Pan Vovodyovsky would not let himself be picked up as Pan Kotchitz did. 
He is a great cavalier, said Bilevich. The glory of the whole commonwealth, added Olenka. Have they not fallen since you did not see them? Oh, no, answered Anusha, for the loss of such knights would be spoken of, but nothing was said. You do not know them, they will never yield, only a bullet will kill them, for no man can stand before Skshetuski, Zagwoba, or Pan Mihau. Though Pan Mihau is small, I remember what Prince Yeremi said of him, that if the fate of the whole commonwealth depended on a battle between one man and another, he would choose Pan Mihau for the battle. He was the man who conquered Borgun. Oh no, Pan Mihau will help himself always. Bilevich, satisfied that he had someone with whom to talk, began to walk with long strides through the room, asking, Well, well, then do you know Pan Vovodyovsky so intimately? Yes, for we lived in the same place so many years. Indeed, then certainly not without love. I'm not to blame for that, answered Anusha, taking a timid posture. But before this time, surely Pan Mihau is married. And he is just not married. Even if he were, it is all one to me. God grant you to meet, but I am troubled because you say that they are not with the hetman, for with such soldiers victory would be easier. There is someone there who is worth them all. Who is he? Pan Babinich, from Vityebsk. Have you heard of him? Not a word, which is a wonder to me. Anusha began to relate the history of her departure from Zamosh, and everything that happened on the road. Babinich grew in her narrative to such a mighty hero that the sword-bearer was at a loss to know who he was. I know all Lithuania, said he. There are houses, it is true, with similar names, such as Babonalbek, Babil, Babinovsky, Babinski, and Babiski. Babinich I have not heard, and I think it must be an assumed name, for many who are in parties take such names, so that their property and relatives may not suffer from the enemy. Hmm, Babinich. He is some fiery cavalier, since he was able to settle Zamoyski in that fashion. Oh, how fiery, cried Anusha. The old man fell into good humour. How is that? asked he, stopping before Anusha and putting his hands on his hips. If I tell you, you'll suppose God knows what. God preserve me, I will suppose nothing. Barely had we come out of Zamosh, when Pan Babinich told me that someone else had occupied his heart, and though he received no rent, still he did not think of changing the tenant. And do you believe that? Of course I believe it, answered Anusha with great vivacity. He must be in love to his ears, since after so long a time, since, since... Oh, there is some since he would not, said the old man, laughing. But I say that, repeated Anusha, stamping her foot, since, well, we shall soon hear of him. God grant it. And I will tell you why. As often as Pan Babinich mentioned Prince Boguslav, his face grew white and his teeth squeaked like doors. He will be our friend, said the sword-bearer. Certainly, and we will flee to him if he shows himself. If I could escape from this place, I would have my own party, and you would see that war is no novelty to me either, and that this old hand is good for something yet. Go under command of Pan Babinich. You have a great wish to go under his command. They chatted yet for a long time in this fashion, and always more joyously. He that Olenka, forgetting her grief, became notably more cheerful, and Anusha began at last to laugh loudly at the sword-bearer. She was well rested, for at the last halting-place in Rosjeni she had slept soundly. She left them then only late in the evening. "'She is gold, not a maiden,' said Bilevich, after she had gone. "'A sincere sort of heart, and I think we shall soon come to confidence,' answered Olenka. 
but you looked at her frowningly at first. For I thought that she was someone sent here. Do I know anything surely? I fear every one in Taurogi. She sent? Perhaps by good spirits, but she is as full of tricks as a weasel. If I were younger, I don't know to what it might come, even as it is a man is still desirous. Olenka was delighted, and placing her hands on her knees, she put her head on one side, mimicking Anusha and looking askance at her uncle. So, dear uncle, you wish to bake an aunt for me out of that flower? Oh, be quiet, be quiet, said the sword-bearer. But he laughed and began to twist his moustache with his whole hand. After a time, he added, Still she roused such a staid woman as you. I am certain that great friendship will spring up between you. In truth, Pan Tomash was not deceived, for in no long time a very lively friendship was formed between the maidens, and it grew more and more, perhaps just for this reason, that the two were complete opposites. One had dignity in her spirit, depths of feeling, invincible will and reason. The other, with a good heart and purity of thought, was a tufted lark. One, with her calm face, bright tresses, and an unspeakable repose and charm in her slender form, was like an ancient psyche. The other, a real brunette, reminded one rather of an ignis fatus, which in the night hours entices people into pathless places and laughs at their vexation. The officers in Taurogi, who looked at both every day, were seized with the desire to kiss Olenka's feet, but Anusha's lips. Ketling, having the soul of a Scottish mountaineer, hence full of melancholy, revered and adored Olenka, but from the first glance he could not endure Anusha, who paid him in kind, making up for her losses on Braun and others, not excepting the sword-bearer of Rossieni himself. Olenka soon won great influence over her friend, who, with perfect sincerity of heart, said to Pan Tomash, She can say more in two words than I in a whole day. But the dignified lady could not cure her vain friend of one defect, coquetry. For let Anusha only hear the rattle of spurs in the corridor, immediately she would pretend that she had forgotten something, that she wanted to see if there were tidings from Sapieha, would rush into the corridor, fly like a whirlwind, and coming up against an officer cry out, Oh, how you frightened me! Then a conversation would begin, intermingled with twisting of her skirts, glancing from under her brows, and various artful looks, through the aid of which the hardest heart may be conquered. This coquetry Olenka took ill of her, all the more that Anusha, after a few days, confessed to a secret love for Babinich. They discussed this among themselves more than once. Others beg like minstrels, said Anusha. But this dragon chose to look at his Tartars rather than at me, and he never spoke otherwise than in command. Come out, my lady. Eat, my lady. Drink, my lady. And if he had been rude at the same time, but he was not. If he had not been painstaking, but he was. In Krasnistav I said to myself, Do not look at me. Wait. And in Lanchner I was so overcome that it was terrible. I tell you that when I looked into his blue eyes, and when he laughed, gladness seized me, such a prisoner was I. Olenka dropped her head, for blue eyes came to her memory too. And that one spoke in the same way, and he had command ever on his lips, activity ever in his face, but neither conscience nor the fear of God. Anusha, following her own thoughts, continued, when he flew over the field on his horse with his baton, I thought, that is an eagle or some hetman. The Tartars feared him more than fire. When he came, there had to be obedience, and when there was a battle, fires were striking him from desire of blood. 
I saw many worthy cavaliers in Lubni, but one such that fear seized me in his presence I have never seen. If the Lord God has predestined him to you, you will get him. But that he did not love you, I cannot believe. As to love, he loves me a little, but the other more. He told me himself more than once, It is lucky that I am not able to forget or cease loving, for it would be better to confide a kid to a wolf than such a maiden as you are to me. What did you say to that? I said, How do you know that I would return your love? And he answered, I should not have asked you. Now, what are you to do with such a man? That other woman is foolish not to love him, and she must have callousness in her heart. I ask what her name is, but he would not tell me. Better, said he, not to touch that, for it is a sore. And another sore, said he, is the Rajivil, the traitors. And then he made such a terrible face that I would have hidden in a mouse hole. I simply feared him. But what is the use in talking? He is not for me. Ask St. Mihal for him. I know from Aunt Kulvietz that he is the best aid in such cases. Only be careful not to offend the saint by duping more men. I never will, except so much, the least little bit. Here Anusha showed on her finger how much, and she indicated at most about half the length of the nail, so as not to anger St. Mihal. I do not act so from waywardness, explained she to Bilevich, who also had begun to take her frivolity to heart. But I must, for if these officers do not help us, we shall never escape. Braun will not let us out. Braun is overcome, replied Anusha, with a thin voice, dropping her eyes. But Fitzgregory? He is overcome too, with a voice still thinner. And Ottenhagen? Overcome. And von Ehren? Overcome. May the forest surround you. I see that Ketling is the only man whom you could not manage. I cannot endure him, but someone else will manage him. Besides, we can go without his permission. And you think that when we wish to flee, they will not hinder? They will go with us, said Anusha, stretching her neck and blinking. For God's sake, then why do we stay here? I should like to be far away this day. But from the consultation which followed at once, it appeared needful to await the decision of Boguswav's fate and Pansapeha's arrival in the neighbourhood of Jmud. Otherwise, they would be threatened by terrible destruction from even their own people. The society of foreign officers not only would not be a defence, but would add to their danger, for the peasants were so terribly envenomed against foreigners that they murdered without mercy everyone who did not wear a Polish dress, even Polish dignitaries wearing foreign costume, not to speak of Austrian and French diplomats, could not travel save under the protection of powerful bodies of troops. You will believe me, for I have passed through the whole country, said Anusha. In the first village, in the first forest, ravagers would kill us without asking who we are. It is impossible to flee except to an army. But I shall have my own party. Before you could collect it, before you could reach a village where you are known, you would lose your life. News from Prince Boguswav must come soon. I have ordered Braun to inform me at once. But Braun reported nothing for a long time. Ketling, however, began to visit Olenka, for she, meeting him on a certain day, extended her hand to him. The young officer prophesied evil from this profound silence. According to him, the prince out of regard for the elector and the Swedes, would not hold silence touching the least victory, and would rather exaggerate by description than weaken by silence the significance of real successes. 
I do not suppose that he is cut to pieces, said the young officer, but he is surely in such a difficult position that it is hard to find a way out. All tidings arrive here so late, said Olenka, and the best proof is that we learned first from Panala Borjobahata the particulars of the miraculous defence of Chenstohova. I, my lady, knew of that long ago, but, as a foreigner, not knowing the value which that place has for Poles, I did not mention it. That in a great war some small castle defends itself for a time, and repulses a number of storms, happens always, and importance is not attached to it usually. But still, for me, that would have been the most welcome news. I see in truth that I did ill, for from what has happened since the defence, as I hear now, I know that to be an important event, which may influence the whole war. Still, returning to the campaign of the prince in Podlashie, it is different. Chenstohova is far away, Podlashie is nearer, and when the prince succeeded at first, you remember how quickly news came. Believe me, my lady, I am a young man, but from the fourteenth year of my life I am a soldier, and experience tells me that this silence is prophetic of evil. Rather good, said the lady. Let it be good, answered Ketling. In half a year my service will be ended. In half a year my oath will cease. A few days after this conversation, news came at last. It was brought by Pan Bies of the Shield Cornier, called at Boguslav's court Cornutus. He was a Polish noble, but altogether foreignized, for, serving in foreign armies almost from years of boyhood, he had well-nigh forgotten Polish, or at least spoke it like a German. He had also a foreignized soul, hence was greatly attached to Prince Boguslav. He was going on an important mission to Königsberg, and stopped in Taurogi merely to rest. Braun and Ketling brought him at once to Olenka and Anusha, who at that time lived and slept together. Braun stood like a soldier before Anusha, then turned to Bies and said, This lady is a relative of Pan Zamoyski, therefore of the Prince our Lord, who has commanded to show her every attention, and she wishes to hear news from the mouth of an eyewitness. Pan Bies in his turn stood erect, as if on service, and awaited the questions. Anusha did not deny relationship with Boguslav, for the homage of the military pleased her. Therefore she motioned to Pan Bies to sit down. When he had taken his place, she asked, Where is the prince at present? The prince is retreating on Sokolka. God grant successfully, said the officer. Tell the pure truth. How is it with him? I will tell the pure truth and hide nothing, thinking that your worthiness will find strength in your soul to hear news less favourable. I will, said Anusha, striking one heel against the other under her robe, with satisfaction that she was called worthiness, and that the news was less favourable. At first everything went well with us, said Bies. We rubbed out on the road several bands of peasants. We scattered the forces of the younger Sapieha and cut up two squadrons of cavalry with a regiment of good infantry, sparing no one. Then we defeated Pan Horotkiewicz, so that he barely escaped, and some say that he was killed. After that, we occupied the ruins of Tikotsin. We know all this. Tell us quickly the unfavourable news, interrupted Anusha on a sudden. Be pleased, my lady, to listen calmly. We came to Drohitchin, and there the map was unfolded. We had news that Sapieha was still far away. Meanwhile, two of our scouting parties were as if they had sunk through the earth. Not a witness returned from the slaughter. Then it appeared that some troops were marching in front of us. A great confusion rose out of that. The prince began to think that all preceding information was false, and that Sapieha had not only advanced, but had cut off the road. Then we began to retreat. 
for in that way it was possible to catch the enemy and force him to a general battle, which the prince wished absolutely. But the enemy did not give the field. He attacked and attacked without ceasing. From that everything began to melt in our hands. We had rest neither day nor night. The roads were ruined before us, the dams cut, provisions intercepted. Reports were soon circulated that Charnyetsky himself was crushing us. The soldiers did not eat, did not sleep. Their courage fell. Men perished in the camp itself as if the ground were swallowing them. In Białystok, the enemy seized a whole party again, camp chests, the prince's carriages and guns. I have never seen anything like it. It was not seen in former wars either. The prince was changed. He wanted nothing but a general battle, and he had to fight ten small ones every day and lose them. Order became relaxed. And how can our confusion and alarm be described when we learned that Sapieha himself had not come up yet, and that in front of us was merely a strong party which had caused so many disasters? In this party were Tartar troops. Further words of the officer were interrupted by a scream from Anusha, who, throwing herself suddenly on Olenka's neck, cried, Pan Babinich! The officer was surprised when he heard the name, but he judged that terror and hatred had wrested this cry from the breast of the worthy lady. So only after a while did he continue his narrative. To whomsoever God has given greatness, he has given also strength to bear grievous misfortunes. Be pleased, therefore, my lady, to calm yourself. Such, indeed, is the name of this hell-dweller who has undermined the success of the whole expedition, and become the cause of other immense evils. His name, which your worthiness has divined with such wonderful quickness, is repeated now with fear and rage by every mouth in our camp. I saw that Babinich at Zamosh, said Anusha hastily, and could I have guessed? Here she was silent and no one knew what would have happened in such an event. The officer, after a moment's silence, continued, Thaws and heat set in, despite, it may be said, the regular order of nature, for we had news that in the south of the Commonwealth there was still severe winter, but we were wading in spring mud, which fastened our heavy cavalry to the earth. But he, having light troops, advanced with more ease. We lost wagons and cannon at every step, and were forced at last to go on horseback. The inhabitants round about, in their blind venom, favoured the attackers. What God gives will happen, but I left the whole camp in a desperate condition, as well as the prince himself, whom a malignant fever does not leave, and who loses his power for whole days. A general battle will come quickly, but how it will end, God knows. If he favours, we may hope for wonders. Where did you leave the prince? A day's journey from Sokolka. The prince intends to entrench himself at Suhovola or Yanov and receive battle. Sapieha is two days distant. When I came away, we had a little more freedom. For, from a captured informant, we learned that Babinich himself had gone to the main camp. Without him, the Tartars dare not attack, satisfying themselves with annoying scouting parties. The prince, who is an incomparable leader, places all his hopes on a general battle, but, of course, when he is well. If the fever seizes him, he must think of something else the best proof of which is that he has sent me to Prussia. Why do you go? Either the prince will win the battle or lose it. If he loses it, all electoral Prussia will be defenceless, and it may happen easily that Sapieha will pass the boundaries, force the elector to a decision. I say this, for it is no secret, I go to forewarn them to have some defence prepared for those provinces for the unbidden guests may come in too great numbers. That is the affair of the elector and the Swedes, with whom the prince is in alliance, 
and from whom he has the right to expect rescue. The officer finished. Anusha heaped a multitude of other questions on him, preserving with difficulty dignity sufficient. When he went out, she gave way to herself completely. She fell to striking her skirts with her hands, turning on her heels like a top, kissing Olenka on the eyes, pulling Bilevich by the sleeves and crying, Well now, what did I say? Who has crushed Prince Boguswab? Maybe Pan Sapieha. A fig for Sapieha. Who will crush the Swedes in the same style? Who will exterminate traitors? Who is the greatest cavalier? Who is the greatest knight? Pan Andrei, Pan Andrei. What Andrei? asked Olinka, growing pale suddenly. Have I not told you that his name is Andrei? He told me that himself. Pan Babinich, long life to Babinich, for Wodiowski could not have done better. What is the matter, Olenka? Panina Bilevich shook herself as if wishing to throw off a burden of grievous thoughts. Nothing. I was thinking that traitors themselves bear that name, for there was one who offered to sell the king, dead or alive, to the Swedes or to Boguswav, and he had the same name, Andrei. May God condemn him, roared Bilevich. Why mention traitors at night? Let us be glad when we have reason. Only let Pan Babinich come here, added Anusha. That's what is needed. I will fool Braun still more. I will, I will, of purpose to raise the whole garrison and go over with men and horses to Pan Babinich. Do that, do that, cried Bilevich, delighted. And afterward, a fig for all those Germans. Maybe he will forget that good-for-nothing woman and give me his law. Then again her thin voice piped. She covered her face with her hands. All at once an angry thought must have come to her, for she clapped her hands and said, If not, I will marry Vovodyovsky. End of chapter 46 Recording by David Granville Young